La Chambre procédera maintenant à l'étude d'une motion d'agendement de la Chambre en vue de discuter une affaire déterminée et importante dont l'étude s'impose d'urgence, à savoir l'approvisionnement en vaccins. En conséquence, la motion est la suivante. M. O'Toole, appuyé par Mme Rimple Garner, propose que la Chambre se jeûne maintenant. Debat, debate. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be dividing my time with the Shadow Minister for Health, uh, the MP for Calgary, Nose Hill. This is an emergency debate so that Parliament can be seized with the lack of vaccines and the lack of an effective and consistent rollout of vaccines in a pandemic. But, Mr. Speaker, today the Prime Minister described the situation as things are in good shape. That is, that's his quote for vaccine deliveries in Canada. He thinks we're in good shape while COVID cases are setting record numbers in a week that Canada is receiving zero vaccines. He thinks we're in good shape when Canadians will only receive 8% of the vaccines his government promised Canadians just last month. 8%. If this is what the Prime Minister considers good shape, Mr. Speaker, what does he consider terrible shape? 3%? Canadians need a Prime Minister who understands that things are not okay. Canadians are not okay. Yesterday marked the one-year anniversary of the first presumptive COVID-19 case in Canada, and since then, almost 20,000 Canadian families have had to face the loss of a loved one due to COVID-19. Le Premier ministre nous dit aujourd'hui que la situation va bien. Je refuse de mettre ma tête dans le sable comme lui. Il faut être honnête avec les Canadiens. Non, tout ne va pas bien. Pierre a marqué un an depuis le premier cas pré présumé de COVID au Canada. Depuis, 10% de nos citoyens ont perdu leur emploi et des milliers d'entreprises ont fermé. We must secure vaccines, we must secure jobs, and we must act now to secure our future. But what has the Liberal government done to improve their slow and confused approach? We want to see the government succeed, Mr. Speaker, in securing vaccines for Canada because vaccines let us turn the corner on COVID-19. But in reality, time and time again, they let Canadians down. Last spring, we saw countries hoarding PPE when faced with a global crisis. Planes full of supplies were diverted or never arrived. We saw countries stop the export of PPE from their countries. The Deputy Prime Minister called trying to secure medical supplies during the first wave the Wild West. So are we really surprised, Mr. Speaker, to see the same thing happening with vaccines? It seems like time and time again, the Prime Minister and the Liberal government never learn a single lesson from the first wave of this pandemic. There is no plan B, because Mr. Speaker, there was never an effective plan A for the distribution and securing vaccines for Canadians. Now we're learning that the European Union is stopping vaccines before they leave their borders. All of our present vaccine supply comes from Europe. So where does that leave Canadians? This week, in the midst of a raging pandemic, we're receiving zero vaccines. Is that an indication of where we're going in the next few weeks? The health and prosperity of Canadians is at stake, Mr. Speaker. The bottom line is, we need vaccines to secure our future, rebuild our economy, and get Canadians back to work. While Canada's Conservatives are committed to protecting jobs, the Liberals appear to be holding meetings to save their own. With the return of the House, our team will relentlessly focus on the COVID-19 recovery, jobs, rising wages, and getting Canada's economy and finances back on track. The Liberals, Mr. Speaker, by contrast, view this pandemic as an opportunity to experiment on risky, ideologically driven and unproven schemes involving the Canadian economy. They want to reimagine 
the economy, Mr. Speaker, which means they will decide which Canadians get jobs and what sectors they target for recovery. This liberal Ottawa knows best approach is a distraction from getting vaccines into the arms of Canadians and getting Canadians back to work in every sector and in every region of this country. Au début de la pandémie, les libéraux ont décidé d'envoyer une partie de notre équipement médical en Chine, Monsieur le Président. Puis, on s'est retrouvé à devoir acheter sa même équipement à des prix incroyables. Maintenant, le Premier ministre veut jouer avec notre économie au lieu de trouver une solution stable pour les vaccins. Mais ce n'est pas le temps de faire des expérimentations avec notre économie. Ce n'est pas le moment de pousser une idéologie. idéologie. Le seul objectif doit être des vaccins pour remettre notre économie en marche, Monsieur le Président. Le gouvernement doit travailler avec les partis d'opposition pour améliorer la distribution. Canadians are also affecting a range or are also feeling a range of pandemic side effects, and we see this in all of our ridings. Some two-fifths of Canadian workers are worried about the mental health and wellness of one of their colleagues. Hundreds of thousands of surgeries across this country have been delayed. Millions of people have lost their jobs. Millions of people have not been able to see their family members, in some cases, for months. La pandémie cause de nombreux effets secondaires. Les problèmes de santé mentale deviennent plus gros tous les jours, Monsieur le Président, et les familles sont laissées à elles-mêmes pour éduquer leurs enfants à la maison. The ability to get our country to rebuild the economy, to get Canadians back to work, as I said, Mr. Speaker, in every sector and in every part of the country so that we can pull together and bounce back from COVID, all of this hinges on a smooth and stable rollout of vaccines. As I've said several times this week, the opposition, Conservatives, we want the government to succeed. We want to see these vaccines. Our nation literally depends on it for turning the corner in this pandemic. In October, the opposition passed a sweeping motion to direct the Health Committee to study the COVID-19 pandemic. That included information about the government's vaccine rollout and key related documents. It became clear then, and each week with more documents, that the government had no real plan to speak of. They were late to the game on vaccine procurement. The Liberals then took a victory lap when they announced a deal with Pfizer and a few other countries. They boasted about their portfolio of vaccines over the next several years, Mr. Speaker. But Canadians don't have several years to wait. They need vaccines now, like other countries are getting. Or at the very least, they need the knowledge of when they can anticipate receiving a vaccine, when they can anticipate life starting to return to normal. Even the government's own MPs are confused. The member from Hull Elmer last night said the government was counting on vaccines yet to be approved to reach their own numbers. If Liberal MPs don't know what their plan is, how are Canadians supposed to know what their plan is? La clé pour remettre notre pays sur les rails, c'est les vaccins. On a besoin d'un gouvernement fiable. La vérité, c'est que l'on a une pénurie de vaccins maintenant. Ce premier ministre a des belles paroles, mais dans les faits, on va recevoir zéro vaccin Pfizer cette semaine. Premiers report they're running out of vaccines. This week, Canadians know we're receiving zero vaccines. Next week, according to a revived schedule, Canada will receive less than a third of what the government said just a month ago we'd have. The following week, the schedule, the plan, uses the term unknown. Mr. Speaker, unknown is proof there is no plan. Between now and the middle of February, Canada was supposed to receive a million vaccines. Instead, we'll be getting 8% of that. Perhaps this Prime Minister thinks 8% is acceptable? The Conservatives do not, Mr. Speaker. We need to secure our future. We need better from a slow 
and always confuse government. A Prime Minister that chose to partner with a Chinese firm to develop a vaccine, a reckless partnership that broke down and resulted in us being months behind our peer countries. The Liberals didn't move quickly, they partnered with the wrong country, and they lost the chance to manufacture the vaccine here at home. Again, they learned nothing from the first wave of the pandemic. The Prime Minister and his deputy rode us back in to the Wild West, where vaccines can be withheld and Canada is falling behind. We need to do better. On veut le succès, succès de notre gouvernement, mais ce premier ministre nous laisse tomber. Nous devons travailler, travailler ensemble. It's imperative we work together to get the vaccines we need, to get this country moving, to get people working to secure our future. Canadians deserve leadership. They deserve a plan. Tonight, we will work together to try and push for just that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. You know, Mr. Speaker, I heard for the last 10 minutes the Leader of the Opposition go on and on about everything that this government has done wrong. Meanwhile, he brings forward this motion to have this debate tonight and keeps repeating the phrase, we want them to succeed, and concludes his speech by saying, we're here to work with you, but offered absolutely nothing in the 10 minutes that he spoke other than to trash talk this government. So if I can use his words, Mr. Speaker, maybe it's time that we work collaboratively. You know, let's get to work. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when the pandemic started, I stopped my leadership campaign. I spoke directly to three top ministers of the Crown, volunteered to work in a union cabinet to get this country moving, to save our country. My experience in the military, in the private sector, working on the approval of health care products would have meant we would have had the regulatory process to approve the mRNA vaccine. We were eight months behind the developed world. And the member from Kingston and the Islands that has Queen's University, an incredible medical school, he should go tour it and learn some more about the cap capacity of our own country, Mr. Speaker. We, this year marks 100 years since insulin, banting and best. We can be the best. 8% is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. It's failure. Late on the border, late on tests, late on vaccines, and opaque on any details about the pandemic. We can and must do better so we can turn the corner, secure our future. We will give that to Canadians. Uh, question Président, je remercie d'abord la députée de Calgary, Knowles Hill, pour le débat d'urgence et également salue le discours du chef d'opposition avec qui je partage plusieurs éléments qui ont été mentionnés. On est dans un contexte dans lequel les libéraux ont visiblement mis la table pour une élection. Et dans le contexte, un élément qui va être majeur à savoir si on a une élection ou non, c'est évidemment le vaccin. Pour moi, le nerf de la guerre, c'est que le vaccin, on le produit pas au Québec, on le produit pas au Canada. Pourtant, il y a à peine 15 ans, l'industrie pharmaceutique est un fleuron au Québec. Et ça ne l'est plus depuis quand? Depuis d'abord que le gouvernement de Paul Martin a suspendu le programme d'investissement partenariat technologique du Canada sur le partage des risques et que les libéraux de Stephen Harper l'ont aboli. Est-ce que le chef de l'opposition s'engage, advenant une élection cette année, de recréer ce programme-là qui va nous permettre de redevenir un fleuron au Québec dans l'industrie pharmaceutique et de produire les vaccins chez nous? Merci, M. le Président. Madame chef d'opposition. Merci, M. le Président. Merci pour la question. En plein d'une pandémie, il n'y a pas un plan pour les vaccins, il n'y a pas un plan pour les tests rapides, et il n'y a pas d'informations nécessaires pour le bien-être des Canadiens. Euh, et c'est dommage, parce que le gouvernement est en train de préparer pour une élection, Monsieur, monsieur le Président, mais pas pour préparer pour la distribution de vaccins. C'est totalement nécessaire d'avoir les vaccins pour arrêter la propagation de COVID-19, de, de, pour la relance économique après la pandémie. Et je suis fier de nos travailleurs dans le secteur de, de, de recherche au Québec. J'ai eu des réunions avec Medicago, une, une entreprise extraordinaire dans la grande région de Québec. On a beaucoup d'opportunités chez nous d'avoir un plan pour les vaccins pour les tests rapides. Mais malheureusement, 
on a un gouvernement toujours lent et sans un plan. On a, les, les Canadiens, les Québécois méritent mieux, Monsieur le Président. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for moving this motion of an emergency debate. And, and as he knows, I did as well. And it's, uh, I think, a very timely and important debate. Um, you know, the Honourable uh, Member speaks about a plan. And uh, one of, I think, the biggest deficiencies that is facing Canada right now is the fact that we do not have the ability to manufacture a single vaccine. And the Liberal government failed to negotiate with a single one of the seven vaccine manufacturers, the right for Canada to manufacture vaccines domestically. And as the Prime Minister himself has acknowledged, obviously a country that has the ability to manufacture will prioritize its own citizens. And we're seeing that now with the EU and the United States prioritizing their citizens. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was a Conservative government under Brian Mulroney that sold off Connaught Labs, which was a crown corporation that was owned by the federal government. So my question to my honourable colleague is this, is does he agree that the federal government should establish a public drug manufacturer to ensure that Canada is never again caught without the capacity to manufacture critical vaccines and medicines for Canadians right here at home? Well, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Vancouver Kingsway for working with, with my colleague and our team on this debate tonight and pushing for better. I think all parties here tonight, other than the government, and I would note there is no one here from that side uh, right now, Mr. Speaker, um, we, we deserve better in a pandemic. We want better results. 8% is not sufficient, Mr. Speaker. It's clear the government did not negotiate the ability to manufacture a vaccine uh, in Canada. Why they made the decision to partner with a Chinese state-owned pharmaceutical, CanSino, uh, that, that fell apart within months. In fact, within days of the Prime Minister making the announcement, they knew they'd failed. Recent documents have shown that. That is one of several reasons on why we're five months behind in proper negotiations with other com companies. We've talked about bringing and securing innovation in Canada. We have a proud history of that. We don't believe it should be done by government. There's less innovation in government, Mr. Speaker, I can assure you. But we have to have the environment to secure PPE, to secure uh, essential medicines, to secure the tools needed to open our economy. That's got to be our goal, getting Canadians working. The vaccines will be the first step in rounding the corner to a stronger future. That is why we brought this debate tonight. That is why we're demanding better from the government. Thank you. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for his leadership in bringing forward a debate that concerns all Canadians. Every Canadian watching this tonight is unified and should be unified in the concern on the topic that, that, that we're looking at tonight. And for those watching, I want to break down exactly what the problem that we're facing is and what the Prime Minister and the Liberals need to do to fix it. Tonight, we're trying to get answers on the COVID-19 vaccine. Canada has a huge vaccine shortage. So right now, this week, Canada got zero doses of vaccine, zero, none. While countries around the world, Romania, the Czech Republic, the United States, Italy, Spain, France, virtually every other country that had a contract got doses of the vaccine this week. And that is great for their citizens. But what about Canadians? The leader of the opposition did a great job empathizing with every Canadian watching this debate tonight. Those who are watching, I mean, probably sitting at home, feeling the mental health effects of not seeing loved ones or losing a job or losing somebody to COVID. It's been a year and we need to move on. I'm sure nobody watching this tonight wants to keep hearing about more lockdowns and more removals of civil liberties. People that are watching this debate want us to get it right. They want to see solutions from the government. And fortunately, a year 
into this crisis around the world, there have been things that have been developed to get us out of this. Rapid tests, therapeutics, and vaccines. Problem is that Canada as a democracy, as a G7 country, a leader in the world, the government hasn't provided those tools to Canadians. And it's incumbent upon every person in this place to ask why, to get those answers. Because we shouldn't be sitting in lockdown. We shouldn't be talking about more curfews. We shouldn't be talking about more restrictions. We shouldn't be asking Canadians to sacrifice more. We should be asking our government to do better. And that's what the leader of the opposition did tonight. And I want to break down exactly what the problem is, how we got here, and then what we need to do to move forward. So, this is my suspicion. About a year ago, when this all started going down, I really don't think that the federal liberals, that the prime minister took the pandemic seriously. We saw that because they didn't lock down Canadian borders. They didn't want us to cancel flights from China. They were saying that there was no person-to-person -person transmission of COVID. They were relying on data that wasn't coming from Canadian sources. They were doing a lot of things to kind of downplay this issue. But let's talk about what this means in the context of a vaccine. We know that the federal liberals during that time when they were like, nah, it's kind of not a big deal, right? You remember that Canada, we didn't actually close our borders till the middle of March, late March last year. Um, they signed a deal with a company called CanSino. This is a company that has ties with the Chinese government. They put all of our eggs, all of Canada's hopes that we're now relying upon to get out of lockdown in that basket. I don't know why, we don't have a lot of clarity on that. This is something that the leader of the opposition, myself, all of my colleagues here have been fighting for answers for. They were like, they were like well, I think, I think what they were doing is working with this company on scientific diplomacy, not to actually get Canadians vaccines. Now, what did this mean? Because they were working with this company, and I, I don't have any evidence to the contrary. We've been asking for contract details to refute this. We want the government to succeed. But because they put all their eggs in this ba basket and then it failed, the Chinese government was like, no dice, Canada. We didn't come to the table. The prime minister and his cabinet didn't get Canada to the party. We were late to the vaccine negotiating party with companies that were actually producing vaccines that would work, like Pfizer, like Moderna, like, you know, we're seeing these plain loads of vaccines coming in with hope to countries like Brazil, like the United States, but not here. And that's because they didn't come to the table. Now, what have we been trying to do to address this issue? We've been trying to get information because with information, we can create solutions, right? If we don't have information, if the Canadian public, if you, those who are watching don't have that information, we can't create solutions. So we need to know, why did the government start negotiating those contracts so late? Why? What did they actually negotiate? Why, when Pfizer, this company that within a year created this amazing product that could stop the pandemic in its tracks, why is it that other countries this week are getting vaccines, but we're not here in Canada. We need to know that. Why, why is that, right? There has to be a reason, and those reasons lie in those contracts. And we try to, as Conservatives, because we've been trying to drive to solutions, we want Canada to get vaccines, we want the government to be successful, we try to pass a motion in the House for the, the, the government to release some of those details, to be transparent with Canadians. But you know what they did? They put out a minister that said, we're not gonna get any vaccines if we release those details, which is just like, you know, it's politics at its worst at a time when we need to come together, right? Information means answers. Information means solutions. Information means vaccines. Information means an end to lockdowns. Now, you know, what's disappointed me is that in the last few weeks, we've seen the government do something that no government should do in a situation like this, which is point fingers, right? They've said, ah, it's the provincial government's fault. Mm -hmm. But the provincial governments can't deliver vaccines they don't have. Right. And it's the prime minister's job to get us those vaccines. They've tried to even say that it was 
the drug manufacturing company's fault. I mean, maybe it is, but I, we don't know because they won't release the details of those contracts. And even a lot of media today are starting to say, well, why aren't they releasing those details? Countries around the world that are facing production delays are starting to put forward details about their contracts, right? To say, we're gonna fight for the, de like, for the, the, the remedy that we have in those contracts, the, the, the recourse that we have when things go awry with companies so that our citizens get a tool to move forward. But the federal liberals, the prime minister, has not been doing that. We don't know. And the, to move forward, the first thing the government needs to do is make those details public so that provincial governments of all political stripe can start planning for the delivery of these vaccines. So that provincial governments, when they're talking about, okay, do we end lockdowns? What's going on with these variants? They have some hope or some information on these variants. That's what the conservatives are fighting for, is that information to start. And we're doing that with committee meetings, with compelling the ministers to appear. And this is happening with all of the opposition parties. We're working together on this because we understand that this isn't about politics, this is about getting answers. So tonight, this debate is about holding the federal government's feet to the fire and saying, come on guys, come clean so that we can move forward, right? There's so many other things. I, I mean, Last night, I was on national television with a senior Liberal MP who was put out by the Prime Minister's office to talk about vaccines and these issues. And he started talking about how the federal government was, a lot of their plans were banking on vaccines that hadn't been approved by the government yet. Information means vaccines. Information means a way out of lockdowns. It means hope. And they couldn't tell us when they were going to like what the approval process was for these vaccines or how many doses that they ordered, and that needs to stop, right? It really does. We need to have those answers. We need to understand what happened so that we can move forward. And I, you know, Mr. Speaker, for those who are watching tonight, I don't care if you vote Conservative or not, we're all Canadians. And we need every Canadian to be helping us demand answers on this. That's the only way we're gonna move forward, and that's what our party wants. There's a lot of stories, I just encourage people who are watching to ask themselves this one real question. When could I get a vaccine if I wanted one? When could I get one? Right now the Prime Minister can't answer that question. That's a big problem because it means that we don't have hope as a country while other countries do. We need to do better. It starts with that information. It starts with demanding more. As the leader of a, the opposition bed is, is said, it's about doing better to provide hope and compassion for all Canadians. And on this side of the aisle, that's what we're fighting for. Well said. Uh, question Merci, M. le Président. Merci à la députée de calgary nose d'abord pour l'intervention de la motion de ce soir et aussi pour sa combativité. On a un enjeu aujourd'hui, c'est évidemment la capacité de recevoir des vaccins. Pour moi, cet enjeu-là va aussi dans la capacité de produire ces vaccins-là. Évidemment, on le sait, au Canada, actuellement, on n'en produit aucun. Qu'est-ce qui fait, selon elle, qu'on se retrouve dans cette situation-là aujourd'hui? Qu'est-ce qu'on pourrait mettre en place pour s'assurer que les industries canadiennes, évidemment, ce qu'elles supportent dans une économie intérieure forte, Comment on peut s'assurer que le Québec ou le reste du Canada puisse produire des vaccins comme ça s'est fait par le passé et d'avoir une industrie pharmaceutique qui ne nous rend pas dépendants de ce qui est produit dans le reste du monde? Merci, M. le Président. I want to thank my colleague. I mean, this is, an, this is a, a great show of what Canadian Parliament can do. We have opposition parties working together to get answers. And I know my colleague has been working hard on the industry committee to, to get answers on that very topic. I know in coming days at the industry committee, we are going to be having the ministers of health to answer that very question. Why, why did the federal liberal government not do more? to allow Canadians the hope of manufacturing vaccines here at home. Why, after spending $400 billion, that's a lot of money, I mean, they could have built a gold-plated rocket ship to the moon. They didn't really do anything on the vaccine manufacturing front. And those Liberals are going to face some tough questions from members of all parties next week. So I want to thank him for his work, and I look forward to fighting hard to get Canadians from coast to coast vaccines with him next week. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for uh, Vancouver Kingsway. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my honourable colleague uh, for her speech, and uh, it's it's really uh, quite a privilege to work with her on Health Committee. Um, the question I'd like to ask her is this, is given that the current supply disruption will further delay vaccination for Canada's highest risk populations, does the member opposite agree uh, with me and, and my New Democrat colleagues that additional public health measures, such as paid sick days, national standards for long-term care, frequent rapid testing at high-risk workplaces, stricter travel restrictions and quarantine requirements are needed now to interrupt the rapid growth of COVID-19 and the spread of the highly contagious variants that are now appearing in Canada. Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. I want to thank my colleague for bringing to light, if I could summarize what he just talked about, it's the fact that COVID has really created and exacerbated inequalities in the Canadian system. Not everybody can afford to take two weeks off of work when their kid is sick and has the sniffles to wait for 10 days for test results. It's just something that people can't afford. People that you know, have loved ones abroad, they, they, they can't afford two weeks in a COVID detention center that's like, like the government has been so far behind on these issues. And we have the tools to address these things. Things like rapid testing, things like vaccines that Canada's not getting right now, better therapeutics. I, I mean, my colleague has been at the forefront of addressing some of these issues. It's been very frustrating to not be getting answers from the federal government on these fronts. But absolutely, we need to be fighting the inequalities and injustices that have been created by COVID through techniques that we've been we, we've known have been possible since march of last year we need leadership from this government and if they're not going to give it to us the opposition parties will questions and comments on the deputy de louis saint laurent Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, j'ai évidemment apprécié grandement le propos euh, de la députée de Calgary Nos Hill, également du chef de l'opposition officielle. On se souviendra, Monsieur le Président, que l'automne dernier, de ce côté-ci de la Chambre, nous avons questionné, talonné le gouvernement avec 126 questions sur l'importance de la vaccination. On se souvient également qu'on a même salué et applaudi la nomination du brigadier général Fortin, qui allait coordonner toutes ces activités-là. Mais on a vu aussi le premier ministre, en décembre dernier, ici, dans cette Chambre, se lever et dire « We deliver! Nous, on livre! » Mais on se retrouve aujourd'hui, Monsieur le Président, avec zéro vaccin. Est-ce que la députée pourrait nous dire pourquoi, selon elle, le premier ministre s'est assuré d'avoir des vaccins pour le gros cadeau de Noël, mais strictement rien assuré pour la suite des choses? I really want to thank my colleague for his leadership, but also and just being such a strong, authentic voice for the people of Quebec. I mean, I hear over and over again about how Quebecois right now, they're struggling with the curfews, the mental health, and, and, and this is because their, their provincial government, their premier does not have the tools they need to get through it. Rapid tests, the vaccines, you know, and I, and I feel, I feel for the provincial government. I just really want to thank my colleague, the House Leader, our chief quarterback here as the opposition in the House of Commons, for championing these issues on behalf of the people of Quebec, getting the vaccine, getting hope, getting a way out. And that's what we need to do. That's why we're having that debate tonight. So thank you to my colleague, and I certainly hope he keeps his efforts up. Resuming debate, the Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Uh, we're hearing uh, we're hearing the minister just fine. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians have endured so much since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Extended families have been separated, unable to see each other or travel because of the stringent restrictions that we need to follow to curb the spread of the virus. So many are feeling isolated and alone. While we have seen some positive signs of slowing the spread over the last few days, these past few months have been hard ones as we have experienced a resurgence of the virus. The pandemic continues to take a toll on all aspects of our lives, including our economic well-being. 
and our mental and our physical health. Many are unable to work. And of course, so many of our small business owners have had to close their doors while we grapple with bringing case numbers under control. Our government has taken numerous measures to ensure that Canadians are supported in their time of need. And with that support, we are laying the foundations for an economic recovery, one that will have Canada bounce back stronger than ever. I know that members agree that we need to do everything we can to get our economy back on track. And we all want that recovery to happen as soon as possible. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we need to keep Canadians safe now. Since the first case was reported in Canada, nearly 20,000 Canadians have died from the virus. That number is a stark reminder of what is at stake here as we hold this emergency debate. Each one of those deaths represents a grieving family that has lost a loved one, be a grandparent, a parent, sibling, or even a child. In so many cases, not even having the opportunity to say goodbye. It is true, Canadians are tired of restrictions and limiting their contacts, but most are doing their part because they know the cost. They have been doing their part since day one, and our government has been doing everything it can to get us all through this unprecedented crisis. Since the beginning, my Department of Public Services and Procurement Canada has worked diligently to procure the necessary supplies to support our frontline healthcare workers. We work nonstop to procure vital PPE and other medical supplies for frontline healthcare workers. This work was not easy. Global demand meant that early and urgent supplies largely came from overseas. However, Canadian industry stepped up, building domestic capacity so that many of our procurements are now Canadian-based. And with over 2.5 billion individual pieces of PPE and medical equipment secured, we are increasingly returning to competitive procurements wherever feasible. In this same competitive environment, Mr. Speaker, we have also made great strides in purchasing much needed COVID tests, included rapid testing, an important element for Canada's ongoing response. To date, we have delivered more than 15 million rapid tests for use by our provincial and territorial partners. Ultimately though, we know that the only way out of this pandemic is by getting vaccines to Canadians as quickly as possible. Mr. Speaker, our approach to procuring vaccines has been deliberate, strategic, and comprehensive. At the outset of the pandemic, when pharmaceutical companies took on the challenge, none of us knew if it was even possible to develop a vaccine against COVID-19. Once vaccine candidates began to show promise, we knew that we would be dealing with a highly complex and competitive global market. Scientists, manufacturers, and regulators around the globe would be working under intense pressure to develop, produce, and carefully assess safe and effective vaccines. And not unlike our experience in procuring medical supplies and equipment, we knew that we would be operating in a highly competitive marketplace. To say the least, the risks were high and the unknowns were many. And for that very reason, Mr. Speaker, starting last summer, we pursued a diversified vaccine procurement approach, one that allowed us to secure doses as early as possible by signing agreements in principle while the details for the final purchase agreement were being negotiated. And at the same time, we were proactive in acquiring critical goods and services, such as needles, syringes, and more, in order to support the provinces and territories when it came time to administer the vaccines. As a government, our decisions and response to the pandemic have always been based on the best and most recent scientific understanding of the virus. 
Our work here was guided by our COVID-19 task force on vaccines, the creation of which was a key element of our government's vaccine strategy early on. The task force is composed of experts and industry leaders providing scientific and technical advice. Mr. Speaker, on the advice of this task force, we began signing agreements with potential suppliers as early as last July on behalf of the Public Health Agency of Canada. In all, our government managed to gain access to nearly 400 million doses of potential vaccines from seven different manufacturers, resulting in one of the most robust and diverse portfolios of COVID-19 vaccines in the world. Our goal was to solidify early access to a highly diversified portfolio so that Canada would be well positioned to receive doses quickly once they were deemed safe and effective. Mr. Speaker, in December, our approach began to pay off. When Health Canada was close to authorizing the use of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, we were similarly able to negotiate the arrival of doses earlier than scheduled. Similarly, Canada was successful in negotiating the delivery of the Moderna vaccine starting in December, which proved important for distribution to indigenous and remote communities, given Moderna's less stringent refrigeration requirements. Through our agreements with Pfizer and Moderna, we were guaranteed 20 million doses of each vaccine with options to purchase more. And soon after the vaccines began to roll in, and thanks to the flexibility of those agreements, we were able to exercise options for 20 million more doses of each. Mr. Speaker, because we laid the groundwork, because we took action as early as possible, because we took a strategic approach, one that would ensure the best outcome for Canadians, we have secured 80 million doses of authorized vaccines under contract to be delivered this year. And I would add, when our candidates from the five remaining manufacturers we have under agreement receive Health Canada approval, we will take a similar course of action with a view getting vaccines into this country as soon as possible. As for timing, the shipments of Moderna and Pfizer we have secured are already bringing relief to communities across Canada, with vulnerable people in long-term care homes and healthcare workers being vaccinated. So far, we have received and distributed a total of 1.1 million COVID-19 vaccine doses to the provinces and territories. It has been truly a Team Canada approach, and thanks to the work of the provinces and territories, vaccines are now getting into the arms of Canadians. Mr. Speaker, just as I've been committed to being transparent and upfront with Canadians about our progress on vaccines, I am also committed to being upfront with Canadians when issues arrive. And as I've said, we've always known that we would be operating in a highly complex and intensely competitive environment. We knew that vaccine manufacturers would need to ramp up production at unprecedented speeds as they feel orders from around the world. And that is why we pursued a number of agreements early on in the pandemic when the vaccines began to show promise so that Canada would have more security through a diversified portfolio. When Pfizer informed us that there would be a temporary delay in their shipments starting this week, I was disappointed and frustrated to say the least. My team has been in direct communication with Pfizer, as have I, to make sure that Pfizer meets its commitments. I can also assure this House that I have been in contact with Pfizer personally, almost on a daily basis, to reiterate firmly the importance for Canada of returning to our regular delivery schedule as soon as possible. It is important to note that the temporary delay in deliveries is so that Pfizer can increase its production capacity so we can expect a ramp up of deliveries in the vaccine following this disruption. 
It is also important to note that Canada is far from the only country impacted by the disruption. All countries supplied by Pfizer's European facility have had its shipments impacted. Pfizer has confirmed that while the next few weeks will be challenging when it comes to deliveries, hundreds of thousands of doses will be delivered the weeks of February 15th and the weeks that follow. They have also confirmed that we will receive all 4 million doses owed to us in the first quarter of this year, on time before March 31st. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that between Moderna and Pfizer, we still anticipate receiving 6 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines by the end of March. After that, we can expect a significant acceleration in the delivery of authorized vaccines. From April to June, we expect that at least 20 million doses of vaccines will be available to Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Between Pfizer and Moderna alone, we remain on track to have enough vaccines by the end of September for everyone in Canada who is eligible and wants to be vaccinated. And Mr. Speaker, we also continue to follow developments concerning vaccine candidates of the five other manufacturers with whom we have agreements. Sanofi GSK, Medicago, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and Novavax. And I can tell you that we will continue to pursue even more doses through these agreements as more vaccine candidates are deemed safe and effective with a view to getting them into Canada as quickly as possible. Mr. Speaker, the toll that COVID-19 has taken on our citizens and our economy has been devastating. But I have to reiterate that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We are on our way to getting through this. The vaccines are here and more will arrive very soon. In working with the provinces and territories, we have established supply chains to get vaccines into the arms of Canadians as soon as possible. The immunization effort will be one of the greatest undertakings in this country's history. But it will not happen overnight, and there will be bumps along the way. I will always be transparent and upfront with Canadians about the status of our efforts. And while the global market is complex and can be unstable at times, the fact is now we can see a way out of this pandemic. We are in the final stretch with vaccines being rolled out As the Prime Minister reported to Canadians on Friday, Canada is now approaching three quarters of a million vaccine doses administered across the country. And the average number of doses administered daily is now almost four times than what it was just three weeks ago. There is more work to do and we must remain vigilant. For Canadians, that means continuing to follow guidelines from our local health officials, doing everything we can to limit our contacts and once again flatten the curve. It will not be easy, but our actions will be quite literally saving lives over these winter months. For our government and for all members of this House, it means continuing to support Canadians in their time of need, And as we returned to the House yesterday, it marked one year since the first recorded case of COVID-19 in Canada. Not many of us here could have anticipated what the past year would look like. But we found a way to come together in the face of such adversity. Our work is by no means done. Yes, the vaccines are arriving. And yes, Canadians are doing their part to flatten the curve. Until we can inoculate everyone who wants a vaccine. Thanks to our efforts so far, through our collaboration in the House, by working with provinces and territories, and because of our Team Canada approach, we are making progress. By this time next year, my sincere hope is that the pandemic will be behind us once and for all. While I appreciate the fact that this emergency debate is addressing the most pressing issue facing our nation, 
Now is not the time for scoring political points. The fact is that we are getting the job done when it comes to vaccines. And despite bumps in the road, we are on track to meeting our goal of inoculations available to every eligible Canadian who wants one by September. I know that if we can keep working for Canadians together, we will get through this and we will make our hopes a reality. Merci beaucoup, Megwetch. Thank you so much. Uh, questions and comments. Uh, we'll first go to the Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we do have a big problem in Canada. We, we didn't get any vaccines from Pfizer this week. And I'll note that Italy is pondering suing Pfizer uh, as it relates to production delays, which means that they have some sort of recourse negotiated in their contracts, right? That the government would have negotiated of Italy some sort of clause that allowed them to do this. I'm really wondering why the federal government has been so quiet if they negotiated this. Um, why haven't they been out on it? What recourse did the federal government negotiate with Pfizer? Um, and why haven't they uh, decided to pursue it? Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Mr. Speaker, I should add that as a matter of contract law, any contractual party can sue another party if there is a breach of contract. But the reality, Mr. Speaker, is that we believe that the most effective course of action is to continue to negotiate with our suppliers to ensure that they are obliging and abiding by their contractual commitments. And that's exactly what we've been able to secure from Pfizer, a commitment that they will deliver their contractual commitments of 4 million doses prior to the end of Q1, Mr. Speaker. And that has proven to be an effective strategy thus far. Uh, Qu'est-ce que commentaire? Uh, L'honorable député de Beauport, uh, Libalou. Merci, Monsieur le Président. La ministre a mentionné qu'il a fallu prendre des décisions rapidement à la dernière minute. En parlant de dernière minute, on a su le 19 janvier que Pfizer allait faire une mise à jour de ses installations en Belgique qui mènerait à la situation qu'on vit actuellement. Des mises à jour, ça se planifie d'avance. Il y a des trucs à acheter, il y a de la technologie à acheter. Comment se fait-il qu'on ait appris la mise à jour seulement le 19 janvier, puis quand est-ce que le gouvernement, lui, le su? Merci. Dans la ministre des Services publics. Merci pour la question, Monsieur le Président. Euh, je voudrais dire que le Pfizer m'a dit euh, le sujet de la réduction le jeudi soir et le vendredi matin, le prochain euh, jour, jusqu'à 12 heures après que Pfizer m'a dit euh, la réduction. Euh, J'ai dit la nouvelle à tous les Canadiens, les Canadiennes, It was just 12 hours, Mr. Speaker, after Pfizer told me of this news that I told Canadians, because I believe that whether news is positive or negative, I have an obligation to tell Canadians what that news is. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has repeatedly and explicitly talked about her commitment to transparency, yet to this day, she has not released one word of one contract of the seven contracts that this government has signed with vaccine manufacturers, unlike other countries. So in the interest of transparency, will this minister release to Canadians portions of the contracts that at least tell Canadians how many doses we're going to receive, by when and from who, or does she not trust Canadians who are paying for these doses of vaccines with that information? The Honourable Minister. 
I thank the honorable member for the question, Mr. Speaker. And uh, indeed, we are forthcoming with information about our delivery schedules. As soon as we have those, Mr. Speaker, we provide those to the provinces and territories and the public at large. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, no other country, to my knowledge, puts out week-to-week -week delivery schedules. And the reason we put those delivery schedules out, Mr. Speaker, is because we believe that the provinces and territories and Canadians at large need to be able to plan in terms of when vaccinations are going to be occurring in their province, Mr. Speaker. And that's our commitment to Canadians to make sure that we have an orderly rollout of this vaccination campaign, which we began in earnest with our negotiations last August, putting in place contracts to secure the largest, most significant uh, portfolio of doses in the world and the largest number of doses per capita in the world, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and to the Honourable Minister, I, I, I want to say from an opposition bench tonight that I know that she has been working extremely hard. I don't know how it's so easy to set to, uh, what is it, Monday morning quarterback. These vaccines weren't, I mean, I think it's extraordinary that we have vaccines. This is a remarkable achievement of modern science that vaccines exist for something that we didn't even know about a year ago. That's not to say mistakes haven't been made, but I think we can turn the temperature down. My question to the minister is this. I'm disturbed by the fact that Pfizer is trying to negotiate in the media with this government to, re to, to get better tax treatment at the same time that it's withholding vaccines because of difficulties with its Belgian manufacturing. Has the minister detected any link between Pfizer's requests for better tax treatments and Canadians' access to vaccines? Service uh, Public. I thank the honorable member for the question, Mr. Speaker, and for her comments this evening. I would like to state very firmly that the only thing that I have discussed with Pfizer is the delivery schedule for the vaccines, the contractual obligations for the vaccines, and the dates of arrival of vaccines in this country. It is something I do every single day with our vaccine suppliers, and I will not personally rest until all Canadians have access to a vaccine, which we expect to be before September 30th, 2021, if not before. I want to reiterate that I have not discussed any other matter with the vaccine suppliers at all. Thank you. Uh, J'aimerais savoir, la ministre qui se targue, donc le gouvernement se targue d'être les grands défenseurs des aînés, quelles conséquences a ce manque d'approvisionnement? Donc, qui sont les premières personnes visées par les vaccins? Les aînés. Qui sont ceux qui sont donc victimes les premiers du manque d'approvisionnement en vaccins? Les aînés. Qui sont ceux qui doivent encore être pris pour être isolés seuls? Les aînés. Dans la première vague, c'était une détresse. Maintenant, c'est rendu une frustration. Les aînés sont fâchés, ils sont en colère, ils ont hâte de pouvoir avoir leur vaccin. J'aimerais entendre la ministre sur qu qu quelles conséquences ça a sur les aînés, ce manque d'approvisionnement. Alors, le ministre des Services, euh, Services publics. Merci, euh, Monsieur le Président. Et euh, je voudrais dire premièrement que j'ai euh, mon père, il a 70 ans, il voudrait avoir un vaccin aussi et je veux qu'il va avoir un vaccin. Et ça, c'est un, un enjeu pour tous les, les euh, vieux hommes et femmes dans notre pays. Ça, c'est la raison que je travaillais fort pour les Canadiens et Canadiennes, pour s'assurer que nous allons avoir les vaccins ici au Canada pour toute la population aussitôt que possible. Ça, c'est ma priorité et ça, c'est la priorité de notre gouvernement, Monsieur le Président.
Merci beaucoup. Uh, questions and comments. The Honorable Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister. Thanks isn't enough to say for the amount of work that you've been doing, your department has been doing. I've been working with our local health, public health office in Guelph, with the family health team of physicians, with the hospital, with the long-term care uh, facilities. And I'm seeing the, the coordination required between the local efforts, the provincial efforts, and also the national efforts. And I am seeing some conversations that are happening between national and local. Could you maybe comment, Madam Minister, on the, the importance of getting the feedback from the local agencies to tell us how things are going in terms of the actual rollout, the acquisition of storage of, of, uh, of her vaccines, and the phased approach building up to a massive uh, distribution of vaccines in the coming months? Reprise du débat, resuming debate. The, I'm sorry, was that... Uh, that's good. Resuming debate, reprise du débat, l'honorable député. Going back to the minister. Yes, okay, that's what I thought. Sorry about that. <laughs> the honourable minister. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I thank the honourable member for the question. And I will say that we put in place a very complex and deliberate mechanism and logistics system to ensure that there would be a smooth rollout of vaccines across the country. And indeed, we had to assure Pfizer and Moderna that we had a smooth logistics system in place before they would provide us with those early deliveries that we received in December. It was once Major General Danny Fortin had done a dry run with the provinces and territories, and we were able to assure Pfizer and Moderna that we had a logistic system in place that ran end to end from the point of production to the source of delivering the, these vaccines that they felt assured that they could deliver those vaccines to Canada. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we were one of the first countries to be able to inoculate, begin inoculations in the world. Why we were one of the first countries to have every jurisdiction in our country undertaking inoculations. It was because of the end-to-end -end logistics systems that the federal government implemented in collaboration with the provinces and territories, including local municipalities. Uh, we also purchased freezers, a total of 446 freezers. We purchased dry ice. We purchased syringes and needles, gauze, bandages, alcohol swabs, sharps containers, delivered all of this across the country free of charge for the provinces so that we could support the local vaccination effort. That's our commitment as a federal government. That's what we're going to do because we believe that the health and safety of Canadians through this vaccination program is of the utmost importance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Reprise du débat, resuming debate, l'honorable député de Montcalm. Merci, uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Je vais partager mon temps avec ma collègue de Beauport-Limoilou. On n'a pas eu euh, à déployer plusieurs arguments pour euh, vous convaincre, M. le Président, du caractère urgent d'un tel débat. Et pour cause, nous sommes dans l'opacité la plus totale quant à l'échéancier de vaccination et quant aux ententes contractuelles. Les mots clés donc de mon intervention ce soir euh, sont « urgence d'agir » et « transparence ». En date d'aujourd'hui, le virus a entraîné 19 238 décès au Canada et contaminé plus de 753 000 personnes. Au Québec, il a contaminé plus de 250 000, 56 000 personnes et tué 9 577 personnes au Québec. Et j'insiste sur ces chiffres parce qu'il ne faudra jamais, par les statistiques, banaliser ces décès et cette souffrance humaine-là. Nous avons tous été touchés de près ou de loin par le décès d'un parent ou d'un ami, d'une connaissance, où nous connaissons tous quelqu'un qui a perdu un être cher. 
sans compter tous les patients non COVID qui attendent d'être soignés, dont certains seront soignés trop tard. Sans compter l'épuisement, le désarroi des intervenants de première ligne, ceux qui ont été des victimes directes et indirectes du virus. Et j'ai une pensée bienveillante ce soir pour la famille de cette jeune médecin qui s'est enlevé la vie dernièrement. Des gens ont perdu leur emploi ou ont ou vont faire faillite. Des gens vivent un état de stress permanent. La santé mentale de plusieurs des nôtres est affectée, et ce, dans toutes les catégories d'âge. Monsieur le Président, ce virus est virulent et sournois. Il nécessite de la part de nous tous, comme individus, l'établissement d'une routine d'hygiène sanitaire exemplaire et une persévérance à toute épreuve pour ne pas baisser les bras parce qu'un seul écart de conduite peut avoir des conséquences regrettables pour nous-mêmes et pour autrui. Gérer une crise sanitaire de cette ampleur s'implique de devoir prendre des décisions. Ce virus a toujours deux semaines d'avance sur nous. C'est pourquoi il faut être proactif. J'y reviendrai tantôt. Mais une chose est certaine, la dernière chose que nous ne pouvons nous permettre c'est de tergiverser, hésiter, parce qu'il y a urgence de prendre des décisions. En date d'aujourd'hui, le Québec a vacciné 225 000 personnes. Il est deux semaines en avance sur son échéancier, mais il y a rupture de stock. Il n'a plus de vaccin cette semaine. Le PM premier ministre devrait s'excuser d'avoir prétendu que les vaccins traîneraient dans les frigidaires. Monsieur le Président, il y a un an, à pareille date, nous prenions la mesure de l'ennemi à nos portes. Nous savions alors que le seul moyen de s'en sortir, c'était la vaccination et qu'entre-temps, il fallait gérer le temps et l'espace le temps pour se rapprocher d'une immunisation vaccinale, le temps de se laver les mains régulièrement, au moins 20 secondes, le temps de mettre un masque et gérer l'espace entre nous, de l'absence totale de contact, du confinement aux deux mètres de distanciation sociale pour éviter de se contaminer. Si... Nous n'étions pas prêts pour affronter la première vague. Il fallait être prêt pour la deuxième vague et surtout être prêt pour l'administration de la solution pour sortir de la crise, la vaccination. Mais pourquoi, à chaque étape décisionnelle, depuis le début de la gestion de cette pandémie, que ce soit la fermeture des frontières, les mesures de quarantaine des travailleurs étrangers, la subvention salariale et des amendements pour éviter que les partis politiques pigent dans le pot de bonbons à la place des entreprises et des employeurs et des employés qui en avaient besoin, réellement besoin. Les modifications incitatives au travail pour la PCU, que ce soit les modifications nécessaires au programme pour le loyer commercial. Plus récemment, l'interdiction des voyages récréatifs, par exemple vers des destinations soleil ou autres destinations récréatives pendant la relance scolaire, que ce soit la prise en charge de la quarantaine des voyageurs pour un meilleur contrôle et mieux se protéger de la menace des variants qui sont virulents, et en ce qui nous concerne ce soir, l'approvisionnement en vaccins, le gouvernement libéral se traîne les pieds. C'est malheureusement une constante de la gestion libérale de la pandémie qui sera retenue dans l'histoire de cette pandémie. Pourtant, depuis le tout début de la pandémie, nous savons que la vaccination, c'est la lumière au bout du tunnel. C'est une possibilité de survie pour un patient qui aurait pu être gravement atteint sans vaccination. C'est la possibilité de se sortir enfin d'une vie malmenée, d'une économie confinée. Pourquoi en sommes-nous là? Le premier ministre se vante 
du volume et de la diversité du portefeuille de vaccins. Mais encore faut-il arriver à, à ce qu'ils arrivent à temps, ces vaccins, et que les provinces et le Québec puissent prévoir les livraisons. La prévisibilité de l'approvisionnement en vaccins est capitale pour le Québec, les provinces et les territoires. La transparence quant à l'échéancier de livraison est cruciale. Or, actuellement, on connaît le volume. On ne connaît pas les coûts, ni les ententes contractuelles, ni les délais de livraison. J'imagine que le gouvernement a négocié correctement, mais c'est comme s'il ne s'était pas assuré de la livraison. Pourtant, Lorsqu'il s'agit d'une opération d'achat, l'équation de base, j'entends quelqu'un parler en même temps dans mes oreilles, l'équation de base, M. le Président, c'est le volume, le coût et la livraison. Équation volume, coût, livraison. Là, on connaît le volume. Le 27 novembre 2020, la santé publique canadienne prévoyait que l'ensemble de la population euh, serait vaccinée d'ici 2021. Vaccinée ou immunisée, pas précisé. Mais le docteur Gnou a affirmé que 3 millions de Canadiens seraient vaccinés durant le premier trimestre de 2021. Très franchement, M. le Président, je ne sais pas comment on peut arriver à une telle conclusion et c'est encore plus vrai depuis euh, l'annonce des retards de la livraison de Pfizer. La ministre parlait de 6 millions de doses tout à l'heure. Il faut les répartir. Est-ce que c'est 6 millions, de donc c'est 3 millions pour une immunisation totale? Une chose est certaine. Le gouvernement devrait déposer des scénarios allant du plus pessimiste au plus optimiste pour qu'on puisse connaître les chiffres et les hypothèses qui soutiennent son calendrier de vaccination. Encore faut-il qu'il en ait un plan de vaccination, ce dont je doute ce soir. Mais il est encore temps de bien faire les choses. Mieux vaut tard que jamais. Comment peut-il prétendre que d'ici à l'automne 2021, toutes les personnes qui auront voulu être vaccinées l'auront été? Moi, avec les données que j'ai présentement et l'opacité entourant le non-plan de vaccination du gouvernement, je ne peux pas assurer cela. Or, c'est au moins la moindre des choses qu'on devrait pouvoir présenter à ceux qui, présentement, sont confinés et sont sous couvre-feu au Québec. Il faudra aussi ne pas faire les mêmes erreurs. On n'a pas investi correctement dans notre indépendance à pouvoir produire des vaccins. Alors, il faudra que le gouvernement pallier rapidement notre dépendance à la production des vaccins à l'étranger. Prendre les mesures nécessaires pour accroître la production locale parce que des pandémies, Monsieur le Président, il va y en avoir d'autres. Et on ne peut pas, comme ça, continuer de dépendre des autres. D'autant plus que j'imagine que ces béton les ententes que le gouvernement a négociées parce qu'il s'est départi des moyens qu'il avait, les moyens légaux, pour pouvoir assurer un minimum de production localement. Alors, à toutes ces questions, j'aimerais avoir des réponses et heureusement que le débat que nous avons ce soir nous permet de les poser, ces questions-là. Merci, M. le Président. Questions et commentaires. Questions and comments, the Honorable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. 
thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm just wondering if my colleague could speak about the fact that I think Quebec has experienced a very difficult situation over the last few weeks with the curfew. I know he's been on top of this, talking about how the curfew has affected uh, his constituents. Um, maybe he could speak a little bit more about how the work that he's doing in the health committee uh, will help find a way forward and how important it is for the federal government to be clear to the residents of Quebec about when they'll be able to get a vaccine. L'honorable député de Montcalm. Mais euh, ma collègue, ma distinguée collègue, euh, sait très bien que nous sommes en train de mettre en place euh, une étude sur la vaccination qui débutera très rapidement, à l'initiative d'ailleurs de, de mes collègues conservateurs, euh, dès euh, lundi prochain. Euh, nous allons commencer cette étude-là et j'imagine que durant ces quatre euh, séances, en plus de recevoir euh, les ministres concernés, on va pouvoir avoir des réponses aux questions que je pose ce soir. Donc, euh, oui, euh, le comité permanent de la santé a joué un rôle important euh, dans la compréhension et dans les solutions que nous mettons de l'avant et qu'il faut mettre de l'avant. Le problème, c'est que le gouvernement, euh, même s'il entend de bonnes choses, est souvent à la traîne et n'est pas proactif dans l'établissement des solutions. Questions et commentaires? L'honorable député de dabitibi témiscamingue Merci, M. le Président. Merci au député de Montcalm pour son travail acharné dans ce dossier-là. Pour moi, M. le Président, le nerf de la guerre, c'est la capacité de produire des vaccins. Évidemment, dans le débat actuel, ce qui ressort, c'est qu'on n'en produit pas de vaccins au Canada. Qu'est-ce qui aurait pu être fait dès le début de la pandémie pour s'assurer que l'ensemble des Canadiens et des Québécois puissent avoir un vaccin, accès à un vaccin qui est produit ici? Est-ce que la solution de Medicago est encore valable? Comment aurait-on pu mieux la soutenir? Puis qu'est-ce qu'on propose pour la suite des choses pour s'assurer que chacun puisse être vacciné le plus rapidement possible pour qu'on retrouve la vie la plus normale possible? Merci. L'honorable député de Montcalm. Je remercie mon collègue pour sa question euh, et je le remercie de, de soulever le fait qu'il y a chez nous des gens euh, Medicago au Québec qui... Euh, sont en train d'arriver euh, à proposer une solution qui pourra, j'imagine, être prometteuse euh, et pourra probablement nous permettre une production ici. Mais ce n'est pas parce qu'ils ont été euh, favorisés ni encouragés dès le départ. Ils ont dû travailler très fort pour euh, pouvoir se sortir la tête de l'eau et, et arriver là où ils en sont aujourd'hui. Et euh, autant euh, les gouvernements, on, on l'a mentionné, il l'a mentionné tout à l'heure, euh, il y a eu comme un désinvestissement dans l'industrie pharmaceutique au Québec qui était florissant et notamment dans la capacité de produire des vaccins. Et je pense qu'il faudra euh, absolument pallier à cette situation-là parce que, comme je disais tout à l'heure, des pandémies, il y en aura d'autres. Le gouvernement aurait pu aussi euh, ne pas se départir de, des dispositions euh, qui avaient été mises en place lors de la première euh, vague et permettre à, euh, quitte à ensuite payer les, les droits aux compagnies pharmaceutiques, permettre de reproduire le vaccin ici. Sauf qu'avec ce désinvestissement-là euh, dans l'industrie pharmaceutique, nous avions une capacité réduite. Et il y a aussi, aussi malheureusement, l'expérience euh, malheureuse euh, euh, qui a été faite avec euh, la pharmaceutique chinoise, de sorte qu'on euh, a réduit nos capacités de production ici au Québec. Mais il y a moyen d'arriver à une solution si effectivement, on investit ce qu'il faut et qu'on ne met pas toujours nos œufs dans le même panier de la production euh, dans l'Ouest pétrolière. Questions et commentaires, the Honorable Member for Vancouver East. A question of uh, 60 seconds or less, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank you to the Member for his um, comments. I'm wondering um, whether or not 
uh, if the bloc would support the call for action to ensure that all migrant workers documented and undocumented also had access to the vaccine free of charge. Uh, as we know, many of them are frontline workers in the sense that they're providing food on the table uh, and putting their ri lives at risk. So I wonder whether or not the member would support uh, the call for action to ensure everyone uh, who wants a vaccine in Canada, whether they, they are migrant workers, Canadians or undocumented workers, uh, would be able to get one free of charge. Honorable député de Montcalm. Euh, la question m'étonne, effectivement. Je veux dire, la pandémie, elle est mondiale et à un moment donné, au début de la première vague, euh, on disait aux gens, euh, au comité de la santé, au comité permanent, on disait qu'il euh, est important avec le programme euh, euh, COVAX, euh, AGI, etc., qu'on puisse vacciner l'ensemble de la planète et que tout le monde ait un accès équitable. Or, ici, ils sont des travailleurs de première ligne chez nous. Euh, C'est clair, net et précis qu'il devrait y avoir droit absolument et on devrait aussi faire nos efforts pour que ailleurs dans d'autres pays moins nantis on puisse vacciner les gens parce que tant qu'on n'a pas vacciné l'ensemble de la planète ben on va recevoir encore possiblement des variants chez nous donc il faut qu'on soit solidaire il y a une solidarité planétaire à développer et notamment pour des gens qui euh, viennent nous donner un coup de main chez nous encore plus Reprise du débat, resuming debate, l'honorable député de Beauport-Limoilou. Merci, Monsieur le Président. La dernière pandémie remonte à il y a 100 ans. La dernière campagne nationale de vaccination date de 1952 et c'était pour contrer la polio. Depuis ce temps, les connaissances, les techniques, les technologies ont exponentiellement changé. Cette fois-ci, nous avons presque eu de la chance. En effet, depuis la crise du SRAS de 2003, les scientifiques à travers le monde avaient averti les gouvernements à propos des risques excessivement élevés qu'une pandémie survienne dans un avenir rapproché. Ils étaient quasiment prêts à parier leur chemise que cette pandémie serait causée par un coronavirus. Cependant, un peu partout à travers le monde, les gouvernements ont coupé dans la recherche universitaire. Mauvaise idée. Nous avons même eu la chance ici, grâce à la technologie, de constater la dévastation causée en Chine par le virus quelques mois avant qu'il n'arrive au Canada. Il y a un an, jour pour jour, des questions étaient posées dans cette Chambre concernant les mesures prises pour limiter la propagation du virus au Canada en obligeant les personnes arrivant de Chine à se soumettre à une quarantaine obligatoire. Je regardais la situation puis je me disais, wow, on est quand même chanceux d'avoir des avertissements à l'avance. On va être préparé. J'ai déchanté. Je vais vous parler de l'approvisionnement, de calcul mathématique simple puis de l'importance de l'information. L'approvisionnement est un dossier complexe par sa nature même. La complexité a grandement augmenté avec la pandémie parce que le gouvernement doit non seulement rencontrer ses obligations habituelles, mais aussi rencontrer des nouvelles obligations. Il était clair qu'il fallait des équipements personnels de protection. Cependant, étant donné que le Québec, les provinces canadiennes et le Canada avaient quasi abandonné leurs usines manufacturières au profit de celles de la Chine, il a été parfois très difficile de s'approvisionner adéquatement en matériel. Parmi les éléments qu'il fallait aussi planifier d'avance, il y avait les vaccins. Il fallait investir dans la recherche, mais aussi faire des réservations. Il était avisé de faire des réservations chez plusieurs compagnies, étant donné que nous ne savions pas lesquelles seraient les premières à présenter un candidat vaccin potable, efficace. Combien ces réservations ont-elles coûté? On ne le sait pas. Quels sont les échéanciers associés aux réservations et aux livraisons? On ne le sait pas. Euh, quel est le pourcentage des vaccins produits par semaine dans, ces, dans chacune de ces usines qui revient au Canada? On ne le sait pas. Le gouvernement a beau se péter les bretelles d'avoir le plus grand portefeuille au monde, les vaccins ne se donnent pas. En ce qui concerne les vaccins, étant donné que les, des modifications ont été faites à la loi sur les brevets, les pharmaceutiques qui étaient ici se sont déplacés ailleurs. Résultat, le Québec et le Canada ont très peu d'usines euh, produisant des candidats vaccins. Dans ma circonscription, j'ai de la chance, Medicago est non seulement en test clinique pour son candidat vaccin, mais en plus, son usine va être prête au courant de l'année 2021. Donc, on va pouvoir avoir des vaccins rapidement. 
Aujourd'hui, une pharmaceutique de l'Ouest a annoncé qu'elle était aussi capable de produire son vaccin. Bonne nouvelle! Mais c'est une nouvelle qui a failli pas avoir lieu parce que l'aide, le soutien financier promis en avril aux pharmaceutiques du Canada n'est arrivé qu'en juillet-août. Pendant ce temps-là, les négociations étaient ouvertes avec l'étranger, puis nos entreprises attendaient de l'aide. Une planification globale aurait inclus un suivi dans la promesse médiatisée du premier ministre. J'ajoute un dernier point au niveau de la planification. Il n'est pas normal qu'une compagnie avertisse le 19 janvier ou jeudi le 14 qu'elle ne sera pas en mesure de fournir le nombre de doses inclus dans l'entente pour les semaines à venir parce qu'elle doit faire une mise à jour de ses installations. Il n'est pas question de réparation d'urgence. Une mise à jour, ça se planifie longtemps d'avance des mois, parfois même des années. Là, on va dire des mois. C'est le genre de décision qui se planifie, puis on n'a pas eu de nouvelles à ce moment-là. Moment Pourquoi le Canada n'a pas été mis au fait à l'avance de cette mise à jour, notamment au moment de consolider la, la livraison des vaccins? On ne le sait pas. Ce gouvernement avait été mis au courant avant le 19 janvier, 14 janvier, de ce que la ministre nous a dit, de cette mise à jour des installations. Il aurait pu demander à l'usine de Pfizer d'utiliser son usine du Michigan pour nous fournir. Pourquoi ça n'a pas été fait? On ne le sait pas. Avoir su d'avance, lors des négociations, il aurait été possible pour le gouvernement de se tourner vers d'autres fournisseurs, comprenons ici Moderna. Ça s'appelle de la planification de base. J'aimerais faire un calcul maintenant mathématique simple, simple, simple avec vous. J'aimerais ça avoir mon tableau blanc de prof, des crayons. Prenez une feuille et un papier. Bon. Depuis décembre, le gouvernement dit que tous les Canadiens vont être vaccinés d'ici la fin septembre. Ce matin, le premier ministre précisait que ce serait tous les Canadiens désirant avoir le vaccin qui l'auront. Ceci dit, pour qu'il y ait immunité communautaire et qu'on ait enfin la sainte paix de ce virus-là, il faut 70 à 80 de la population qui se fasse vacciner. Bon, supposons que 75 de la population veut se faire vacciner. Ça veut dire que sur 38 millions de Canadiens, 28,5 millions de personnes vont être vaccinées. Comme il faut deux doses du vaccin, ça donne 57 millions de vaccins. Vous me suivez encore? Oh, oui, oui. Bon? Okay. c'est bon. Donc, puisqu'il reste environ 35 semaines d'ici la fin septembre, ça prendrait un peu plus de 1,6 million de doses reçues et administrées à chaque semaine pendant encore huit mois pour arriver à la promesse du premier ministre Trudeau et de la ministre Annan. La ministre nous disait qu'entre le début de la campagne de vaccination et la fin mars, nous aurons reçu un total de 6 millions de doses. Il en manquera quand même 51 millions de doses pour arriver à l'immunité communautaire. Et là, fin mars, entre la fin mars et septembre, on tombe à 24-25 semaines environ. Et qu'est-ce que ça veut dire? Ça veut dire que là, il va falloir recevoir et administrer 51 millions de doses. Dans ce, dans ce six mois-là, ça donne à peu près 1,9 million de doses par semaine à administrer. Le gouvernement, dans ses calculs, veut-il atteindre l'immunité collective d'ici la fin septembre? On ne le sait pas. Combien de personnes, selon le gouvernement, recevront deux doses d'ici la fin septembre? On ne le sait pas. Est-il possible de voir les calculs de quelqu'un? N'importe qui. Ça peut être fait là, vite, vite, sur une feuille de papier, une petite serviette, j'ai pas de problème, je suis pas difficile. Je veux juste comprendre. Pour la population, je veux comprendre. Vous savez, c'est facile de faire des blâmes à des gouvernements en leur disant « Bien, vous n'avez pas à retenir les doses. Distribuez. » Oui, mais ils nous font une deuxième dose. Non, non, distribuez. Vous n'avez pas à retenir les doses. Puis ensuite, on se vire de bord, les gouvernements distribuent les doses. Puis là, on dit « Hey, wow, 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 c'est parce qu'ils font une deuxième dose. » C'est facile de blâmer le monde. Mais ils font un plan. Il est où? On ne le sait pas. Je comprends qu'il y a des, des secrets industriels à garder, je comprends ça. Il est quand même possible de montrer un calendrier aux députés puis aux provinces pour que chacun puisse s'ajuster. Ça aiderait également le gouvernement à constater que les calculs ne rejoignent pas les promesses, à moins que le gouvernement ait des informations qu'il garde pour lui. L'information, c'est le pouvoir. Souvent, les gens pensent qu'ils ont beaucoup de pouvoir s'ils ont beaucoup d'informations puis qu'ils la gardent pour eux. Il faut 
tourner le miroir. Mm -hmm. J'ai constaté que les gens collaborent et s'ouvrent à la réflexion lorsqu'on les informe adéquatement, lorsqu'on ne les garde pas dans la noirceur. J'ai constaté que partager l'information permet à chacun d'avoir un sentiment rassurant de contrôle sur sa vie. On a donc devant soi deux versions de l'adage. Soit on utilise l'information pour avoir un, un pouvoir personnel avantageux pour une seule personne ou un petit groupe de personnes, ou on utilise l'information pour avoir un pouvoir commun qui fasse du bien à toute la population. Alors, je me questionne, pourquoi le gouvernement garde-t-il pour lui-même les informations concernant les ententes de livraison des vaccins? Pense-t-il au pouvoir purement électoraliste de l'information ou pense-t-il au bien commun? Moi, mon choix est fait. Je pense au bien commun. Point. Merci. Questions et commentaires. Ou avant qu'on va aux questions et commentaires, j'aimerais rappeler aux députés que quand on donne un discours ou on demande une question, on nomme pas les personnes de la Chambre, on les nomme par leur titre ou la circonscription dont ils viennent. Alors, juste un petit rappel pour les questions. Alors, euh, l'honorable député de Sherbrooke, non, de Shefford, j'étais proche. <rire> Merci, M. le Président. Ça fait longtemps qu'on ne s'est pas vu. Bonne année. Euh, rapidement, euh, ma collègue a très bien démontré l'importance de la distribution des vaccins et les calculs qui sont en ce moment très inquiétants et pour lesquels on n'a pas de réponse. En ce moment, l'inquiétude, autant en Ontario, on l'a vu dans certains centres de personnes âgées qu'au Québec, euh, M. Legault s'inquiète de l'arrivée de variants au Québec. En quoi est-ce que, et c'est prouvé en fin de semaine, que certains variants, notamment le variant britannique, pourraient, les vaccins pourraient avoir un effet mais un effet qui va fonctionner seulement après une deuxième et parfois même une troisième dose du vaccin. Donc, selon les calculs qu'on qu a devant nous, comment est-ce qu'on va pouvoir intervenir contre ces fameux variants qui nous menacent et l'inaction du gouvernement en plus sur les vols internationaux? Donc, vraiment, ce manque de planification et d'efficacité pour agir vraiment concrètement contre cette variant et les vaccins. L'honorable député de Beauport-Limoilou. Merci à mon honorable collègue de, de, de sa question qui est fort pertinente parce qu'en effet, si on n'a pas de réponse à nos questions concernant le calendrier de livraison, comment est-ce qu'on peut rassurer les gouvernements tant du Québec que des euh, gouvernements provinciaux et les gens? C'est tout ce qu'ils ont besoin, d'avoir de l'information pour être rassurés puis se dire qu'on va passer au travers. J'ai besoin de deux doses, il arrive quand mes doses? C'est tout. Et là, on ne l'a pas, ce qui est difficile à admettre. Questions et commentaires? L'honorable député d'Avignon, Métis Matane, Matabétéa. Merci, M. le Président, et je remercie ma collègue pour son discours. Euh, J'aimerais l'entendre un peu plus sur justement à quel point on est malheureusement dépendant des productions extérieures. Et on a des entreprises ici euh, au Québec, au Canada, qui pourraient très bien faire le travail. Euh, je pense à l'entreprise Medicago, euh, qui pourrait avoir une piste promesse pour la production de vaccins, bien entendu. Ce qu'on voit en ce moment, on a besoin de, de solutions à court terme, euh, mais dans un avenir rapproché quand même, est-ce que le gouvernement fédéral devrait faire davantage confiance à, à ce qu'on peut produire directement chez nous? Honorable député de Beauport-Limoilou. Je crois, merci beaucoup, ma collègue, pour cette excellente question. Je crois fondamentalement qu'on doit réviser une, la loi sur les brevets pour encourager les pharmaceutiques à revenir chez nous. Et je crois fondamentalement qu'on doit reconnaître l'expertise qui est au Québec et ailleurs au Canada en termes de pharmaceutique, qu'on doit reconnaître qu'on a le savoir et le pouvoir. Il manque le pouvoir politique qui doit s'investir chez nous, ici, pour les gens d'ici. Questions et commentaires? Questions and comments? L'honorable député de euh, Chambourg, haute saint charles Merci, M. le Président. Euh, J'aimerais demander à ma collègue, si elle a entendu parler récemment de ce qui est arrivé avec l'investissement qui a été fait au Centre de recherche, euh, national de recherche scientifique à Montréal au mois d'août dernier. L'ancien ministre de l'Industrie est allé faire une belle annonce, toute fière de dire qu'on pourrait produire 250 000 vaccins par mois au Canada. Euh, Est-ce qu'elle a eu une nouvelle de ça? L'honorable député de Beauport-Limoilou. Malheureusement, ça tombe dans le lot des 
Je ne le sais pas. On a eu une belle nouvelle cette semaine qui venait de Montréal concernant un anti-inflammatoire qui permettait de diminuer les effets de la COVID. Et c'est sorti dans les journaux. Mais sinon, par rapport à l'annonce du ministre... Point. Questions et commentaires? L'honorable député d'Abitibi Témiscamingue, une question de peu près 30 secondes, s'il vous plaît. Merci, M. le Président. En fait, euh, ma question, est, elle est très simple. Que pense la députée de la situation présente? En fait, elle en a mentionné une bonne partie sur le fait que les gens ne sont pas capables d'avoir un, un accès à un vaccin. C'est quoi la conséquence que ça peut avoir, exemple, sur la santé psychologique ou sur les autres éléments qui touchent la vie directement des gens? Merci. Le député de Beauport-Limoilou. Merci à mon collègue pour sa question qui démontre le cœur et la générosité qui sont les siennes. Actuellement, sans nouvelles, sans informations, c'est l'anxiété qui augmente. Les gens veulent retourner travailler, les gens veulent côtoyer leur famille, les gens veulent s'amuser, aller prendre une bière, jouer au billard, pouvoir aller dehors, discuter avec des gens sans crainte de se rendre malade ou de rendre leur famille malade. Savoir ce qui arrive avec le vaccin permettra tout ça. Merci. Reprise du débat. Resuming debate. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll be sharing my time, splitting my time with the member for Kings, uh, Vancouver Kingsway. Thank you very much, sir. I want to begin by talking about the impact of COVID-19 on, on Canada. We have, uh, to this point, seen over 19,000 Canadians lose their lives. Families are grieving their loved ones. We've seen losses in the front lines, frontline workers, frontline healthcare workers. We've seen loved ones lose their life. Our seniors have been the most impacted though. In long-term care centers, which have already been in crisis, they have been devastated by COVID-19. What is happening in long-term care right now is being described by over 200 doctors in Ontario as a humanitarian crisis. And to be clear, the crisis in long-term care existed before COVID-19. But COVID-19 has laid bare that crisis in a devastating way. To compile this crisis with even worse news, we have the news of delays of receiving vaccines. Vaccines which are a part of the solution to protect those who are most vulnerable, our seniors in long-term care. We see surging numbers around the country and we see variants which are even more likely to spread, are even more contagious. Every day that the vaccine is delayed, every day that the rollout is delayed, means more Canadians die. One of the physicians, Dr. Dosani, noted that there is one senior dying every hour in Canada. That is a staggering number. Given how serious this is, it is clear that the Liberal government's plan for procurement and rollout has been inadequate to meet with the severity of the crisis. The rollout has been too slow. It has not procured enough doses and people are hurting as a result. We know that there are additional measures that need to be taken in addition to procuring and delivering the vaccine. And I should make it very clear, it is not enough to just procure the vaccine. People are safer, seniors who are vulnerable are safer only if they are actually vaccinated. We need to get the vaccines into people's arms. But in addition to the problems around procuring and delivering the vaccine, which is one major form of one major part of the solution, we also have to identify some of the key problems. One of the biggest problems right now when we talk about COVID-19 and the pandemic and the reason why we need vaccines so badly is because of the crisis in long-term care, specifically the crisis in for-profit long-term care. A recent report indicates that for that in for-profit long-term care residences in Ontario, 
they have 78% more COVID-19 deaths than nonprofit. The evidence is overwhelmingly clear. For-profit long-term care means more, in, more infection and more deaths for, long, for residents. One of the points that we laid out at the beginning, months ago, is that Canada lacked a clear plan. The Liberal government lacked a clear plan and that the outcome of that would be we would, be not, we would not be meeting our goals. When we contrast that with other countries, we saw a very clear plan in Australia, in the United Kingdom, in America even, a clear plan for procurement and for delivery, and they are doing better than us. So this is where the Liberal government has certainly failed, is in having a plan that gets us to our goal. It's not enough to say a goal to vaccinate a certain number of people by a certain date, unless there's a plan, a roadmap to achieve that result. So what do we need right now? We need a clear plan with deadlines, timelines, with specific details in terms of vaccine procurement and delivery. We want the Liberal government to be clear and transparent with Canadians. When will we receive vaccines? Who will get vaccinated? And how quickly will that happen? We need details month by month. We need to know what the plan is for the next 100 days, and we specifically need to know what is a plan for, Canadian, for the most vulnerable Canadians. On parle aujourd'hui uh, concernant le, le vaccina la vaccination et les vaccins en général. Et c'est un débat d'urgence parce que la situation est urgente. À ce moment, plus de 19 000 personnes ont perdu la vie au Canada à cause de la COVID-19. Ce n'est pas seulement un chiffre, ce sont nos proches, ce sont euh, nos aînés, ce sont nos travailleurs de première ligne. Les familles pleurent la perte de leurs proches. Plus de 200 médecins et experts de la santé en Ontario ont décrit ce qui se passe dans le domaine des soins de longue durée comme une crise humanitaire. Les Canadiens et Canadiens sont extrêmement préoccupés par l'impact qu'aura le retard des expéditions du vaccin Pfizer-Biotechnic sur le calendrier de vaccination au Canada. Cette interruption va encore retarder la vaccination des populations les plus à risque au Canada, alors que les cas de la COVID-19 sont en augmentation et que les variantes très contagieuses de ce vaccin se répandent dans tous les pays. En effet, chaque jour de retard dans la mise en place du vaccin de la COVID-19 entraînera des infections et des décès évitables. Lorsque les libéraux ont annoncé que, la Canada, que le Canada allait enfin recevoir le vaccin, les Canadiennes et Canadiens se sont sentis soulagés que cette histoire d'horreur prenne fin. Malheureusement, le déploiement du vaccin par les libéraux n'est pas assez rapide et semble avoir pris beaucoup de retard par rapport à d'autres pays. Et pendant que les Canadiennes et Canadiens sont obligés d'attendre, des gens meurent. Les cas de soins de longue durée sont en augmentation. Les familles perdent leurs proches. Un rapport récent a, relevé, a révélé que les résidences de soins de longue durée à but lucratif en Ontario comptent 79 plus, pour cent plus des décès dus à la COVID-19 que les résidences à but non lucratif. Les gens font d'énormes sacrifices pour s'assurer, pour assurer la sécurité de leur communauté, car ils comprennent que chaque jour compte pendant cette pandémie. Alors, les autres pays ont mis en œuvre un plan clair et concret, et ce manque de plan au Canada a créé euh, cette crise et cette situation. 
Donc, on exige le gouvernement de livrer un plan clair avec tous les détails. Quand est-ce qu'on va recevoir le vaccin? Qui va être vacciné? C'est quoi tous les détails euh, pour la planification? Et quel est le plan du Canada pour les 100, euh, 100 prochains jours? C'est primordial. On sait qu'il y a des problèmes. Il faut agir dès maintenant. On peut sauver les vies, mais on a besoin d'un plan concret pour le faire. Merci beaucoup. Questions et commentaires? Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for... I'm drawing a blank tonight. Uh, Lady Smith. The Naimo Lady Smith. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You've never drawn a blank on me before. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his, his speech and, and really outlining the situation in long-term care homes. It's, it's abysmal what is happening in long-term care, care homes. And I've been talking about this issue before the pandemic with the foreign ownership uh, issue with um, on-bang insurance buying up uh, retirement concepts here in British Columbia. We need to make sure that our seniors are not warehoused in profit centers. And, and uh, you know, this is an issue that's become senicide, uh, you know, where, where our seniors are, are dying in, in, in horrible numbers. My question is, to the honourable member, do you think that we should be using the Emergencies Act to force the provinces to change the way that they're operating these long-term care facilities and, and uh, make sure that we're uh, preventing deaths in these facilities? Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for the question. I think there's a couple of things that we can do right away. I absolutely believe that we need to set some national standards. What are the best practices? What has worked in this pandemic and what has not worked? One of the things that is absolutely clear is that for-profit in long-term care does not work. It results in more infection and more deaths. One starting point that the federal government could do, in addition to establishing national standards and norms, is to start the process of removing profit from long-term care with Rivera, which is owned by a federal agency it is something that the federal government can immediately end the profit and move it to public and ensure that we're saving lives. And so we're calling on the federal government, we're calling on Justin Trudeau, or the prime minister, to ensure that the uh, Rivera, which is owned by a federal agency, is, is turned into a public service, no longer pri private, and that we save lives. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The honorable member for Calgary Nose Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, leader of the NDP for his, his speech tonight. Um, and I also want to just tell him that the member from Vancouver Kingsway has been a very hard worker on the health committee. So um, just a little plug there, Mr. Speaker. But I'm wondering if the member, uh, the leader of the NDP can um, just, just give some of his, just give some feedback on whether or not he thinks the government is doing an adequate job in procuring uh, vaccines for the provinces and what he thinks we could be doing better as parliament to light a fire under the federal government. Um, the provinces can't distribute what they don't have. And I was wondering if he could comment on some potential solutions that the federal liberals could undertake in order to overcome the fact that we've received zero doses of vaccines this week. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you to the member for the question. And that is really the, the heart of this debate that we are uh, up against a crisis where one of the solutions, the light at the end of the dark tunnel for a lot of Canadians was the vaccine. And the reality now that we are now at a point where there are not sufficient doses of vaccines, we have no vaccines coming in this week uh, at this point in time. That is the crisis that we're up against. And so we absolutely need to, to emphasize to the Liberal government that any delay in procuring vaccines and in vaccinating vulnerable people means that more people will die. Uh, what we've said from the beginning is that there was a lack of a clear plan. Other countries had a very detailed plan around procurement, very transparent with that plan. This Liberal government has been very reticent to provide details and transparency. We need that now. Canadians are urgently in need of answers to their questions. They want to know what the plan is. There needs to be a clear deadline, timeline laid out with clear steps to achieve the goal of ensuring everyone is 
everyone is vaccinated, and that's what's lacking here. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North, a question of 30 seconds, and we'll have an answer that's 30 seconds as well. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to, I guess, very quickly within 30 seconds, indicate, you know, that we've been very clear in terms of the plan. A part of that is to say that, look, we'll have uh, 6 million um, uh, vaccines by the end of March. And when you take a look at the Can Canadian population of just over 37 million, I think that's a fairly significant uh, commitment. And I'm wondering if my uh, Frank could just provide his thoughts in regards to us uh, ultimately being able to achieve that aspect of the plan, 6 million um, by the end of, uh, of March. Is that a good thing, bad thing? Does he think that the, could do better than that? Number four, Burnaby South. I thank the member for the question. The member raises exactly what the problem is. Having a goal that just describes the outcome at a certain point in time without a plan to achieve that outcome, that's exactly what we're missing. To say that we'll have six million doses by a certain date in March is not sufficient. We need to know what is a plan on a week by week basis. How many doses do we need to receive on a weekly basis to, to achieve that goal? What is a plan to get to that point? And then how is that going to be delivered to people, to provinces, and if ultimately what is a plan to ensure that there is vaccination happening? Without the details to get from here to there, that is not sufficient to just say there's a certain amount by a certain date. We need the plan and the roadmap to actually achieve that goal. Resuming debate, reprise du débat, the honorable member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think I could safely speak for all parliamentarians when I say that none of us could have possibly envisioned how profound this colossal economic and health shock has been to our country. And I don't think any of us ever anticipated that we would be having to deal with a global pandemic that has had such tectonic impacts upon our society, upon our families and our communities across this country. And I, I think it's also equally fair to say that the light at the end of the tunnel, as has been used by some of my colleagues tonight, is the hope that we can get... Uh, one moment, please. Uh, nous avons un appel au règlement, l'honorable député d'Abitibi-Témis... ...qui semble grincher énormément au niveau de la traduction. Les gens en ligne le vivent, puis on le vit aussi avec la traduction ici. Je ne sais pas s'il y aura une correctif qui pourrait être fait de ce côté-là, mais ça nous empêche de bien suivre le débat. Merci. C'est le problème, je m'excuse, c'est le problème, c'est ça griche euh, sur son microphone? Sur oh, de la traduction. OK, alors on va le... Je pense qu'ils ont entendu le message, j'espère. Euh, Peut-être... Euh, I'll say it in English, uh, so you can hear what's being said, translated. Euh, Peux-tu mettre ton oreille, voir si... Euh, c'est encore en train de glisser, hein? OK. Je vais le mettre en français. Moi, je l'ai... Euh... une minute. OK. We'll say it in English. Il n'y a rien qui se, qui se traduit. OK. Test. OK. Non, ça ne se griche plus. Est-ce que ça griche dans votre... Ça fonctionne bien? OK. Nous allons continuer. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway, thank you for... Uh putting up with the technological glitches that we uh, sometimes have to face. Please proceed. Mr. Speaker, may I start from the beginning? It was only 45 seconds. Sure, go ahead and we'll reset it at 10 minutes. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, where I began was to say that I, I think I speak for all parliamentarians when I say how surprised perhaps we are at having to deal with this completely unique situation that has faced not only our country but 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 our globe and i think that uh, none of us envisioned that we would be dealing in 2021 with such a colossal dislocation in our communities in our economy in our families in our healthcare systems as we've been confronted with and i think equally i speak for all parliamentarians when we say that the hope that we all have to restore us to some sense of normal, hopefully a better normal, is that we all get access to a quickly administered and broadly effective vaccine or treatment. So the proximate cause of this very important debate tonight is Canadians 
concern about the impact that delayed shipments of the Pfizer vaccine will have on our country's vaccination schedule. And of course, this was generated by news last week from Major General Danny Fortin, our military commander overseeing vaccine logistics for the federal government, who confirmed that Canada will receive only one third of expected deliveries between January 18 and February 7. Now this was the third time in two weeks that the federal government's delivery schedule was revised downward. Canada won't receive any COVID-19 vaccine doses this week at all, and will only receive 79,000 doses in the first week of February. That's one fifth of what was once expected. Major General Fortin has yet to confirm how many doses will arrive during the second week of February. Now, despite previous assurances from the Liberal government that countries will be impacted equally by supply reductions, in fact, the European Union will have a much shorter interruption in deliveries in Canada. But even before this delay, Canada's vaccine rollout had fallen far behind that of our closest allies and trading partners. For example, last week, the United States administered an average of 1.16 million vaccine doses per day. But as of today, Canada has only administered a total of 863,000 doses overall. Now we hear that the Biden administration is aiming to provide vaccines to 1.5 million Americans per day. The government of Canada, by contrast, hasn't even established a daily target. Now, the current government claims that the current supply interruption is a temporary and isolated incident due to a factory expansion at Pfizer's Belgium plant but unfortunately, other factors could further disrupt Canada's delivery schedule. In fact, just today, the European Commission announced a new plan to require companies to register any exports of COVID-19 vaccines out of the European Union. The EU is also poised to impose export controls to preserve supply on that continent. That proposal would require drug companies to seek approval before shipping vaccines to countries outside the trading bloc. Now, given that Canada is entirely dependent on importing COVID-19 vaccines, we could very well find ourselves squeezed by this growing vaccine nationalism. So that's the specific context for the debate, but there's a broader context, Mr. Speaker. The broader context is this. The prime minister's talking points really amount to this. We have secured the biggest portfolio of vaccines in the world, and don't worry. Now, the truth is this. Canadians aren't interested in how many vaccines we could get. They are interested in how many vaccines we will get. Moreover, the federal government response on the entire COVID file, in my view, has been slow, weak, and inconsistent. It has been marked by a shocking lack of transparency, and that is now borne out in performance. Canada is now 16th in the world in terms of vaccinations per capita, and we still have no clear plan for vaccinations in this country. Now, that is why New Democrats are calling on the federal government to do a number of things to rectify the situation and fulfill the dreams and the hopes that Canadians have for returning their economy and health to a more normal state of affairs. First, we're calling on the federal government to establish a public drug manufacturer so that Canada is never again dependent on foreign drug companies for vaccines and critical medications during a pandemic. It's a well-known fact by now that this government failed to negotiate with a single one of the seven drug manufacturers the right to manufacture a COVID vaccine in Canada. Many other countries did so, including Australia, India, China, Malaysia, Japan, etc. And yet we still can't ha receive a single explanation from this government why they fail to do so in this country. And today we are seeing the results of that as we wait, receiving no doses of vaccine while we see vaccines produced in other countries by other companies. In the immediate term, the federal government has an obligation to outline a detailed plan in case Canada's vaccine supply is further curtailed. Now this morning, the prime minister claimed that he is very confident that Canada is going to receive all promised doses by the end of March, 2021. And he claimed that our vaccine supply is in quote, good shape. 
However, he provided no explanation for this confidence, and confidence is not a plan. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister's glib response typifies the federal government's opaque, confusing, and often contradictory approach to communicating Canada's vaccine plan. As I said, for months, the federal government has been totally secretive about the terms of the deals it signed with drug manufacturers. It has failed to release a single word in a single contract of the seven contracts they've signed on behalf of Canadians. Now, this is not only unfair to the taxpayers who are paying for these doses, but transparency is essential for maintaining the public's trust and confidence in Canada's vaccine strategy. Taxpayers also have a right to know how their money is being spent. And the provinces and territories need clarity from the federal government in order to adjust their vaccination programs in response to supply shortages. New Democrats are also calling on the federal government to do the following. Reveal how many vaccine doses have actually been secured for each month until September 2021. Confirm if Canada is actually guaranteed delivery of 4 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine by the end of March, and what recourse is available to us if this deadline is missed. Provide full transparency on the terms and conditions of all vaccine supply agreements between the Government of Canada and drug manufacturers. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister insists that Canadians don't need to worry about the current vaccine shortage because the government's goal of securing enough COVID-19 vaccine doses to immunize all Canadians by September remains feasible. But this talking point obscures the grim reality that Canada's current supply disruption will have severe consequences for our most vulnerable citizens. Indeed, Canada's vaccine shortages will further delay inoculation for a country's highest risk populations, seniors, long-term care residents, Indigenous communities, teachers, first responders and frontline healthcare workers at a time when COVID-19 cases are surging and highly contagious COVID-19 variants have reached our communities. Every day that COVID-19 vaccine rollout is delayed will result in avoidable infections and deaths across Canada. That is not positive news. The Public Health Agency of Canada's latest modeling projects that Canada is on track to hit 10,000 new daily cases by February. We remain on a rapid growth trajectory with widespread community transmission and increased outbreaks in long-term care facilities. Now, public health experts are also issuing dire warnings that dangerous COVID-19 mutations could undermine Canada's COVID-19 efforts. Yesterday, epidemiologists from Simon Fraser University warned that a massive spike of COVID-19 cases could be coming to Canada if the UK, UK variant becomes a further established here. The researchers looked at the exponential growth of COVID-19 cases linked to new variants of concern and concluded that failure to prevent or contain these strains now will spell disaster for Canada as early as March. Now, the authors don't expect to see much impact for about six weeks. However, if and when the spike comes, they expect it will come steeply with a doubling time of one to two weeks. This represents a sharp increase from the doubling times of 30 to 40 days recently recorded in provinces like Ontario. The UK variant is believed to have a substantial transmission advantage of 40 to 80% increase in the reproduction number. A transmission rate increases, uh, an increase of this magnitude is worse than a higher severity or mortality rate because so many more people can get infected. In most of Canada, we have been able to control previous variants of COVID-19 with strong physical distancing measures. However, we're being warned that a variant with a 40% or more increase in transmission rate would likely not be contained with the measures we have in place today. Therefore, instead of relying on the Prime Minister's ambiguous assurances and unfounded confidence, we must be willing to act decisively to curtail the spread of COVID-19 in Canada now. The federal government must take immediate steps to prevent the introduction of new variants into Canada through stricter border controls, a ban on non-essential international travel, mandatory hotel quarantine like Australia and New Zealand have introduced and improved detection. The federal government must also take immediate steps to prevent the spread of COVID-19 within Canada through additional essential public health measures such as paid sick days, 
national standards for long-term care, frequent rapid... We'll now go to questions and comments. Questions et commentaires. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And um, in listening to the, my colleague's comments, one of the things that stood out is, I believe he said something to the effect of that the United States uh, president is now saying, I think he said 1.1 million a day. And he, he seemed to kind of like really emphasize as if that's a real good thing. Um, and if you take a look at that number, and please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, um, that would then imply that sometime by the end of the year, uh, all Americans uh, south of the border will have been afforded the opportunity to be vaccinated. Mr. We have Mr. made a commitment to Canadians through the process that we have. Oh, nous avons, we have a, a an order. Uh, an appel au règlement, l'honorable député de Shefford. I'm just going to interrupt the honourable member for Winnipeg North. Oui. Continue. Ah, OK. La traduction, on a des problèmes de traduction ce soir. Uh, Peut-être, uh, can we uh, see if the translation is working? Ça fonctionne? OK. C'est bon. L'honorable député de Shefford, vous entendez bien? You can hear me well in French. C'est tout est arrangé. Parfait. J'entends bien, Monsieur le Président. Okay, merci beaucoup. Okay, I'll let the Honourable Member from Winnipeg North continue then. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and the essence of the point is this. The member makes reference to the United States 1.1 million a day and, and kind of hit home that particular uh, point. That means that they would have their population done sometime towards the end of the year. We have made through our plan a commitment that every Canadian will have a safe, free vaccine uh, made available to him and her. Uh, by before the end of September. We've made the commitment that there will be 6 million uh, vaccines uh, by the end of March. And I wonder if he would not agree that, you know, the way in which we present things can be somewhat deceiving. And the reality is, is that there are tangible numbers that are being shared with Canadians and the provinces by this government. Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Well, well, just to correct my honorable colleague on numbers, you know, the United States is vaccinating 1.1 uh, million Americans a, a day last week, and they announced today that they're going to move that to 1.5 million Americans each day. Now, if you compare that to Canada, uh, that means the Biden's administration commitment that they will um, do 100 million Americans in the first 100 days is about a third of the Americans in three months. You compare that to Canada, where we're talking about 6 million doses in three months, that's about 3 million Canadians, that's 8% of the Canadian population. So you can see that the Americans are, are will have a third of their population done within about the first three or four months and will be less than 10%. The other thing about this, of course, is that the Biden administration is announcing a plan, uh, not just a future goal with a commitment to, uh, to vaccinate everybody, but an actual plan with numbers per day. I challenge you, my colleague, tell us, tell Canadians, how many Canadians are going to be vaccinated every day between now and the end of this year in this country? Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Calgary Knows Hill. for Vancouver Kingsway. Well, thank you to my honourable colleague for that, that question. You know, this is another question that is repeatedly asked of this government for which they refuse utterly to answer. And that is, 
why they refuse to release a single line in any of the seven contracts they've negotiated on behalf of Canadians, and they won't tell us why. Now, we all understand that there may be commercially sensitive information. There may be some technology secrets in the documents. There may be some confidential uh, aspects that may interfere with the government's ability to negotiate. But surely there is information in those contracts that Canadians have a right to know that don't fall in those categories. Yet this government won't release a word. Now, what does that tell Canadians? Um, how can that inspire confidence that this government really is backing up their rhetoric with reality? You know, if you go to a lawyer and the lawyer says, don't worry, I have everything taken care of. And you say, well, let me see the paperwork. And they tell you, well, you can't see it. That is not going to inspire confidence that, that paperwork backs up the words that are being spoken. And I think it's time that this government trusted Canadians with the basic information in those contracts and assisting the provinces and territories with planning their vaccination because it is provinces and territories who are responsible for rolling out the vaccination plans. They can't do so if we don't know the basic details from this government that they're so carefully and so inexplicably hiding. Resuming debate, reprise du débat, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, et bonsoir à tous. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, share my time with uh, my honourable friend uh, and colleague from the National Capital Region, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to, at least metaphorically, rise in this house and uh, speak about va vaccine delivery. Canadians have been struggling through this pandemic for, of course, almost a year now. And from the very beginning, we have had their health and their safety at the forefront. C'est tout aussi vrai dans ma circonscription de Gatineau, où les gens prennent autant leur mal en patience que les gens de l'île de Vancouver ou de Terre-Neuve et de Labrador, uh, et uh, pour qui cette pandémie a été une épreuve. Et ce sentiment nous anime à tous les jours et nous motive à justement faire en sorte que nous pouvons faire les approvisionnements et fournir les vaccins, les matériaux, l'équipement requis pour l'ensemble des Canadiens pour justement passer à travers de cette pandémie et ce, plus rapidement. Tout au long de la pandémie, depuis le tout début, le, ministre, euh, le ministère des Services publics et de l'approvisionnement et l'équipe du ministère se sont concentrés sur une chose, assurer la protection de tous les Canadiens. Permettez-moi de faire le point sur notre situation actuelle et de rassurer les Canadiens en leur disant que nous sommes toujours sur la bonne voie pour fournir des vaccins à tous les Canadiens qui souhaitent en recevoir un. Monsieur le Président, depuis le début de la pandémie, nous avons commencé à acheter des centaines de milliers de respirateurs N95, des blouses, des masques chirurgicaux et toute autre EPI dont nos travailleurs de première ligne ont besoin pour assurer la sécurité des Canadiennes et des Canadiens. C'est également la raison pour laquelle nous avons entamé très tôt des négociations avec les manufacturiers des candidats vaccins. In fact, Canada was one of the first countries to sign agreements with Pfizer and Moderna, of course, the only two currently approved vaccines in Canada. And this we did back in early August. We knew that having a diverse portfolio of vaccines with strong delivery schedules and options to increase our orders would ensure that we would have enough vaccines for every Canadian who wants one as early as possible. Monsieur le Président, je peux vous assurer que nous sommes sur la bonne voie pour vacciner tous les Canadiens qui le souhaitent d'ici la fin du mois de septembre 2021. Par le biais de nos solides négociations avec ces entreprises, nous nous sommes assurés de faire face à toute éventualité, en cas de retard dans la livraison des vaccins et dans la chaîne d'approvisionnement mondiale. Nous nous sommes préparés à cette situation et nous sommes convaincus que nous serons encore en mesure d'atteindre notre objectif de fin septembre. We understand that Canadians are urgently awaiting vaccines. They certainly are in my riding, and I know that all members share uh, that their constituents, uh, whether it be those in long-term care homes, frontline workers, grocery workers, drivers, everyone is anxious and wants access to a vaccine quickly. And that, of course, motivates and animates us every day. And let me reassure all of those, 
and through their members of parliament, let me reassure them that we are still on track. Allow me to provide an explanation of the delays that we are seeing with the Pfizer vaccine this week. Pfizer is retooling their distribution at the moment. And while this is temporary, it means that the vaccines were met, we, that we were meant to receive this week will be coming a little later. But let me be clear, we are not losing any doses, not a single one as part of this retooling. We are still in position to have at least 3 million people vaccinated by the end of March. Monsieur le Président, permettez-moi de vous rappeler que nous avons été l'un des premiers pays à approuver un vaccin et à commencer sa distribution dans l'ensemble du pays. À ce jour, nous avons déjà distribué 1,1 million de vaccins, de vaccins, ce qui nous place parmi les cinq premiers pays du G20 pour la vaccination contre la COVID-19. Monsieur le Président, comme nous l'avons toujours signé, souligné, les livraisons de vaccins par Pfizer et Moderna se poursuivront au cours des prochaines semaines et nous aurons 3 millions de personnes vaccinées dans tout le pays d'ici fin, la fin mars. Et d'ici la fin juin, 13 millions de personnes seront vaccinées. Et d'ici la fin septembre, 36 millions de Canadiens pourront être vac vaccinés avec seules les commandes de ces deux manufacturiers. Mr. Speaker, that is with Pfizer and Moderna alone. Because of our strong agreements with these candidates, we have ensured that we will be able to uh, vaccinate all Canadians who wish to receive a vaccination with just these two vaccines. We have agreements with, of course, five other candidates, two of which are currently enrolling reviews with Health Canada. And with these contracts, we will far exceed the number of doses we need to vaccinate all Canadians. With the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada, we have also ensured that the logistics of distribution to provinces are strong and secure. To ensure that vaccines would be delivered effectively, we entered into contracts with FedEx and Inomar Strategies to provide vaccine logistics. Nous nous sommes également assurés que nous disposions d'assez de congélateurs pour maintenir les vaccins stables afin qu'ils soient prêts à être utilisés. Et de plus, nous avons acheté des seringues, des aiguilles, de la gaz, des pansements, des récipients pour objets tranchants et d'autres équipements nécessaires à l'administration des vaccins. Et nous les fournissons gratuitement à toutes les provinces et territoires. Nous avons tenu les Canadiens informés tout au long du processus afin qu'ils puissent être sûrs que chaque décision est réfléchie et que nous faisons les meilleurs choix pour les soutenir. Telle est notre approche depuis le tout début. We started strong by procuring the PPE and medical equipment frontline workers needed. When the global market was incredibly volatile and demand was high, we were still able to begin acquiring and delivering much needed PPE in a matter of weeks. We took the same approach with vaccines and we are seeing the benefits of the strong agreements we made unfold now. Mr. Speaker, despite our assurances in this house and to the public, sadly the opposition is once again trying to say that this government has somehow missed the mark. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now I understand that opposition members have the right, the privilege, and sometimes the need to raise issues. But uh, Mr. Speaker, one thing that I think we can all agree on is the Canadians require the clarity needed uh, and the assurance that their government is there for them and will provide the vaccinations that we need to get through this pandemic. Monsieur le Président, la rhétorique utilisée par l'opposition l'automne dernier n'était que des paroles en l'air. Quelques jours plus tard seulement, nous avons annoncé que les premiers vaccins avaient été approuvés et que la distribution allait commencer. The Conservative Party tried to instill fear and panic in Canadians by inferring that vaccines wouldn't be received until 2030. We know how ridiculous that claim was. And how can Canadians be expected to entrust them with their confidence now? It is irresponsible to continue to sow doubt and fear, despite clear evidence that we are on track to receive enough vaccines this quarter, the next quarter, and throughout this year. Alors qu'ils continuent dans la partisanerie et d'essayer de gagner du terrain par des tactiques de peur, nous, nous, nous continuerons à travailler fort pour les Canadiens et de prouver que nous avons leurs meilleurs intérêts à cœur. En réponse à leurs affirmations selon lesquelles nous sommes désormais loin derrière d'autres pays en termes de fourniture de vaccins, permettez-moi de dire que nous sommes toujours bien positionnés 
parmi les pays du G20. En fait, le Canada a commencé à recevoir des vaccins en décembre, bien avant bon nombre de pays, des pays comme le Japon, la Nouvelle-Zélande, l'Australie et, et la Corée du Sud n'ont même pas encore commencé à vacciner. In response to the claim that we should have seen production delays coming and done something about it, I would like to clarify that we did anticipate that there would be delays in delivery schedules. This is a high tension, high pressure race to vaccinate citizens across the world in every country. We anticipated the pressures of this system, and that is why we planned carefully, uh, had a diversified strategy of procurement for vaccinations, and ensured that any delays would be minor. And that is why we are still on track for deliveries in this quarter. Mr. Speaker, as usual, the opposition's rhetoric holds no water. Once again, they are making bold, unsubstantiated claims. And once again, we are proving that this government is there to deliver for Canadians. Comme nous l'avons prouvé à maintes reprises, notre gouvernement place les intérêts des Canadiens au premier plan de chaque décision qu'il prend. Nous savons que la distribution de vaccins serait un élément décisif et compliqué de notre réponse à la COVID-19. Nous voulions nous assurer que nous serions prêts à faire face à toute éventualité et que les Canadiens seraient en mesure de recevoir un vaccin dès que possible. Monsieur le Président, c'est exactement ce que nous avons fait. La ministre des Services publics et de l'approvisionnement et notre équipe ont négocié des contrats solides avec sept candidats vaccins, un nombre de contrats sans précédent, pour s'assurer que nous aurions suffisamment de vaccins pour chaque Canadien qui le désire. We've created a strong logistics plan so that as soon as can vac vaccines are delivered to Canada, they can be distributed to each province and territory as quickly as possible. And at every turn, we've done our best to protect Canadians, and that certainly won't stop now. Nous continuerons de garder le cap et de travailler fort jusqu'à ce que chaque Canadien qui souhaite un vaccin y ait accès, alors que L'opposition et les conservateurs continuent d'œuvrer dans la partisanerie. Nous nous concentrerons sur les Canadiens et ferons tout notre possible pour qu'ils soient en sécurité et en bonne santé. Merci, M. le Président. Questions et commentaires? Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Banff, Airdrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I listened to this Liberal Member, and he kept talking about the government being on track. They were on track with vaccines. Well, I wonder what he says to someone who has a parent in a senior's care home that they cannot see. I wonder what he says to someone who has had a grandchild born in the last little while and has never been able to meet that grandchild. I wonder what he says to someone who is hoping to have their wedding and begin their lives together and has had to put it on hold and wait and people who've lost a loved one and can't hold a memorial service. I wonder what he says to all those people. I wonder what he says to people that you know are struggling with their mental health because of the lockdowns that they're facing. What does he say to those people? Does that sound like on track to him? Because it certainly doesn't sound like on track to me, and I know it certainly doesn't sound like being on track to a whole lot of Canadians who are waiting for a vaccine, and this government is falling behind. So what does he say to those people when he says they're on track? The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. What I say to uh, all of those people, uh, of course, all of whom uh, fit profiles of people in my riding, I presume in the honorable members' ridings and in every riding in the country, is that their stories motivate us, they animate us, they get us out of bed in the morning, and they make sure, make damn sure that we do everything that we can to deliver every single possible dose of vaccine to Canadians in the shortest possible time. That's what we're doing every day. That's why we have signed such an aggressive number and a diverse number of contract uh, contracts with vaccine manufacturers. We've gotten we've been very fortunate that two of the seven that we've signed are already approved and deployed. This is a miracle of science. And two that are enrolling reviews we've also achieved agreements with. These are uh, proving to have been very wise decisions. So I say to the young couple looking to get married or the mother looking to go visit her grandmother uh, in a long-term care home that your country is st uh, steadfast and four square behind you and looking to get vaccines into your arm and your mother's arm and your grandmother's arm at the earliest possible moment. 
Questions et commentaires, questions and comments. L'honorable député d'Avignon, la Métis, Matane Matapédia. Merci, M. le Président. Je remercie le secrétaire parlementaire pour son discours. Et je veux revenir sur un, un événement qui est arrivé un peu plus tôt aujourd'hui. Le premier ministre a convoqué la presse pour euh, annoncer rien de nouveau au final, rien de nouveau sur euh, les restrictions aux voyageurs, rien sur l'approvisionnement en vaccins. Il voulait rassurer la population à ce sujet-là, mais il nous a plutôt inquiété davantage. Euh, notre dépendance aux productions extérieures pour ce qui est des doses de vaccins devient inquiétante quand d'autres nations menacent de, de mettre en place des restrictions à l'exportation et comme ça pourrait être le cas pour le, le vaccin AstraZeneca et à une question posée par un journaliste euh, à qu'est-ce qui se passerait si ça pouvait arriver pour un, un vaccin qui est approuvé par Santé Canada, eh bien, le premier ministre a répondu que ce serait extrêmement préoccupant, sans plus. Est-ce que euh, le secrétaire parlementaire a une réponse un peu plus euh, rassurante pour nous? Le secrétaire parlementaire. Je peux rassurer euh, l'honorable collègue que le premier ministre, ses ministres, la diplomatie canadienne et l'ensemble du gouvernement travaillent avec nos homologues en Europe. Euh, ce sont des pays qui sont parmi nos plus proches alliés. Nous avons travaillé avec les pays de l'Europe et les pays du monde entier, d'ailleurs, pour garder ouvertes les lignes d'approvisionnement euh, et les chaînes d'approvisionnement pour l'équipement de protection individuelle. Nous le ferons euh, bien évidemment dans le cas des vaccins et nous tenons à rassurer à cette Chambre que les contrats signés pour les vaccins à être livrés dans le premier trimestre de l'année en cours euh, sont intacts et nous attendons ces livraisons d'ici la fin mars. Reprise du débat. Resuming debate, the Honorable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Euh, je tiens euh, par commencer à reconnaître la tension à laquelle les Canadiens sont confrontés dans cette deuxième vague de la pandémie. Nous sommes tous fatigués, anxieux et frustrés par la résurgence du virus, l'incertitude permanente et les perturbations constantes de notre vie quotidienne. La durée de la pandémie est longue et difficile et continue de faire des ravages dans tous les aspects de notre vie, y compris notre bien-être économique ainsi que notre santé mentale et physique. Nous savons que la seule chose qui nous permettra de reprendre une vie normale est un vaccin contre la COVID-19. Et nous les attendons tous avec impatience. Il n'arrivera jamais assez tôt et la pandémie continue de nous accabler chaque jour. Mais je demande aujourd'hui, maintenant, plus que jamais, que nous nous élevions au-dessus des différences politiques et des lignes de parti et que nous nous réunissons pour aider le pays à traverser le stade le plus difficile de la crise. La réponse du Canada à la pandémie de la COVID-19 nécessite la mobilisation de tous afin de s'assurer que nous passerons à travers cette épreuve et que nous remontons la pente. Nous ne pouvons pas nous permettre de nous laisser prendre par la stratégie du bord de l'abîme. Nous sommes à un point critique de la pandémie. Nous devons unir nos forces pour franchir cette dernière ligne droite. Pour que le Canada puisse franchir la ligne d'arrivée, nous devrons tous, au sein de cette Chambre, travailler ensemble dans le cadre d'une approche collaborative totale. Cette approche est au cœur de notre stratégie depuis le début et elle est plus que nécessaire maintenant. Notre gouvernement a tenu ses engagements envers les Canadiens. Qu'il s'agisse de travailler jour et nuit dans un marché mondial hyper compétitif pour obtenir les équipements de protection individuelle essentiels, d'acquérir l'un des portefeuilles de vaccins les plus diversifiés au monde ou d'agir rapidement pour fournir des doses des deux vaccins actuellement approuvés aux provinces et aux territoires. Monsieur le Président, ce n'est qu'en travaillant ensemble que nous parviendrons à surmonter cette situation. Il est temps de baisser la température et de se concentrer sur ce dont les Canadiens ont besoin de notre part. Alors que nous lançons la plus grande campagne de vaccination de l'histoire du Canada, nous savions qu'il y aurait probablement quelques obstacles sur la route. Lorsqu'on entreprend ce genre d'initiative dans le cadre d'une urgence mondiale, il faut s'y attendre. Et nous l'avons constaté lors du récent ralentissement de nos livraisons du vaccin Pfizer, qui, je le rappelle, est ressenti par tous les pays approvisionnés par l'usine européenne. 
Nous savons que nous aurions probablement à relever des défis au niveau de l'offre, étant donné la complexité de la fabrication, une demande mondiale sans précédent et une accélération rapide de la production. C'est précisément avec ce type de questions à l'esprit que le Canada a mis en place cet accord avec les principaux fabricants et développeurs de vaccins afin de garantir la diversité et la flexibilité de nos chaînes d'approvisionnement. Pour être clair, je comprends et partage les préoccupations des Canadiens concernant ce retard de livraison temporaire. Soyez rassurés, la ministre, le premier ministre, le secrétaire parlementaire des services de public et approvisionnement Canada est en contact permanent avec les représentants de Pfizer pour réitérer fermement l'importance pour le Canada de revenir à son calendrier de livraison habituel le plus rapidement possible. Mais comme nous l'avons dit à plusieurs reprises, Pfizer nous assure qu'en fin de compte, nous recevrons chaque dose promise et que nous avons acheté. Bien sûr, c'est regrettable. Ce n'est pas une bonne nouvelle considérant l'urgence de notre situation, mais c'est la réalité de la situation volatile et de l'environnement dans lequel nous opérons. Je tiens à vous rassurer que Pfizer s'est engagé à atteindre notre objectif pour le premier trimestre et que les livraisons augmenteront considérablement comme promis au printemps. Entre Moderna et Pfizer, nous avons accès à 80 millions de doses en 2021 et nous aurons suffisamment de vaccins pour tous ceux qui, au Canada, sont éligibles et souhaiteraient être vaccinés d'ici la fin de mois de septembre. Monsieur le Président, nous voulons tout que cette campagne de vaccination se déroule sans encombre et à la vitesse de l'éclair. Malheureusement, nous devons simplement anticiper que ce genre de problème et d'autres peuvent survenir et, comme toujours, nous devons nous adapter. Dans notre stratégie d'approvisionnement, notre gouvernement s'est assuré l'accès à un portefeuille diversifié en signant sept accords pour les principaux candidats de vaccins. Les sept accords prévoient l'accès à pas moins de 234 millions de doses de vaccins COVID-19 potentiels ainsi que la possibilité d'acheter jusqu'à 164 millions de doses supplémentaires. Depuis le début, nous avons adopté une approche diversifiée pour l'achat de vaccins. Nous n'avons pas mis nos œufs dans le même panier. Nous sommes assurés de diversifier notre risque en s'assurant que notre portefeuille de vaccins provient de multiples sources d'approvisionnement qui garantira aux Canadiens un accès à des vaccins COVID-19 sûrs et efficaces dès qu'ils seront disponibles. Bien sûr, nous ne pouvons pas convaincre ce virus au Canada si nous ne nous l'éminons pas partout. C'est pourquoi nous participerons au mécanisme mondial d'approvisionnement COVAX, qui contribuera à la mise au point et au déploiement de vaccins COVID-19 sûrs, efficaces et accessibles dans le monde entier. Soutenir d'autres pays dans leur lutte contre la COVID-19 est un investissement essentiel qui contribuera à mettre fin à cette pandémie dans le monde entier. Ne vous méprenez pas, nous luttons de front cette, contre cette pandémie et la priorité absolue de ce gouvernement reste de protéger les Canadiens contre la COVID-19, de sauver des vies et de les soutenir en temps de crise. Notre gouvernement continue à faire tout en son pouvoir pour relever les défis de cette pandémie, mais pour être davantage efficace, nous devons faire front commun. En tant que membre élu de cette Chambre, nous avons le devoir de nous élever au-dessus de nos intérêts politiques et de, ne, et de nous concentrer sur la protection des Canadiens. C'est un moment charnière de notre histoire qui exige une action rapide et unifiée. Nous devons nous unir pour servir les Canadiens à travailler chaque jour dans cette Chambre pour faire face à la pandémie de manière responsable et efficace pendant cette dernière ligne droite. Les Canadiens n'en attendent pas moins. Monsieur le Président, alors que nous continuons à avoir une augmentation des infections, notre gouvernement reste concentré sur notre réponse, reconstruire l'économie et se préparer à faire face à n'importe quel scénario en ces temps instables. Toutefois, nous savons que la véritable solution, l'administration à grande échelle d'un vaccin approuvé, prendra du temps et qu'il y aura des défis à relever en cours de route. En attendant, les Canadiens doivent continuer à gérer les risques de la COVID-19, suivre les conseils de santé publique et redoubler l'effort pour ralentir la propagation du virus. C'est un travail difficile qui nous met à l'épreuve d'une manière que nous n'aurions pas pu s'imaginer, 
mais ensemble, nous allons nous en sortir et nous en sortirons plus fort. Monsieur le Président, permettez-moi de réitérer combien il est essentiel que nous nous engageons à travailler ensemble pour la santé et la sécurité de chaque Canadien. Pour surmonter cette pandémie, une fois pour toutes, nous devons tous travailler ensemble, tous les paliers de gouvernement, tous les communautés, tous les Canadiens. Finalement, je tiens à remercier le docteur hygiéniste du Bureau de santé de l'Est de l'Ontario, le docteur Paul Roumiotis et son équipe qui ont déjà entamé la campagne de vaccination chez nous dans Glengarry Prescott Russell. Votre équipe est formidable. Merci beaucoup, M. le Président. Questions et commentaires. Questions and comments. L'honorable député de rivière des mille îles Merci, Madame la Présidente. D'abord, je, je souhaiterais dire à mon collègue qu'il n'y a, a pas une entreprise sérieuse, il n'y a pas une institution qui pourrait avancer, progresser, progresser sans, sans avoir un plan de match clair, établi sur papier. Et c'est ça qui nous manque, c'est ça qui nous manque beaucoup. C'est le devoir d'une entreprise qui veut survivre et surtout en période de pandémie, de planifier, euh, de prévoir l'imprévisible, d'établir un plan de match. C'est ça qu'on ne voit pas, c'est ça qu'on n'entend pas de la part de ce gouvernement-là. Voir <coughs> évoluer ses prévisions pour les prochains mois, ce ne sont que des propos qui sont lancés, ce ne sont que des prévisions absolument pas... Euh, accepté malheureusement de la part des électeurs. Il n'y a pas un conseil d'administration qui accepterait que son directeur général agisse ainsi ou agisse comme notre premier ministre le fait actuellement. Ma question pour mon collègue va être très simple. Comme son prédécesseur tantôt l'a si bien mentionné, il y a des pays qui n'ont pas commencé encore à vacciner. Et euh, j'aimerais simplement savoir pourquoi, selon lui, la Nouvelle-Zélande n'a pas commencé à vacciner. Le député de Glengarry Prescott Russell. Monsieur le Président, je suis content que mon collègue discute de la Nouvelle-Zélande, mais moi, je vais m'occuper de, de me concentrer sur le programme de vaccination du Canada et je vais peut-être le corriger sur le fait qu'il dit qu'on n'a pas de plan. Je peux vous le, 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 le rassurer que le Canada a une garantie de 6 millions de doses de vaccins qui vont arriver avant le 31 mars. Je peux aussi lui dire qu'avant le mois de juin, on va recevoir un autre 26 millions de doses au Canada. Alors, si ça, ce n'est pas un plan concret, et je peux aussi lui mentionner qu'on a déjà reçu 1,1 million de doses au Canada. Alors, pour ma part, je pense qu'on a des prévisions qui sont, qui sont prédibles. C'est certain que oui, aujourd'hui et cette semaine, on a un manque de vaccins, mais encore là, entendre certains discours de mes collègues, c'est comme on dirait à la population, parce qu'on n'a pas eu la chance d'avoir ces vaccins-là cette semaine, que tout simplement, on pourrait déconfiner la population en entier la semaine prochaine. Je pense qu'il faut faire attention à la façon qu'on propose et qu'on présente euh, l'argument politique au sein de nos populations. Questions and comments. The Honorable Member for Vancouver East. The Honorable Member for Vancouver East. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for his comments. The reality, of course, is that for provinces who are struggling to get the vaccinations out uh, is because they don't actually have the vaccines. We're in a situation where frontline workers uh, and first responders, such as firefighters, teachers, um, people, even people who work in our grocery stores, people who work in our farms, who are putting food on our table, they're not able to access the vaccines because they don't have them. So I hope that the uh, member and the government will take this to heart. My other question uh, to the member is this. On the issue about uh, vaccinations for everyone, does the Liberal government include those who are migrant workers and those who are documented and undocumented as well? And will they take their approach to ensure that truly anyone who wants a vaccination would be able to get one free of charge, uh, that it would be accessible and they would not require, for example, a health care card and that they would not have to fear authorities. Honorable député de Glengarry Prescott Russell. I want to thank the uh, the, the member for her question and, and uh I think it's important that we put things into perspective. And I was reading this morning when Europe uh, anticipates to vaccinate 70% of their population, and they intend to do that by 
summer at some point. So it could be up to September 21st. I was also looking at what Australia, when they plan to vaccinate their entire population and their plans right now brings them to October, November, if things all go well. And in Canada's case, we plan on vaccinating every Canadian, those who choose to have the vaccine by September, end of September, for those who want to vaccinate. And I think the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health, including the Minister of Procurement Services, have been clear. Vaccinations will be free for every Canadian who choose to want one. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to my colleague from Gungary, Prescott Russell. It seems like forever, but I used to refer to the Honourable Member as my neighbour. We sat so near each other in Parliament when such a thing was allowed. But I want to, uh, tonight's debate is terribly important, and I want to get a few points on the record because I won't have a speaking occasion. I certainly agree with the Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway that contracts should be transparent, that Canadians have a right to know uh, what terms we're getting vaccines. I'm not as critical as some others in opposition about how things are going in getting vaccines that weren't even invented until months ago. Who could have anticipated that we needed to buy refrigerators at uh, mega levels of freezing? But I, I am concerned, and I don't know if the Honourable Member can answer this question. If he can't, perhaps he could ask uh, a member of, of the Cabinet for help. But we were attempting to get, as a country, not just vaccines, but also other treatments, antibody treatments. We saw the Department of Innovation and Science invest about $200 million in one such company located in Vancouver, Abcelera, partnered with Eli Lilly. Their treatment apparently was looking very promising. Uh, tens of thousands of doses came to Canada, but used. they are uh, potentially effective. Uh, so in terms of the suite of, of treatments, of vaccines, of, uh, of preventative measures, uh, the full suite included antibody treatments. And I wonder if the Honourable Member knows anything about what's become of that strategy. A very short answer from the Honourable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Well, if it has to be short, I want to say my colleague, I miss her too. It's, it's, uh, it, it is a different format. Uh, but any um, strategy that we put in place will always be led by science if I don't have enough time to, to answer the complete question. And I know that our Public Health Agency of Canada and Dr. Tam is doing a great job at leading this country, and I can only applaud her. And um, the, the contract questions, we can discuss this after the pandemic is over. But right now, I don't think it's a smart strategy to expose all the contracts that we've signed with Canada, knowing that it is a rare commodity across the world right now. Ministre du Débat, l'honorable député de Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Donc, mentionner que je vais partager mon temps avec le député de Foot Hills. Tout le monde m'entendait. Parfait. Merci. Écoutez, Madame la Présidente, euh, le débat qu'on a aujourd'hui, c'est pour parler des vaccins, parler de la difficulté qu'on a de recevoir nos vaccins. Mais également, je voudrais en profiter, parce que j'ai entendu plusieurs de mes collègues ce soir, euh, libéraux, euh, parler d'un manque de collaboration de la part des partis d'opposition, et particulièrement du Parti conservateur. Euh, je voudrais rappeler à tout le monde qu'il y a un an exactement, lorsque le virus a fait son apparition, euh, qui a avoir une rencontre d'urgence du comité de la santé et de faire le point. Le Parti conservateur. J'ai moi-même, en tant que porte-parole à l'époque de la sécurité publique, je me suis présenté au comité pour poser des questions sur ce qui se passait avec nos frontières. Puis à ce moment-là, on parle du 30 janvier 2020, on me répondait, ben écoutez, on commence à regarder ça. Donc, dès les débuts, on avait une approche de collaboration. Euh, mais nous, ce qui nous préoccupait, c'était qu'il y avait une forme de déni de la part du gouvernement de la part de la ministre de la Santé à l'époque du premier ministre qui mentionnait « Ah, oh, c'est pas dangereux le vaccin, inquiétez vous pas, euh, nous on n'a pas besoin de protection, les masques. » Non, pas du tout, euh, c'est pas transmissible. Donc, dès le début, il y avait un déni et ça nous inquiétait. Par la suite, on a vu que, que la façon la plus facile, la plus rapide de bloquer le, le virus au Canada, c'était de contrôler notre frontière. On a demandé, j'ai même mentionné, j'ai dit « La frontière, c'est notre première ligne de défense. » On a fait quoi? Rien. On était, on disait, bon, on regarde ça, nos agents passent de l'information aux passagers qui arrivent. On disait, oui, mais il faudra avoir des mesures beaucoup plus sévères. 
Parfois, on nous disait, écoutez, le Canada, c'est un grand pays, le territoire est immense. Je vais bien, je vais bien comprendre, mais il reste qu'il y a trois grands aéroports internationaux, Vancouver, Toronto, Montréal. Si on concentre nos vols sur ces aéroports-là, on parle de trois endroits. Même si le pays a 10 millions de kilomètres carrés, on peut quand même contrôler trois aéroports. C'est pas pire que le pays plus petit, le même nombre d'aéroports. Donc, c'est la, la façon très molle de réagir qui nous dérange. Mais si on avait collaboré en équipe Canada, si le gouvernement avait une réponse, « Ah, écoutez, ce que les conservateurs vous nous dites, tu penses que ça peut faire du sens, on peut s'entendre, on pourrait réagir, on aurait pu facilement travailler ensemble. » Mais ça, Madame la Présidente, voyez-vous, c'est facile d'un côté de dire « Les oppositions ne veulent pas travailler avec nous. » Mais de l'autre côté, on fait des gestes concrets de collaboration et ça ne fonctionne pas. Donc, à un moment donné, il faudrait s'entendre. Et le mot à retenir depuis un an maintenant, Madame la Présidente, le mot que je retiens de tout ça, de tout ce qui se passe de tous les niveaux, que ce soit la frontière ou les vaccins ou même les régimes économiques, là, le PCU, etc., c'est le mot « cohésion ». Le mot « cohésion » est le mot que je vais retenir de mon année 2020, début 2021, de la part du gouvernement. Euh, on, fait, on fait tout ce qu'on peut pour aider, même quand on est arrivé au programme économique. On amenait des éléments qu'on voyait, il y avait des problèmes. On voyait, on, on voyait venir des problèmes. Parce on n'est pas, pas parce qu'on est dans l'opposition qu'on est tellement stupide. On est quand même euh, des gens d'expérience. On a déjà vu avant les députés, puis on a vu nous autres aussi. Fait qu'à un moment donné, quand on amène des propositions d'amendement, puis qu'on se fait rejeter du revers de la main, et pire que ça, qu'on se fait dire publiquement « les conservateurs ne veulent pas aider les Canadiens ». Vous interrompre deux petites secondes, juste pour vérifier si l'interprétation fonctionne comme il faut. Est-ce que l'interprétation en anglais fonctionne? The honorable members who are listening to the French, um, the French version, uh, well, actually in English, can you please check if the uh, interpretation is working? The honorable member for Foothills, are you listening at all, please? Just to make, tell me if it's working. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Alors, je vais parler en français pour voir si ça fonctionne. Ça fonctionne? OK. Parfait. L'honorable député peut poursuivre. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Donc, comme je disais, depuis le début de la pandémie, qu'on a travaillé à amener des solutions, des propositions pour aider, mais on a plutôt reçu des, un revers de la main de la part du gouvernement. Donc, c'est difficile pour nous d'accepter le... OK. Le... le... Yeah, oui, je pense que nous avons un problème, effectivement, avec votre son. Euh, euh, Monsieur Paulus, je m'excuse de, de vous parler de votre nom, mais c'est vraiment l'interprète qui ne vous comprend pas. Apparemment, elle me comprend très bien quand je parle sur le plancher, euh, mais qu'elle a de la difficulté à vous comprendre. Vous êtes sur le bon canal? Euh, je... oui. Oh, oui. Est-ce qu'on peut essayer euh, quelques phrases micro, encore? Je sais pas. Oui, bonjour. Un, deux, trois. Que je m'entends dans la chambre? Oui, ça va. C'est beau. Ça semble fonctionner. Merci. Allez-y. Merci. Donc, pour continuer, Madame la Présidente, la, la cohésion et la transparence. Donc, lorsqu'on parle des vaccins, euh, c'est le manque de transparence qu'on reproche beaucoup. J'ai entendu mes collègues libéraux parler... Euh, bon, les contrats, on ne peut pas divulguer les ententes. Mais pourquoi? Comment on peut m'expliquer que du côté américain, nos collègues américains, j'ai huit pages d'informations qui proviennent du ministère de la Santé des États-Unis, qui donnent l'ensemble depuis le mois de mars 2020 des ententes qui ont été signées avec les différentes compagnies. On voit très bien, par exemple, qu'un point neuf milliard a été donné à Pfizer, indiquant clairement que les 100 millions de premières doses devaient être données aux citoyens américains et distribué directement par Pfizer, et etc., etc., etc. J'en ai pour huit pages d'informations comme ça. Donc, pourquoi est-ce que les Américains peuvent divulguer les montants investis, peuvent divulguer la, la quantité de vaccins qui vont avec le contrat? Nous, chez nous, au Canada, on doit rester dans l'obscurité. Et comme j'entendais mes collègues du Bloc québécois qui en parlaient plus tôt, c'est ce qui nous préoccupe le plus. Lorsqu'on veut travailler en équipe, lorsqu'on veut travailler en équipe Canada, on doit être transparent avec les collègues. Et... Qui nous a convoqué? Qui a convoqué les porte-parole à un meeting pour nous donner de l'information, pour nous dire on veut travailler ensemble, voici l'information? Non, personne ne fait ça. Donc, c'est très euh, insultant pour nous de se faire attaquer. Je continue là-dessus aussi, la Nouvelle-Zélande. J'ai entendu parler de la Nouvelle-Zélande. 
on dit pourquoi il n'y a pas de vaccin encore. Bien, il faut comprendre que la Nouvelle-Zélande a contrôlé cette frontière. La frontière Nouvelle-Zélande est un exemple de contrôle et c'est pour ça qu'il n'y a presque pas de COVID là-bas. Et c'est pour ça que la vaccination est beaucoup moins urgente parce que le, le, les, les frontières étant très bien contrôlées, les cas de COVID sont très peu nombreux, même l'économie roule là-bas, il n'y a pas le même problème qu'on a chez nous et c'est la même chose pour l'Australie. Donc, comme je dis, la pasté, c'est un problème incroyable de la part du gouvernement. Parce qu'on parle des vaccins, la première erreur, si on parle de vaccins, il me reste quelques minutes, j'imagine, le problème numéro un, c'est l'entente qui a été faite avec le régime communiste chinois. On l'a encore vu ce matin, notre article qui est sorti. L'entente qui a été signée avec Ancino, Biotech, compagnie chinoise, qui nous a fait dans les mains au mois de mai 2020. Donc, entente, brevet, les, les, nos brevets canadiens, notre propriété intellectuelle canadienne, là, tout ce les connaissances ont été transférées à Cancino. Ces gens-là, ce qu'ils ont fait, ils ont laissé les conteneurs avec les équipements de fabrication sur les quais en Chine. Ils ont dit, oubliez ça le Canada. Donc, on a envoyé l'information, tout ce qu'on connaît. Eux, ils nous ont dit, bye bye, on ne fait rien pour vous. Et c'est pour ça qu'après ça, bien, le gouvernement est obligé de pédaler alors que les autres pays avançaient avec Pfizer, Moderna et compagnie. Nous, on est en retard parce qu'on a fait confiance au régime communiste chinois. Vous me faites signe qu'il me reste une minute? Non, je vais vous arrêter encore. Euh, désolé. Euh, on a vraiment beaucoup de difficultés avec le son. Donc, je vais... Demandez qu'on garde mon micro ici ouvert parce que je pense que quand M. Paulus parle et que mon micro est ouvert, euh, ils sont capables de l'entendre, les interprètes. Donc, je vais me taire, mais mon micro va rester ouvert pour que vous puissiez poursuivre votre, votre intervention. Allez-y. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Donc, euh, donc c'est ça. Première erreur, l'entente qui a été signée avec Cancino qui n'a pas été euh, respectée par le régime communiste chinois. Par la suite, un retard qui a été pris. Et ça, on l'a mentionné depuis le début, puis à chaque fois qu'on mentionnait qu'on avait plusieurs semaines de retard sur nos collègues, nos partenaires internationaux, au lieu de, de dire « oui, c'est vrai, on va essayer de s'aider », bon, on, on faisait rire de nous. Donc, à chaque fois, aucune collaboration de la part du gouvernement libéral. Et là-dessus, Madame la Présidente, ben, j'imagine que mon temps est fini avec le son qui va mal, malheureusement. Euh, moi, ce que je peux vous dire, c'est que le Parti conservateur, moi-même comme porte-parole en sécurité publique à l'époque et maintenant en approvisionnement, je suis là pour collaborer, travailler avec le gouvernement pour aider à ce que les Canadiens s'en sortent le plus vite possible, parce qu'on veut tous sortir de la maudite COVID qui nuit à l'économie canadienne et à la santé des Canadiens. Et ça, la seule façon de le faire, c'est d'avoir de la transparence et de la cohésion. C'est tout ce qu'on demande et je je suis pas mal sûr que tous mes collègues de l'opposition, de tous les partis d'opposition sont d'accord avec moi. Merci. Euh, je vous remercie euh, infiniment, l'honorable député, et de sa patience aussi. Je pense que nous avons un problème avec euh, votre lien Internet euh, parce que ça coupe beaucoup. Euh, donc, au niveau de l'interprétation, ça a été très, très, très mitigé. Là, on a eu très peu d'interprétations. De, de, euh, J'ai eu un appel au règlement. Euh, J'ai actuellement l'honorable député de Shefford qui aurait une question. Euh, je vais la laisser poser la question. On va voir si ça fonctionne mieux avec elle. <rire> et, on, et on verra pour, pour la suite des choses. L'honorable député de Shefford. Je disais, Madame la Présidente, qu'il y a une entente et une consultation entre collègues au Bloc québécois. J'ai une, une autre collègue qui poserait la question à M. Paulus. L'honorable député d'Avignon, l'amitié ce matin de Matapédia. Merci, ma collègue, pour me laisser son tour. Euh, J'ai apprécié le discours de mon collègue. On travaille souvent sur les mêmes dossiers de sécurité publique, euh, des frontières. On s'intéresse aux mêmes enjeux. Et je suis tout à fait d'accord avec lui qu'il y a un manque de transparence, un manque de cohérence et j'ajouterais même un manque de leadership euh, dans la gestion de l'approvisionnement des vaccins. Et, et je suis certaine qu'il sera d'accord avec moi. Et euh, ça semble même pas être un automatisme pour le premier ministre de prendre le téléphone puis d'appeler les compagnies pharmaceutiques quand on se rend compte qu'il y a des problèmes, ça ne semble pas être un automatisme de trouver des solutions euh, à ces retards-là qu'on voit aujourd'hui. Alors, il en a parlé. Comment ça se fait que euh, des pays comme les États-Unis peuvent voir les détails des contrats qui sont signés entre les gouvernements puis, puis les compagnies pharmaceutiques? Comment ça se fait qu'on n'ait pas ces détails-là? Euh, il y a un total manque de transparence de la part du gouvernement et j'aimerais ça avoir son opinion là-dessus. Merci. Honorable député de Charlebourg-Haute-Saint-Charles. 
Merci à ma collègue pour votre question. Et comme je mentionnais dans mon discours, la liste de toutes, toutes les ententes que le gouvernement américain a signées avec les différentes compagnies, puis c'est très clair, on voit vraiment ce prévu et on comprend pourquoi actuellement il y a 6 de la population américaine qui est vaccinée. On comprend pourquoi aussi il y a même des Québécois qui se font vacciner en Floride parce que les États-Unis ont su s'organiser. Puis nous, de notre côté, on a juste des à moitié de l'information, le premier ministre qui sort de, de la résidence pour nous mentionner des choses qui ne sont pas claires, puis c'est jamais clair. Donc, cohésion, transparence, c'est le mot à retenir. The Honorable Member for Thunder Bay, Rainy River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member opposite is, is critical of our governments not closing the borders soon enough. May I point out that the international health regulations, which we're members of WHO and therefore bound by that, require our government take measures which are least restrictive of travel and trade. And I do believe that that these regulations were partly, um, and these measures were put partly put in place in response to the criticism of the Conservative government um, during the SARS pandemic, who is very critical of WHO imposing travel restrictions. So it, it was the Conservative government who had a hand in creating this rule under the IHR. Thank you. Honorable député de Charlebourg, de Saint Charles. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je comprends le, le, le sens de la question de mon collègue, mais en même temps, il faut, faut savoir qu'on a également un rapport. Le rapport qui a été fait, euh, et mon ancien collègue Tony Clement nous a donné des, des conseils là-dessus, euh, c'est on peut critiquer chaque année, chaque critique, mais à un moment donné, quest ce qu'on veut, c'est de, de s'en sortir. Et lorsque le conseil qu'on donnait au début était de contrôler les, les passagers qui arrivaient aux aéroports, c'était la base. Et lorsqu'on a des réponses qui sont insignifiantes, c'est difficile de rester calme. Merci. The Honorable Member for Red Deer Lacombe. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you to my uh, colleague for his speech. Uh, I am hearing from a large number of people in central Alberta about how damaging the economic effects of a lasting lockdown uh, is on their businesses, on their livelihoods, on our mental health. And I'm wondering if my colleague can elaborate on why it's so important that we have a plan to get our Canadian population vaccinated so that we can get back to business as usual and back to our lives. And I'm wondering if my colleague is hearing the same thing. L'honorable député de Charlebourg, haute saint charles Merci, euh, mon collègue, pour la question. Ben, c'est la base. Hein. Je crois que c'est clair aujourd'hui qu'après un an, les gens sont confinés. Moi, ici au Québec, à partir de 20h, 8h le soir, on doit être en, en couvre-feu. On n'a surtout pas l'intention que ça continue comme ça, mais en même temps, on comprend que d'un point de vue santé publique, on n'a pas le choix. Il faut cesser la transmission du virus. Donc, la seule façon de s'en sortir... Ça va être d'avoir un vaccin le plus vite possible. Dès que la population va être vaccinée, on va pouvoir s'en sortir. Et l'horizon de septembre, fin septembre 2021, c'est dans neuf mois. C'est très, très loin et c'est pour ça qu'on doit accélérer le tempo. Resuming debate, uh, the Honorable Member for Foothills. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And it's uh, a pleasure to rise to speak in this emergency debate to try to address some of the issues that I know many of my constituents are concerned about. And I think the goal of what we're trying to achieve with this debate on, on vaccines, vaccine distribution and procurement is answer some questions that many Canadians have. And I know I'm not the only member of Parliament here that has had numerous calls of frustration, anxiety, depression and mistrust from our constituents because they just don't know who to believe anymore. And I'd like to back up just for, if I may for a brief bit to, to go back to where we got started with this. And the mixed messages and inconsistency from the very beginning from this Liberal government when it came to the COVID-19 pandemic. First, they dismantled Canada's early warning system, which would have allowed us to learn much more about this pandemic than we did before. We had parts, members of our military warning the Liberal government about the impending impacts of the COVID pandemic, and the Liberal government ignored that. They were flip-flopping on travel restrictions. At first, they said, 
wearing a mask wasn't important, wasn't necessary, didn't help. And now obviously we have a very different message. They even talked about accessing rapid and home-based testing. They comp compared rapid testing to selling snake oil to Canadians, when at the same time our, our, our allies, our partners, and Western democracies around the world were accessing that technology like home base and rapid testing to keep their businesses open, to keep their schools open, keep their frontline healthcare workers safe, and allow their constituents to travel. That is where we started and where we got here and why we are so adamant, Madam Speaker, to learn more about the vaccines and where we are. And I think that came to a head when we see that no vaccines are being delivered right now. Zero. And I saw a map on, on the Health Canada website that said, uh, you know, our vaccination uh, distribution process is well underway. When you see in many jurisdictions around Canada, it's about 1%. 1% of Canadians have been vaccinated. Compare that to the United States where they're well over 5%. I have constituents uh, with family in Texas and Oklahoma who have said their family is going to be vaccinated by this spring and we may not be vaccinated. Many of us may not have that first dose until next September. So that shows you the very stark difference between what is happening in Canada and what is happening in other parts of the world and why we are so far behind and why as Conservatives and I think as, as members of Parliament and elected officials, we are so concerned with this information and certainly in many cases this lack of information. Now we've come full circle on the vaccines. And I talked about you know, some of the numbers that we have right now, but I'm going to talk a little bit about why I, why I question why we're here and where we could have been if the Liberal government wasn't discriminating, and I don't know another better way to say that, Madam Speaker, why the Liberal government was discriminating against a made in Canada solution. Canadian vaccines that could have been developed and manufactured here in Canada. We, the, the Liberal government initially started with an agreement with CanSino, a Canada-Chinese partnership to develop and manufacture the vaccine. The Liberal government poured literally millions of dollars into that partnership at the beginning. Now I would question, after everything we've been through with the Chinese Communist Party, why would we have ever put our trust in a partnership with the Chinese government? Why would that have been the one solution that the Liberal government had looked at. Now, not surprisingly, that partnership fell apart in the spring and early summer. As a result of that, the Liberal government had to scramble to find what other solutions were out there. And unfortunately, we don't know what agreements they signed. We don't know uh, the details of what they relinquished or what we gave up or what do we have, do we give up the licenses to manufacture the Pfizer uh, or AstraZeneca vaccines here in Canada? But what I find the most frustrating, Madam Speaker, is we didn't have to go through any of this. We could have had a Made in Canada solution. We certainly saw today in the media, um, Providence Therapeutics in Calgary begun its first clinical trials of a Canadian vaccine earlier this month. But what I found most frustrating, and I, I will tell you, Madam Speaker, when I was watching uh, the representatives from Providence Therapeutics on the news this afternoon, I was angry. They were saying that they approached the Liberal government in March with the basis of a vaccine that's based on the same technology that is being used by Pfizer and AstraZeneca. And they were ready to begin their trials and hopefully production. They heard silence from this Liberal government. And now they have finally come, gone public with what the position they've put in. And Brad Sorensen, the CEO, said today, we have a Canada solution. We've sourced it, we follow the rules, we've done what we're supposed to do, and we're not getting any engagement from this government. The company even offered to transfer its production and, and studies to the Montreal facility that the Liberal government had initially funded to increase capacity to manufacture that, uh, another vaccine. But again, radio silence from this Liberal government. Meanwhile, we have a Canadian technology that could, be, that could have been in clinical trials and maybe in production. Another example, Soul Star Pharma out of Laval, Quebec, 
approached many members of parliament, including liberal members of parliament last March. I have the emails that I had back and forth with the Minister of Health and the Minister of Procurement. They have a very unique antiviral technology that they were asking for help from the Canadian government. Again, no response, silence. Frustrated, they wanted a made in Canada solution. Now this antiviral technology requires no special storage. It is a powder inhaled. And unlike the vaccine, it actually attacks the virus in the body and kills that virus. So although the vaccine is important, the vaccine does not stop you from being infected or spreading the virus. The antiviral, on the other hand, kills the virus in your body. Again, a Canadian solution. I spoke to the CEO of, uh, of the pharma company today, and he said, had we had the support from the Canadian government last spring, we would be in clinical trials now, ready to begin production. But what they ended up having to do out of utter frustration of not getting any support or even any response from the Liberal government is they applied to Operation Warp Speed in the United States. They immediately had a response. They are now being fully funded and are working with Pfizer and uh, research companies in San Diego. Again, a Canadian solution that had no response from the Canadian government and had to go elsewhere. This is incredibly frustrating when we have a company like Soulstar Pharma raised and, and born here in Canada, in Laval, Quebec, that had no response from the Canadian government. So that's two. We could have had a vaccine and an antiviral on hand right now if they had a response. We also have ClearMe uh, rapid testing technology out of Calgary, 98% accurate, approved for use in the United States and the United Kingdom last spring. Still awaiting support and an answer and approval from Health Canada and this Liberal government. So why this discrimination against Canadian companies that are, want to have a Canadian solution and want to be there? And unfortunately, right now, it seems like the Liberal government is treating this like a Seinfeld sketch. You know, a anybody can order vaccines. Anybody can order a vaccine. But the most important thing, Madam Speaker, is actually having the vaccine. Having the vaccine that they can distribute it and deliver to Canadians. This isn't a joke. This is very serious. Imagine where we would be today if we had an antiviral, a vaccine, and rapid testing made here and manufactured in Canada. Where would our economy be? Where would the mental health of Canadians be? Would we be relying on global supply chains that we see the EU is now maybe blocking distribution of vaccines? Can we really rely on a vaccine manufactured in New Jersey that people in New Brunswick are going to get it before people in New York? That is what we are facing. But I want to offer a solution, Madam Speaker, as I conclude. It's not too late. These Canadian companies still want to work with Canadian organizations. For Solstar, the Ontario government, the Quebec government has now reached out to help with their lab testing at Western University. The Liberal government needs to reach out to these Canadian companies who are ready to go and expedite their approval process and the clinical trials and be there to support these Canadian companies who desperately want to be part of a Canadian solution so we can get our economy back up and running and Canadians back to work. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Questions and commentaires. Questions and comments. Honorable Deputy David Tibi Temiskamin. Merci beaucoup à mon collègue de Foothills que, euh, sincèrement, que je connaissais pas. Puis, sincèrement, je trouve que ça a été, été avec ma collègue de... Maman, l'interprétation ne fonctionne pas. Est-ce qu'on peut réessayer? Yeah. OK, ça fonctionne. Merci. Donc, je, je, je reprends. C'était la première fois que je remarquais mon collègue de Foothill dans cette chambre. Ça a été probablement, avec le discours de ma collègue de Beauport-Limoilou, le discours le plus inspirant, je pense, et le plus pertinent, le plus constructif dans le débat de ce soir. Ma question, elle est simple. Il a mentionné plusieurs exemples au niveau de la production des vaccins au Canada. À partir de quel moment dans la stratégie qu'il a observée du gouvernement libéral a-t-on échoué dans la production des vaccins au Canada? Pourquoi la solution n'est pas fabriquée ici de vaccins québécois ou canadiens? 
et comment on peut y remédier rapidement. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Honorable member for Fit Foothills. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I want to thank my colleague uh, for his question. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, when we have this system, we don't get to see each other all that often, and which is too bad, because I'm sure we could be friends down the road. But I agree with them. Is this is incredibly frustrating, and I, I, I can't even articulate how angry I was watching Mr. Sorensen on the news this afternoon talking about Providence Technologies and what they could have been doing in offering a Canadian vaccine manufactured here in Canada. So it's obvious we have the capacity, we have the technology. What is we're lacking is the participation of a Liberal government that for some reason put all its eggs in the Chinese, the Chinese Communist government basket, which for the life of me, I cannot understand why you would put the health of Canadians at risk when you could have solved this months ago. The Honourable Member for Thunder Bay, Rainy River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member opposite claims we could have had effective antivirals made right here in Canada. Could he please cite evidence to support that statement? What evidence do you have to back up this claim? Can you cite a randomized control trial, for example, that came to the conclusion that um, such a medicine um, could be produced in Canada. I, I'm a doctor. I have a master's of public health. I'm interested in knowing he's making a claim that I think is totally unsubstantiated. Thank you. For Foothills. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I appreciate working with my colleague on the health committee. But I had the conversation with the CEO of uh, Soul Star Pharma this afternoon, which I've had conversations with before. They are now going through their trials and their testing, getting close to completing their clinical testing in San Diego right now, have a partnership with Western University and the Ontario government. The Quebec government is now coming on board. And I guess this is, this is the, the frustrating part, is, is we're offering a potential solution. And Soulstar wants to be part of that solution, but still this, this disbelief, is it disbelief that a Canadian company and Canadian skills and, and Canadian innovation can come up with this solution? I'm, ask, I'm, I'm asking my colleague, please, tomorrow, call Soulstar Pharma and get this going. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Ladysmith. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his speech. And I agree with him that we needed a lot more transparency with this whole vaccine rollout and with the plan. And I would have liked to have seen contracts for manufacturing of vaccines in this country. I agree that we should be using Canadian uh, ingenuity. And I would ask him, I've heard a number of his colleagues today talking about the great legacy of, of Canada and our medical history. I know about insulin, about diphtheria, about we were a, a world leader providing vaccines to uh, countries around the world. And the lab that was responsible for that was Connaught Labs. It was a public lab that was established in 1914. And it had a long running legacy until it was privatized in 1984 by Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, a conservative prime minister. And I would like to ask him if he'd like to see this model of a public lab reintroduced in Canada so that we can be on top of these things when we face the next pandemic or the next serious health issue. Honourable Member for Foothills. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for his question. And I think he, what he's talking about is, is, a, is the root of a larger issue that we need to discuss. I would like to see when we're back on our barn feet a little bit that we have a Royal Commission investigate the COVID-19 pandemic. What worked? What didn't work? Were the voids in the system? And vaccine manufacturing, distribution, all of those things should be part of that. So I don't want to make that contention now, but I think there should be a very thorough investigation of how the Liberal government handled this situation and what can be improved in the future. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Pickering Uxbridge. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I appreciate the opportunity tonight to speak on this important matter, and I'm glad we are having this debate. I think it's important 
incredibly important for Canadians to see parliamentarians discussing uh, the health and safety and the importance of vaccines that are going to help us get through this pandemic. There is no question that all Canadians, all members of this house want to see this pen, this health pandemic come to an end. There is no question that the economic recovery and the rebuild is going to also be incredibly important. But until Canadians are healthy and safe, that needs to be Canada's number one priority. And so obviously vaccines have been a critical part of this. And I'm really proud. I'm sorry, I have a point of order. Uh, I'm sorry, the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of National Defence. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise on a point of order. I believe the honourable member intended to split her time with the member for Winnipeg North. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Does the honourable member concur? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I apologize. Uh, getting used to this virtually is... Uh, I have it written down. Uh, you know, wanting to make sure I'm not on mute. <laughs> so, thank you. I am splitting my time with the uh, honorable member from Winnipeg North. Thank you. So with that being said, I just, you know, the, the role of vaccines are going to be incredibly important in getting us through this pandemic. And that's why our government um, prioritized working on you know, signing contracts and making sure that vaccines would be available in, in Canada. And that work required a lot of um, information going into the background. This work began with our government back in July. And at that time, there was so much uncertainty as well in terms of timing of vaccines, when they would be safe and effective. And that is just something that politicians and politics cannot control. It had to be science-led, which is exactly why our government made sure to have a diverse portfolio to make sure that we were working with industry experts to prepare for all possible scenarios. And frankly, you know, the disappointment around the Pfizer delays uh, for the next few weeks has been something that is frankly disappointing, but precisely demonstrates how our government's plan was to diversify, was to ensure that there would be a variety of vaccines that once they were deemed safe and effective by Health Canada, that Canada could then access them. In addition to that, even prior to the vaccines um, development, you know, our government was working to ensure that we had ev all the materials we needed to help deal with uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. So that has meant, you know, we heard early calls in terms of ensuring that we had enough uh, PPE, which is something we then delivered on, uh, calls for increase in rapid testing, which we then delivered on again. And so every step of the way, every twist and turn of this pandemic, you know, we have been there for Canadians in ways that have been very responsive and very fast with all things considered, given the dynamics of this pandemic globally, the global competition for all of these same materials, and to see Canada as one of the leaders in ensuring that we have these materials and these vaccines for Canadians is precisely why you know, I'm very hopeful that we will be able to come out of this pandemic uh, quickly, but also in, in ways that makes us all stronger. And frankly, where we can learn lessons to ensure that we have strategies in place uh, in not just only pandemic times, but throughout uh, governments to ensure that we always keep pandemic planning in our forefront. In addition, um, getting back to what we're discussing, which is the vaccines and the procurement, 
I've heard a lot of members during this debate talk about there's no plan, there's no plan. Well, frankly, Madam Speaker, that couldn't be further from the truth. Precisely what we're debating is our plan. And in fairness, I understand the role of members of the opposition. It isn't completely their duty and their right to pose questions to the government. But there is a big difference between challenging the government or having a difference of opinion and spreading misinformation information. And we have heard time and time again, um, you know, some members, not all, I think, you know, many rise to the occasion of this debate and understand what's on the line and the um, supporting Canadians at this difficult time. But there are many that frankly have used this opportunity to spread misinformation, cause incredible confusion. Um, and They've done so for political gain. And I think that is so disheartening. I think this is an opportunity that whether we all agree or not on the specifics of rollout, that we come together as a parliament, as Canadians, to step forward and work together on ensuring the health and safety of all Canadians. So to see members rise in this place and don't rise to the occasion is frankly very disheartening because we should be discussing strategies and steps moving forward as a Canadian government, as Canadian parliamentarians, looking out for our friends, our neighbors, and not using this as an opportunity um, for whatever political gain they might see. I remember back in December, Conservative members claiming we were never going to get the vaccine, we were going to be last, and that didn't happen. We had a plan, we stuck to it, and we saw deliveries of vaccines in Canada. We were one of the earliest countries to get it. And the Conservatives, frankly, looked deflated after that happened. They should have been elated. They should have been happy that vaccines were delivered for Canadians. And instead, they didn't ask any questions about it until this point where there's no question, like I said, the Pfizer delay is something that we're all disappointed for. But the suggestion that we have no vaccines in this country is simply false. We have over 1.1 million vaccines in Canada to date. We have more vaccines coming next week with Moderna and Pfizer. As Health Canada continues their work and their reviews, if additional um, vaccine candidates become approved, we have additional contracts. But I think as parliamentarians, we have a duty to ensure the public that we are working to make sure that we have everything we need in place that we are in building that public trust to ensure that Canadians know that when vaccines are available, when it's their turn to receive the vaccine, that they can trust it. They can, they can trust that it wasn't a group of politicians determining what vaccines move forward and which ones don't. And instead that it's based on science and evidence and that our regulators at Health Canada are the ones that make these decisions. I think this is the opportunity we all have as parliamentarians, and I hope that we have more rise to the occasion, work with us on solutions. I keep hearing the Conservatives talk about there's no plan, yet I haven't heard a single solution that they feel they would have done differently that we somehow haven't. And I think that's the type of leadership I think all Canadians would welcome and that um, getting away from the partisanship for when it comes to a pandemic and a crisis like this is if not, if not now, then when? And I really think that's what Canadians are expecting. So Madam Speaker, I see that my time is uh, coming to an end. So I just think that as we move forward, it's important to assure Canadians that until vaccines are available in their jurisdictions for mass distribution, that we need to protect our most vulnerable, continue with these measures, and know that Canada has procured enough vaccines to ensure that everybody who wants a vaccine uh, can get one by September, and that we have 
um, 6 million doses of vaccines coming by the end of March. And with from April to June, at least 20 million doses of uh, vaccines will be available. So it is coming and we need to work together to ensure that all of us have a role to play in keeping Canadians safe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions et commentaires. L'honorable député David Tibi Témiscamingue. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Euh, je remercie ma collègue pour son intervention, tout en mentionnant que c'était peut-être une des plus démagogiques que j'ai entendues aujourd'hui. Ma question, elle est fort simple dans les circonstances. On entend les libéraux nous dire qu'ils ont tout un portefeuille de vaccins, puis évidemment qu'ils ont un plan. Elle nous l'a bien rappelé dans son intervention. Tout en n'ayant aucune idée c'est quoi ce plan-là, ben, je vais lui poser une question très simple. C'est quoi le plan que vous allez faire avec les... 330 millions de doses supplémentaires qu'on va acquérir avec votre fameux portefeuille de 400 millions de doses quand on est entre 35 et 40 millions de Canadiens, qu'on a besoin de deux doses chaque. Puis est-ce qu'on ne pourrait pas faire preuve de solidarité internationale, justement? Qu'est-ce qu'on fait des pays qui sont en développement, qui ont aussi besoin de vaccins? Est-ce qu'on peut aussi leur les aider? Je pense que c'est une responsabilité qu'on a comme pays riche. Merci, Madame la Présidente. The Honorable Member for Pickering Oxbridge. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the question from my honorable colleague. In fact, the irony is that as my honorable colleague is speaking, he was talking about, oh, what plan, what plan, but meanwhile actually highlighted several elements of our plan. The number of doses there is uh, on our, the Government of Canada's website, there are timelines and ability of, of doses that are coming. There is that commitment that once Canadians have received vaccines, that if there are additional vaccines, that we will absolutely work with other countries, developing nations that need help. I agree with him that Canada does have a duty to help around the world if possible, but the government has committed that we want to make sure we take care of the health and safety of Canadians first, and then we will do our part globally because that is going to be good for Canadians and it's going to be good for our global uh, our global community and our global economy. The honorable member for um, uh, Port Alberni, sorry, I'm just blank. Uh, Courtney Alberni. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, does the member not agree uh, th that transparency and clear communication are essential for addressing the vaccine hesitancy in Canada? That this is critical. That we're we're sharing information, getting as much information as we can out to the public. Well, member for Pickering Uxbridge. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank my honorable colleague for that question. I do agree, transparency is incredibly important as well. This is why I think the opportunity for this debate in terms of um, vaccine hesitancy is a good opportunity to talk about how Canada is a leader in regulations, in safety, in, a, in making sure that vaccines are safe and effective, and that you know we have a world-class system through Health Canada and regulations that ensuring that um, vaccines are safe before they are out to the general public. And I think Health Canada does an excellent job in terms of providing that science-based analysis um, to provide that level of transparency that the member spoke to. And I agree, and I think as parliamentarians, we have a role to play in sharing that information with Canadians to ensure that when vaccines are available and ready, like the ones that are already Um, in Canada, that Canadians do feel safe and comfortable to receive it because that is precisely what we need to do to get through this pandemic. L'honorable député de Shefford. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je me demandais, j'ai, elle a beaucoup parlé, la députée, de, du fameux plan et de, 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 de qui vont réussir à vacciner les Canadiens. J'aimerais l'entendre. En fin de semaine dernière, Joanne Liu, ancienne présidente de Médecins sans frontières, expliquait à quel point chaque délai, chaque moment que l'on attend, que l'on n'agit pas, permet une multiplication des cas. Et dans un contexte où les variants risquent d'arriver en plus grand nombre au Canada. Donc, les moindres délais, que ce soit pour la vaccination, que ce soit pour un meilleur contrôle aux frontières. Est-ce que, est que notre honorable collègue peut nous expliquer en quoi tous ces délais-là, cette non-action du gouvernement libéral, fait en sorte qu'aujourd'hui, on est encore à risque de voir les cas qui pourraient réaugmenter dans quelques semaines, voire dans quelques mois? 
The Honorable Member for Pickering Uxbridge. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, there was some challenges with the interpretation, but from what I was able to pick up, um, I think the question was, uh, I heard in and around uh, in action on the government, but I don't know if there was something specific. I will just say that when it has come since the beginning of this pandemic, I think countries around the world were grappling with the best measures to take based on science and it was evolving. I think we have come to the table every step of the way to ensure the health and safety of Canadians are at the forefront. I apologize if, I, if the interpretation didn't come through. I didn't hear all of the question, but I think the key is ensuring that... Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary uh, to the President of the Queen's Privy Council. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and it's always a pleasure to address the, the Chamber. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, one of the most important debates that we'll actually have, uh, I believe, uh, this year in terms of uh, the significance of what I believe is, at the end of the day, a, a great deal of hope that is out there. And, you know, ever since the this world pandemic started to take uh, flight, the government has uh, been uh, aware of it and has been taking actions. And I think that Canadians understand and appreciate that we made the decision earlier that we are going to listen to what science, health experts, uh, civil servants, Canadians as a whole, the different stakeholders have to, to say on this very important uh, issue. Uh, and Madam Speaker, and I believe at the end of the day, when we take a look in terms of how it is that, uh, that Canada has managed through this whole process, that will come out okay. I really and truly believe that. Uh, we had, uh, for example, in regards to the vaccination issue, the debate uh, for today, uh, the COVID-19 uh, vaccine task force. And we have to, to remember, they are the group that in essence recommend that we need to go out there and secure these contracts. There was a concern in regards to capacity here in, in Canada. At the end of the day, the most important thing that we have to do here is to ensure that we have a vaccination uh, uh, established so that it is free and safe and effective. That's what the expectations of Canadians from all regions of the country are. And when we hear about this lack of a plan, nothing could be further from the truth. We have known for weeks, if not months now, in terms of the government's commitment to ensure that every Canadian that wants to have the vaccination will, in fact, have that opportunity to be vaccinated by uh, the end of September of this year. We are working day in and day out with provincial and territorial uh, jurisdictions to ensure that not only is Canada acquiring the vaccines that are so critically important, but there's a high sense of cooperation in terms of working with provinces to make sure that the distribution is there. We have, I believe, a, a system that's in place in which Canadians can be confident of. Now, you know, Opposition members will pick and choose. They'll talk about, well, you know, country X is doing better or country uh, Y is already vaccinating. It's important to realize that Canada received vaccines back in December. Many other countries, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, didn't receive vaccines uh, in late last year. Some countries such as Japan and New Zealand, Australia and South Korea have not even started uh, vaccinating. Someone uh, mentioned earlier today about uh, my New Democratic uh, colleague, uh, I believe he's a health uh, critic, uh, mentioned about, well, you know, the United States is going to go up to 1.5 million people uh, a day in terms of being vaccinated. Well, there's 350 plus people living in the USA. Do the math. There's 37 million people in, in Canada. I believe that Canada is doing exceptionally well in meeting the expectations that Canadians have of the national government. And we are doing that because we are working with 
those health experts and the groups that are there that have that vested interest to make sure that we do uh, get it right. You know, it's interesting, you know, some of the, the criticisms, like the a member of parliament from, from Foothills, a colleague from Foothills, he says, well, you know what, that government, all they're focused on, their first priority was China and a deal with China. That's just not true. And it's not the only thing in which members of the opposition will say that is factually incorrect. And there is misinformation that is out there. And opposition members do have to take some responsibility for the type of information that they are passing on to Canadians. Madam Speaker, I believe at the end of the day that Canada is in a great position based on the recommendation of the COVID-19 vaccine task force. Canada actually signed agreements with seven different companies to reserve vaccine doses for Canadians. And they will be able to be vaccinated, those that want to be vaccinated, at the very latest by the end of September. And there should be no doubt about that. We know we will have 6 million by the end of March, that we are on target to be able to get that uh, doses of 6 million. These are pretty much straightforward and fairly easy to understand. When I heard that we were going to be talking about the vaccine and having this emergency debate today, I thought, you know what, this provides us an opportunity to maybe to provide some other thoughts. You know, I had some correspondence, for example, from Manitoba Teacher Society. And one of the things that I really appreciated them raising, and I want to share with members uh, tonight, is think of the impact that school closures have on our economy. It is incredibly significant. Do some research and try to understand the, the importance of when a schools and our uh, schools, public schools start to shut down, the impact it has on our economy, let alone society uh, in general. You know, they're, they're recognizing that the government uh, needs uh, the ur to urgently look and maintain and return in-person schooling as a key component towards Canada's economic recovery. We all know that it's the provinces that establish these, these priorities, but Ottawa does have a role to play in terms of sharing uh, some of our thoughts. We all agreed, parliamentarians, parliamentarians that uh, there are situations where we need to establish priorities in terms of the vaccine. For example, long care and those healthcare workers that have been working in long care home facilities, servicing seniors. Everyone agrees that that had to be a priority. You know, the government relies on the advice of the National Advisory Council for Immunization to inform vaccine priority lists across the country. You know, being able to, to share uh, thoughts on that issue, I think would be of, of great value. We recognize that Pfizer and Moderna are the two in which we have secured and they've met the requirements uh, from, from Health Canada and the regulations. And because of that, we know that it is a safe and effective vaccine. We have an organization through our regulations that is second to no other in the world. We also know that there still are five others that are out there. You know, AstraZeneca, I believe, and Johnson is under current review. And hopefully we will see more approvals that will be not that far in the distant future, uh, Madam Speaker. We can't include or incorporate those into the numbers because they haven't been approved. But at least we have a government that is recognizing that the best way we can ensure and give that guarantee that every Canadian will get that vaccination is to have that diverse portfolio. 
And if you want to use stats by saying, well, you know, this country X is doing this and country Y is doing that in, in, in an attempt to try to make Canada's vaccination plan uh, look bad, I would suggest to you that you are being very selective in terms of what it is that you are using. There is no doubt in, in my mind that the, whether it's from the prime minister's office to the, the cabinet uh, members involved, uh, to members of parliament, and even to a certain degree from all sides of the house, we understand the importance of getting this right. And there will be an opportunity for us to be able to get more into the details in the weeks and months, and yes, even years ahead, so that we are better positioned to be able to deal with this. To try to say that we wouldn't have wanted to see a made in Canada uh, solution is ridiculous. Of course, it would be nice. Take a look at what we did with some of the, um, the personal protection gears and how it is industries in Canada responded to it. I see my time has already expired, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts. Uh, the uh, Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and appreciate uh, the opportunity to enter into this important debate. And, uh, you know, I wish I could share the rose-colored glasses optimism uh, that uh, uh, the member opposite certainly has regarding this, especially when just this past day, uh, as I was looking into uh, fact-checking some of the uh, elements of this debate, and, and there's a whole rash of articles about the CanSino deal and, and the mismanagement and, and troubling uh, uh, a revelation that are coming out about and, and serious questions that need to be asked. There, there's a lot of very, very valid questions that need to be asked about this government's management of vaccines from the beginning. And, and then when it comes to the impact on today, the fact that next week, Canada is getting zero vaccines. How can that member uh, uh, speak so optimistically about their supposed successes when the, the number of vaccines that Canada will receive next week is zero. Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Well, Madam Speaker, it's not that difficult in the sense that the government has said uh, for a while now that we will have six million doses by the end of March. And even with this interruption, that number is not changing. What I find interesting is that it's easy to talk about an issue and to be critical months after. Where was the opposition's concern in regards to the issue of vaccination back in the summer when for the first time in 30 years, the House of Commons was actually sitting in a format, yes, by committee, but on the floor of the House of Commons in that chamber. And we were having literally hundreds, if not thousands of questions being asked. Where was the questions on vaccination back then? You know, to be able to try to... I have lots of people who would like to ask the Honourable Member questions. So I will give the parole actuellement to the Honourable Deputy de Moncal. The Honourable Deputy de Moncal. The Honourable Deputy de Moncal. Oui, merci, Madame la Présidente. Il y avait un petit problème avec euh, le son, je ne vous entendais pas. Euh, <coughs> mon estimé collègue, secrétaire parlementaire du leader du gouvernement, euh, parle euh, d'une attitude partisane et de désinformation. Euh, je lui ai remarqué dans un premier temps que son collègue tout à l'heure... Euh, euh, comparait la performance du Canada euh, avec euh, la Nouvelle-Zélande en disant qu'ils n'avaient, eux, pas encore commencé leur euh, vaccination, alors que pour eux, il n'est pas question de vacciner. Leurs mesures fonctionnent très bien, alors ils ne sont pas présentement à la remorque comme nous, on l'est présentement. Petite désinformation en provenance du gouvernement. Mais au-delà de ça, mon estimé collègue ne trouve pas ça un peu particulier. Nous, on dit que ça prend plus de transparence pour arriver à comprendre où on s'en va. Ne trouve t il pas ça particulier que, d'un côté, on publie euh, des modulations quant à la progression de la vaccination, euh, de, 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 de la contagion, mais quand ce qui a trait 
à l'échéancier prétendu que vous avez et qu'on ne voit pas de vaccination, vous ne proposez pas et vous ne déposez pas de scénario euh, optimiste ou négatif ou pessimiste par rapport auquel on pourrait justement suivre la progression et euh, voir ce qu'on peut faire pour atteindre ces objectifs-là. Et, ne, ne, et dans le contexte où, en plus, euh, AstraZeneca euh, et le nationalisme au, au, du point de vue de l'administration des vaccins semble être aussi une donnée là, qui, qui vous frappe là, présentement et qui change la donne de votre côté. Le, votre collègue n'a pas répondu à la question tout à l'heure. Alors, ne trouvez pas que euh, vous devriez... Euh, déposer ces, ces euh, modulations-là en fonction et, et qu'en en, en même temps, on puisse euh, ensemble voir en toute transparence comment on performe? L'honorable député, uh, the honorable member for Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. What is important is that the Ottawa or the national government continue to work with provincial jurisdictions who are administering uh, the vaccines in, in most part, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, and say that, look, um, there are uh, two vaccines that have been approved. We have up to another five uh, that we have uh, agreements uh, with, uh, and a couple of them are getting closer. And I believe that there is a weekly dialogue, a daily dialogue between the different levels of government. And for individuals that want to get a better sense of the overall bigger picture, take a look at the, at the website, the coronavirus.ca. There's all sorts of information that is there. There is a plan that is out there. That's to give, to say there's no plan is to, to give misinformation. Just And we have to resume debate. <laughs> uh, the Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I'll be splitting my time tonight with the member of Brandon Suris. And I, before I begin, I do want to thank the uh, Leader of the Opposition and uh, our colleagues in the NDP, the member from Vancouver Kingsway, uh, for asking for and for the Speaker to grant uh, what I think is the most critical issue that is facing this country today. And I say that, Madam Speaker, from the epicenter, just 10 minutes away from here, of an unfolding situation that requires Parliament's attention with the Roberta Place Long-Term Care Center. Madam Speaker, 127 residents have tested positive at Roberta Place. 92 staff have tested positive. 46 members of this long-term care center are dead as a result of COVID-19. I have been representing this area both as a city councillor and as a member of parliament now for the better part of 14 years. I've built tremendous relationships with not just the staff, uh, but the people that live in that residence and their families. And it is absolutely heartbreaking, Madam Speaker, to understand what's been going on there. And as a country, I ask you to not only pray for the staff and the residents and those that are helping, the staff at, from Royal Victoria Hospital, from the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, from Soldiers Memorial, But I also ask you to pray for Edwin Ng. Edwin is a support worker who is on a ventilator right now in critical condition at Royal Victoria Hospital. His wife, Samantha, and his three children are dependent on Edwin to provide support for them. And he is in critical condition. So I ask the Canadians pray for not only everybody that's involved in this situation, but also Edwin. Madam Speaker, 99 of these cases have been confirmed as the UK variant. For 10 months, Roberta Place had built a wall around it. There had been no cases, uh, everything was, was going well, and then all of a sudden, this UK variant came in, and like a fire, firestorm raged through that building, resulting in the situation that I described earlier. There's a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety within our community, and in particular, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Gardner, is warning of the potential of this spread 
community transmission within our community. And I've spoken to Dr. Gardner several times, and the only way to deal with this and respond to this UK variant is the use of immunization. And that means vaccinating. And I know that the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit and RVH have been doing their best to look after those in long-term care facilities and senior facilities within their jurisdiction. But the stark reality, Madam Speaker, is that we've run out of vaccines. And any thought of using immunization as a response to this UK variant right now is not going to happen unless and until we get more vaccines. And the challenge this week as has been documented tonight and why the importance of this debate is, is upon us is that we're not getting any vaccines this week. And based on the numbers that we've got through the province of Ontario, the province of Ontario will only be receiving 20,000 vaccines next week. Hardly enough to deal with this situation that is unfolding here in central Ontario. The challenge with that is, of course, is that it's not just who we are vaccinating in the long-term care and senior homes. Many of them have received their first vaccines because the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit has had to prioritize our most vulnerable. But there have been a total of 10,000 people that have been vaccinated. Many of them are frontline healthcare workers, personal support workers, long-term care workers who've received their first dosage of vaccination. And they were expecting that within the 28 day period that they were going to receive it last Thursday, Madam Speaker, but they were told that it had been put off, that they wouldn't be receiving the vaccine. And they were further told on Friday that they are not going to be receiving a vaccine in the near term. Now think of what this does to those frontline healthcare workers who are putting it out there every single day for our community not being able to know when that second dose is coming. And I can tell you, Madam Speaker, I've been dealing with phone calls. The level of fear and anxiety among these healthcare workers is unimaginable. Having to go into work every day, not knowing when this second vaccine dosage is going to be administered and that they were counting on that. And it's heartbreaking, Madam Speaker. So if anybody thinks that this is all about politics, this is about solutions. And I know that our local MPP has been working day and night trying to coordinate this multi-agency effort that's been going on, uh, but there is significant concern among not just our community, but healthcare providers, the Muskoka District Health Unit, Dr. Gardner and others. So there is a lot going on and, and this, this was predicted last year. You know, the opposition was talking about this, about how Canada had been at the back of the line. I had a conversation with my next door neighbor who works for AstraZeneca last May. And he said to me, he goes, do you know what Canada is doing about vaccine procurement? And I said to him, I said, I assume that they're, they're doing it, Rob. And he said, none of us have been approached at this point. AstraZeneca hadn't been approached. Pfizer hadn't been approached. Moderna hadn't been approached. And we find out today from stories that are appearing in the paper why that is. And so what was the opposition accused of? Fear mongering, spreading false information. I've been on this call for a couple of hours now and I've heard several members of the Liberal Party accuse us of that. We were actually telling Canadians the truth about what was going on. And so we need help in central Ontario. This morning, I spoke with Dr. Gardner and I've received correspondence from RVH and our MPP that speaks to the issue of vaccines. And I tried to get a hold of the health minister today, and I'm grateful that her director of operations called me tonight. We need 4,000 vaccines to ensure that those who are vulnerable in our community are able to get their second doses by February 8th. And so there's no vaccines available from the province. That's the stark reality. And so I'm, I'm seeking the federal government's assistance in dealing with this. And the other thing that needs to happen, and I, I, I've been on this push for a year now, there are rapid testing solutions that are out there, both antibody and anti, 
Gen Solutions. And I'm aware of at least one company who has had an application before Health Canada since last April or May. And still it hasn't been approved. I'm aware of other companies. These are three minute anti antigen and antibody tests that must be approved. It's part of the overall solution, not just vaccines, but rapid testing. And when I talk to people about this, they can't believe that Health Canada hasn't approved it, despite the fact that the US FDA, the European Union with the most stringent testing regime in the world has approved these antibody and these antigen tests. And yet we don't have them here in Canada. And that's another thing that Dr. Gardner talked about. And Dr. Lee, the Associate Medical Officer of Health, had we had these rapid tests in place, much of this could have been avoided. Their words, not mine. And so we are in a desperate situation, as I said, here in central Ontario. And last week I received, last Friday, this correspondence from the Chief Medical Officer of Health and RVH. Unless we receive more vaccine in the interim, it'll mean only 25% of Simcoe Muskoka long-term care residents will receive their second dose within 28 days. No new Simcoe Muskoka LTC res residents will receive dose one. No new Simcoe Muskoka assisted living ca care patients will receive dose one, making them ineligible for transfer to LC LTC or retirement homes. And no Simcoe Muskoka health care workers will receive dose two within 42 days. The clinic actually closed on Thursday and all dose two appointments were canceled. And if we're going to be in alignment with provincial direction our, and protect our region from this highly transmittable variant, we need 4,000 doses, ministers, and we need them by February 8th. Help us please in central Ontario. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments, questions and comments. The honourable member for Winnipeg Centre. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker, and uh, thanks to my uh, honourable colleague uh, for sharing uh, the very dire situation that he is experiencing um, in his riding right now. Um, I, I have to share his concerns. I am equally as off put by the partisanship that I'm seeing defending incompetence. In the paper, it said that for the next four weeks in today's news, Canada's vaccine deliveries will be cut in half with up to 400,000 doses delayed, according to Major General Danny Fortin, who is leading the country's vaccine rollout. I spent my morning fighting for people in my riding with trench fever. Uh, we've had long care outbreaks in my riding and the response has been grossly inadequate. Now is not the time for partisanship. Lives are on the line and the most vulnerable, as my honourable colleague has mentioned, their lives are on the line. In Winnipeg right now, it's minus 39 and I've spent all day trying to fight for health care supports and housing for people of Winnipeg Centre. And so I just want to say that I, that I stand with you, although we come from different parties, uh, Mr. Speaker, with my colleague, we have to stand in nonpartisanship and ensure people get the vaccines and health care uh, services they need now. Thank you. I remember for Barry Innisville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is the greatest challenge of our generation. And in less than until we come up with solutions for people, uh, many who are vulnerable in our communities are going to continue to die. And we, we're seeing that here in my riding of Barry Innisville. Uh, we need these vaccines and I don't care what it takes. I don't care what we have to do. Uh, we need to ensure for those who are vulnerable that we have and are in a position to provide them with vaccines. And I'll also add to that rapid testing as an ancillary solution to this, this issue too, Madam Speaker. And so uh, I don't know what to do to encourage the government enough. I, I just, I have no idea um, what it is to expect now because everything that's been told to us has failed to happen and I have no confidence. And I know that there are many in our community, including frontline healthcare workers, Madam Speaker, who have no confidence in this government's ability to deliver 
what they said was going to come. I know they've said they, they're the most robust portfolio, right? We've procured that. I need this government to deliver. We need this as a community and as a country. Questions et commentaires, l'honorable député de Beauport des Moilou. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Euh, je tiens à remercier mon collègue pour son témoignage qui, qui et par lequel on partage euh, nombreuses situations et émotions. Dans ma vie, j'ai enseigné la méthodologie du travail intellectuel qui implique de chercher nos renseignements et d'éviter la désinformation. Un des moyens d'éviter la désinformation, c'est d'avoir des sources d'information. C'est ce qu'on demande aujourd'hui dans ce débat-là de la transparence. Qu'est-ce que mon collègue pense du niveau de transparence qui semble apparaître soudainement lorsque des questions sont posées à maintes reprises? Merci. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisville. Well, thank you uh, for the uh, question to my honourable colleague. Uh, I think all Canadians at this point uh, deserve a heightened level of transparency. We've often, all of us as op opposition, have been calling for the government to disclose the uh, the contracts uh, with the manufacturers and the, the government uh, refuses to do that. Uh, and this is a government who came into power in 2015 who said that they were going to be transparent by default. Um, they were going to be the most open and transparent government in uh, in the history of, of Canada. And they've they failed to do that on many fronts. And now is not the time to be transparent uh, or to, to hide information or Canadians need to know and need to have confidence in their government's ability to produce what exactly it is that they said that they were going to do. And as I said earlier, I know our community, our healthcare workers, our PSWs, the people in our long-term care facilities and their families are losing faith that this government is not able to provide to the provinces what they need in terms of a solution. That solution is vaccines and rapid testing as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, reprise the debate, the Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just want to uh, thank my Honourable colleague from Barry Innisfil for sharing this time with me tonight and for his presentation. First of all, when I start, I want to take a moment to thank all of the frontline workers and frontline staff that have worked tirelessly throughout this whole pandemic. Day in and day out, they've put themselves in harm's way to help those who've contracted this terrible virus. I also want to acknowledge the families who've lost a loved one during this COVID time, during this, this whole pandemic. There's over 19,000 Canadians have died from this terrible virus, and many are battling for their lives as we speak here tonight. We're still in the middle of this crisis. Millions of Canadians are still unable to work and countless businesses are shut down. Families have been separated for months and many of our youth are not in their classrooms. And long-term care homes are still having outbreaks and some intensive care units are full. The only way to end this pandemic is through vaccinating people. Tonight, we have this emergency debate because the Liberal government has failed to deliver a reliable supply of vaccines to the provinces and territories and will elaborate. Liberals can twist themselves into pretzels and trying to spin their way out of this mess. But the fact remains, we're falling further behind. Now the Liberals are promising that every Canadian who wants to will get vaccinated by September. Tonight I hear it might even be the end of the year. Forgive me for not blindly trusting some of these words as they've proven a pattern of saying one thing and then a couple of weeks later having to renege. I truly hope we can vaccinate everyone by September but there is no guarantee it'll happen. We don't know the livelihood of success. And as no one has seen the signed contracts, it's been mentioned many times tonight, but they haven't, no one's seen the signed contracts with the various pharmaceutical companies. And before I go any further, let's discuss what we know to be true. We know the Liberals have signed contracts with seven different pharmaceutical companies worth over a billion dollars. That doesn't mean that all seven are going to get Health Canada approval. And it doesn't mean that we currently have any of those vaccines on standby. And it doesn't mean that we know when the vaccines will actually arrive. And we still don't know if we're able to manufacture any of those vaccines on Canadian soil. And we don't know if the latest Liberal promise of vaccinating everyone by September 
is feasible, as I've said before. Those are the unknowns. And it boggles my mind why the government hasn't been more transparent. Before the Christmas break, our health committee started a new study on the government's response to COVID. However, Canadians might be interested to know that we still haven't had a single meeting on vaccines since the House rose, since the House came back in September. Just last night, after our Conservative team had to call an emergency health committee meeting, we also had to overrule the chair in order to pass a motion to finally start talking about the Liberals' vaccine strategy. And not only that, Canadians should know that the Liberal chair didn't like that we pointed out that the health committee hadn't met in the last 45 days, in the middle of the worst pandemic we've ever had. Now, thanks to my friend and colleague from Calgary Nose Hill, who rightfully pointed out to the Liberal chair that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Time is of the essence. Canadians want answers, and I know the Liberals would prefer it if we didn't ask tough questions. However, we wouldn't be in this position if they provided meaningful answers. It didn't help the Liberal Parliamentary Secretary of Public Works shared erroneous information last night on a media panel and then had to text in to correct the record. If the Liberal Parliamentary Secretary of Public Works doesn't know the details of his government's vaccine strategy, it begs the question, who does know? In the past week, we've learned that Pfizer has dramatically reduced vaccine shipments to the point that we won't receive a single dose this week. He's also learned, we've also learned that having problems at their manufacturing facility, that they, they are having problems at their manufacturing facility, but we still don't know how many of those doses will be delivered in the coming weeks. And now the German government has formally requested the EU block all exports of COVID vaccines produced within the EU. On top of that, the European Union Health Commissioner has said pharmaceutical companies must provide early notification whenever they will be exporting vaccines to third countries. Let me state on the record, if that happens, we're in even more trouble and we'll fall further behind. Now more than ever, we need to know what can be done if the EU blocks those shipments. Let's not forget the Liberals announced millions for Medicago, which is a pharmaceutical company to establish a large scale manufacturing facility here in Canada. Liberals also announced 44 million to update national, the National Research Council's facilities to meet manufacturing standards. And originally when these announcements were made, the prime minister blamed a previous government from 36 years ago on why they had to do it. And if we're gonna start pointing fingers to what previous governments did or did not do, there isn't enough oxygen in the room to carry on the discussion. Instead of blaming others, it would have been wise for the prime minister to outline which vaccines can be manufactured at that new facility. To date, we've not received any updates from the government on this funding announcement. And I think that shows a flaw in the contracts. If we're going to continue to see logistical challenges with getting vaccines into Canada, it would be prudent to know if any of the contracts would allow us to domestically manufacture a vaccine. For months now, We've been asking for more details around the contracts the Liberals signed with the pharmaceutical companies. And while I understand some of the sensitivities around pricing, what I don't understand is the level of secrecy. All these delays and smoke screens are deeply concerning. And while the Prime Minister was saber rattling with the Premiers, to his credit, he recognized his comments were not helpful and said so during a recent meeting with the provinces. So now that the Premier's concerns have proven to be correct, the issue of procuring vaccines falls squarely with the federal government. And due to that unpredictability and the necessity of having to give a second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, the Liberal government has put the provinces in a very difficult situation. It takes a considerable amount of time to get a vaccine clinic organized, such as the necessity of having an on-site freezer tested for multiple days before using it to store vaccines. Staff must be arranged and notice is posted. And I know our frontline staff are up to the challenge, but let's give them the greatest chance of success. For months now, we've been asking for more details about the contracts the Liberals signed with the pharmaceutical companies. And while I understand some of the sensitivities around pricing, as I've said, what I don't understand is that level of secrecy. Now that 
part of the secrecy could stem from the Liberals not wanting certain details leaking out. For example, iPolitics is reporting that after the Liberals signed a deal with Consino Biologics, the Chinese government blocked shipments for clinical trials. While we still don't know a lot of the details around this arrangement with Consino, we do know it took the Liberals an additional three months to sign another contract with a different pharmaceutical company. In those three months, countries around the world were signing vaccine contracts while the Liberals did not. It wasn't until the Liberals signed those other deals that the Prime Minister finally admitted that Consino vaccine was going nowhere. In the coming days, I fully expect the Liberals to be transparent with Parliament, with Canadians and with our health committee. When did they know that, Consino deal, that the Consino deal was off the table? And why did it take them three months before signing another contract? These are legitimate questions that deserve answers. As the leader of the official opposition has said, we want to work together on getting a strategy that will result in Canadians getting vaccinated. For that to happen, it's up to the government to invite us to the table. In all opposition parties, there are very talented members. And if I was in the government's shoes, I'd rather have the member of parliament for Calgary Nose Hill working alongside me rather than on being on the other end of her tough questions. We cannot secure jobs. We uh, need to secure our economic recovery and we can do this to secure our future with vaccines. In order to protect our citizens and for provinces to lift restrictions, we must get this right. In closing, Madam Speaker, it's my sincere hope the governments pick up the phone, call the opposition parties, and invite them to the table. Now let's get to work to secure Canada's future. Thank you. Questions et commentaires, questions and comments. The Honourable Député de Davignon, la Métis Matane, Matapédia. Merci, Madame la Présidente, et je remercie mon collègue pour son discours. Euh, ironiquement, il y a quelques jours, euh, certains euh, députés du Parti libéral là, accusaient euh, les provinces et le Québec de laisser dormir les doses de vaccins dans, dans les congélateurs. Et c'est pas du tout ça qui se passait. En, en fait, là, ça allait très bien pour le taux d'administration. C'est plutôt l'approvisionnement qui fonctionne pas bien. C'est ce qu'on qu se rend compte aujourd'hui avec les retards de, de vaccins et des doses de Pfizer. Euh, Est-ce qu'il est d'accord avec moi? Moi, mon collègue, que euh, c'est plutôt le manque de prévisibilité et de fiabilité du fédéral qui est à blâmer dans ce dossier-là. L'honorable, oh. the honorable member for Brandon Suris. Well, thank you uh, to my colleague for that question. Absolutely, uh, it's part of what I mentioned about uh, putting all of your eggs in one basket, as was originally done. We may have the largest portfolio now, but with the three-month delay. Uh, it, it's, I think, the part of the reason why we aren't seeing what the contracts are is because of the delivery mechanisms that might be in them. Um, I mean, did this initial contract uh, have, for getting four million doses delivered uh, by the first of April? Does that mean they're all going to arrive in the last few weeks of of March, or was it a contract that actually stated we'd get a million in January or a million and a half in each of the months here leading up to it? Uh, these are details that that we just uh, aren't haven't been able to to access at this point when other countries in the world have done so and so it is part of the of the delay that my colleague has just mentioned and uh, I do agree with her questions and comments the honorable member for Courtney Alberney Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague for his speech. And uh, tonight I was just talking uh, to a friend of mine who's an infectious disease specialist, and he's concerned not only about the progress of the rollout of the vaccination, but also about the volume of international travel that's taking place. And he said that these issues actually do intersect. He stated that not only do we need to limit entry of the virus into Canada, but especially to stop the spread of the new variants that are starting to, uh, to come to fruition. It, it's critical, he stated, that as we start to see case reductions in Ontario and Quebec, that we use all the barriers possible to keep transmission low. The last thing we need is a new variant that could possibly come in that we can't fight or one where our vaccines are no longer effective. It's critical, he stated, that we vaccinate, vac vaccinate as many people as possible. Does my colleague agree after seeing other countries imposing strict uh, measures and requirements uh, with people traveling to stay at designated hotels upon uh, arrival for quarantine? Uh, does he agree that we need to be doing more when it comes to international travel? The our member for Brandon Suris. I want to thank my colleague for that question as well. It's uh, it's very important. Uh, I think that was a big part of the problem when we first started. Uh, 
the uh, many countries in the world were shutting down their travel much ahead of uh, the Canadian government, uh, which didn't do it until well into uh, April. And, uh, you know, we've known they had already known about the virus in Wuhan since early December. So I, I think that there's a, a time frame there that we need to be very vigilant in regards to the types of travel that are traveling. Uh, we need to are, um, are happening today. We need to be very uh, sure that we're not putting all our eggs in one basket again now and looking at vaccines that will uh, attack these variants as, as well. And, uh, and, and so uh, I certainly appreciate him for uh, asking that question. Um, uh, questions and comments? Uh, questions et commentaires. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. A brief question, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I know my colleague cares a lot about this issue because it's really impacting his, in his riding, particularly seniors in his riding. And I was wondering if he could perhaps use this time to give a little bit more personal examples of situations in his riding where seniors are being deeply affected and everybody by the lack of vaccines uh, in Canada. The Honourable Member for Brandon Seuss has one minute to respond. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thanks to my colleague from Calgary Nose Hill for that question. Uh, in dealing with the long-term care facilities across Canada in my role as a member of the health committee with her, she knows full well that uh, our long-term care facilities are where 85% of the deaths that have occurred in Canada are happening. And we need to make sure that we can get those vaccinated as quickly as we can. And this delay in vaccines or lack of planning from the government uh, to be able to um, supply the provinces with the vaccines is really hurting our ability to uh, stabilize things in, the, in our long-term care facilities here in Canada and certainly here in Brandon Service in the southwest. We just had another death in one of our facilities here today uh, and even though Manitoba is doing better than it has in the past uh, and, uh, and we need to make sure that uh, we are um, utilizing those vaccines in our long-term care facilities as uh, quickly as we can get them there. But you can't Resuming debate, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to share my time with the member for Dartmouth, Cole Harbour, please. It is such an honour to join colleagues this evening for this incredibly important debate on one of the greatest challenges that has ever faced our country. Many of my honourable colleagues this evening have spoken about the whole of government effort to be able to, to provide vaccines to Canadians and to keep Canadians safe. I would like to focus my remarks this evening on one specific aspect of our response, and that is the important work that is being done by our defence team and the Canadian Armed Forces. No matter the mission, Canadian Armed Forces members have continued to demonstrate the very best that our country has to offer. Cela est plus clair que jamais alors que nous sommes en transition pour soutenir la distribution des vaccins. Ce soir, j'aimerais parler de la façon dont les forces armées canadiennes et le ministère de la Défense nationale ont été des partenaires fiables dans notre lutte campagne gouvernementale contre le COVID-19 depuis le début de la pandémie. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has required us all to make important changes to our lives and to our routines in order to stay safe. This has truly required a whole of nation effort from individuals to businesses to our government. Everyone has an important role to play in our response to COVID-19, including our defense team. Most notably, since the pandemic first emerged here in Canada, Canadian Armed Forces members and DND personnel have been working closely with the Public Health Agency of Canada. And starting in October, when the Public Health Agency of Canada began to develop its strategy to distribute vaccines across the country, defence team members once again answered the call. A number of Canadian Armed Forces members and civilian staff have been temporarily reassigned to support the Public Health Agency of Canada in the planning and coordination of these efforts. Parmi eux, le Major General Danny Fortin, qui a été nommé Vice-Président de la Logistique et des Opérations en novembre. Il travaille aux côtés d'autres dirigeants au sein du groupe de travail de la ASPC sur le déploiement des vaccins. 
He is well positioned for this role, having led complex operations as the first commander of the NATO mission in Iraq from 2018 to 2019. Major General Fortin is joined by several defense team, logistics experts, operation planners, healthcare workers, engineers, and information technology and systems experts. Each of these defense team personnel bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table that are critical to facilitating vaccine delivery, ensuring that vaccines are safely stored and effectively distributed to our provinces and territories. Canadians can have full confidence in their military to support this national effort under Operation Vector. In December, Canadian Armed Forces members delivered five medical grade freezers to two of our Northern Territories in support of our Public Health Agency of Canada partners. Earlier this month, in Nain, Newfoundland and Labrador, they helped transport vulnerable individuals to and from vaccination sites. Last week, they helped local authorities in Watson Lake, Yukon, tear down a temporary vaccine site in the community. And the Canadian Armed Forces are working closely with the Government of Ontario and the Shinobe Oski Nation to finalize the planning to deploy up to 32 communities in Northern Ontario to help in the public health vaccination program. Canadian Armed Forces units across the country are ready to support civilian authorities if and when they are needed. However, it is important to note that their primary role is not to administer vaccines. That important responsibility rests with, rests with local health authorities. Madame la Présidente, en ce moment crucial de la lutte du, du Canada contre la COVID-19, les membres de l'équipe de défense apportent un soutien essentiel à la SPC. The Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces remain ready and responsive at all times and have been since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Through it all, Canadians have been able to depend on the, the dedicated professionals on the defense team to help them and to save lives. This past year has been a testament to their adaptability and resilience. And it is a stark reminder of how Canadian Armed Forces members risk their lives every single day to protect and defend our nation and its people. Despite the unique challenges of the past year, they have continued to make Canadians proud. In February of last year, Canadian Armed Forces members were integral in bringing Canadians home in the face of the growing threat of coronavirus. Through this work, we know how critical it is that Canadian Armed Forces members remain safe and healthy to deploy when needed. That's why Defence Team leadership took de decisive action to protect all employees and Canadian Armed Forces. Our focus was on ensuring that critical capabilities remained intact and many Canadian Armed Forces members came home from or delayed deploying on operations abroad. Toutes ces mesures ont permis à nos membres d'être prêts à répondre à l'appel pour aider les Canadiennes et les Canadiens. Et cet appel est arrivé rapidement. By April, thousands of Canadian Armed Forces members were assigned to Operation Laser, the mission to support our government's response to COVID-19. They worked on the front lines alongside healthcare professionals in 54 long-term care facilities, 47 in Quebec and seven in Ontario. En Ontario et au Manitoba, les membres des Forces armées canadiennes ont également aidé l'Agence de santé publique du Canada à gérer les équipements de protection individuelle dans les entrepôts afin qu'ils puissent être distribués rapidement à ceux qui en avaient besoin. And more than 1,200 Canadian Rangers deployed in northern and indigenous communities across the country, proving, providing essential support when it was needed the most. Recently, as cases began to surge again in the second wave in the fall and the winter months, Canadian Armed Forces members answered the call once again in several indigenous communities in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. Among other critical tasks, Canadian Armed Forces medical assistance teams helped establish and op operate alternative isolation areas in these regions. 
and Canadian Rangers are currently supporting the Hatchet Lake Denisouline First Nation in Saskatchewan, delivering food, firewood, and care packages to members of the community. They are also ensuring that community leaders have the information that they need to mitigate risk and put effective health measures in place for their residents. Madam Speaker, our Canadian Armed Forces are helping out in some of the hardest hit communities in Canada and deploying abroad to support our partners and allies in training, deterrence and peace support efforts. While they protect the health and safety of Canadians, it is our job to protect theirs. We have worked hard to ensure that they have the appropriate PPE for each deployment, that they closely follow public health measures and quarantine requirements as needed. Canadian Armed Forces members have begun to receive the vaccine, starting with frontline health care providers. All of this ensures that they remain safe and ready to help Canadians through the pandemic and beyond. Il faudra le temps avant qu'on puisse revenir à la vie normale. Il faut de la patience et notre ferme volonté de faire en sorte que les Canadiens aient accès à un vaccin sûr et efficace. But I am confident in the work of the defence team and our partners across government to reach that light at the end of the tunnel and bring this pandemic to an end. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank my friend for her speech. I, uh, I always find it a pleasure to work with her on uh, international human rights files. We, we agree sometimes, though we don't always agree. I, I wanted to just pursue this point about what 2021 is going to look like. Obviously, uh, in the official opposition, we have many concerns about the, the delays and rollout of vaccinations. Even if the government achieves their, their targets, there's going to be a need for greater testing, uh, at-home testing, approval of new testing technologies, as well as tracing. And uh, during the first wave of this, many people, uh, they, they saw the lockdown as, as, an, as an opportunity for the government to get some of the testing and, and tracing mechanisms up and running that we needed. But we're into a second wave. We still don't have the kind of rapid testing, at-home testing, availability of these things that we need, which are things we are still going to need for much of 2021, uh, especially given the, the vaccinations uh, rollout. So I wonder if the member can just explain, you know, what, what happened with testing? Why, why, why do we not have those systems in place right now? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for uh, the question and also for the work that we're doing together, uh, especially on the Human Rights Committee, which met earlier this evening on the important topic of the Uyghurs. Um, I actually would like to respond to my honourable colleague by saying that we already have deployed over 15 million rapid tests, and he mentioned contact tracing. Right now, there are public servants and the Canadian Armed Forces who have been helping with contact tracing phone calls and helping all of the public health authorities. So on testing and contact tracing, these are things that we're already working on and already doing for Canadians. Thank you. Questions et commentaires, l'honorable député de Shefford. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Écoutez, ici, il n'est aucunement question de remettre en, en question les actions déjà posées par l'armée, mais plutôt, j'aimerais qu'on revienne aux problèmes de fond, aux problèmes de fond en amont. Euh, si on en est rendu là aujourd'hui à avoir eu besoin de l'armée dans, la euh, dans, la, dans la première vague et d'avoir vu des images de l'armée dans les CHSLD, c'est peut-être parce qu'il y a eu un désinvestissement de la part des conservateurs et des libéraux depuis des années en santé et que les transferts canadiens ne suivent pas à la demande du Québec et des provinces. Actuellement, ben, les vaccins dans les bras qu'on va administrer, il faudrait d'abord en avoir pour que les militaires puissent contribuer à la campagne de vaccination. Et en aval, ben, la réponse que nous proposent les libéraux, et j'aimerais entendre ma collègue également à ce sujet, les normes nationales. Même les militaires, lorsqu'ils ont fait rapport dans la première vague, ont, ce qu'ils ont dénoncé, c'est le manque de moyens. Et pour avoir des moyens, il faut donner l'argent pour être capable de payer notre monde, de fournir de l'équipement médical. J'aimerais donc l'entendre, ma collègue, à ce sujet. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Oui, merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente et mon honorable collègue. Euh, je suis d'accord, nous avons besoin des standards nationaux pour les années. La situation que notre Force armée canadienne a trouvée dans les maisons des, des années était terrible. Et je, je suis complètement d'accord avec ma collègue que nous avons besoin de les standards. Et aussi, nous continuons d'aider les provinces avec les, euh, les personnes euh, âgées, avec le Croix-Rouge. Oh. L'honorable député de Shefford, d'un point d'homme. Oui, je n'ai jamais dit que j'étais en norme nationale. Je dénonçais la solution des libéraux de vouloir nous imposer des normes nationales. Je dirais que c'est un point d'ordre. Oui. Alors, je dirais que c'est une partie du débat. L'honorable secrétaire parlementaire. Okay. Je, je suis désolée si j'ai mal compris la question, mais euh, euh, c est, c est, c est, moi, je crois vraiment qu'on a besoin des standards nationaux. Alors, merci beaucoup. Thank you. Time for a brief question. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my honourable colleague and also the armed forces for the work they've done and also the truth-telling from Major General Danny Fortin, who indicated, thank goodness we have somebody telling the truth. For the next four weeks, Canada vaccine deliveries will be cut in half with up to 400,000 doses delayed, according to Major da General Danny Fortin, who is leading the country's vaccine rollout. Canada won't receive any new deliveries from Pfizer this week and only only one quarter of the previously promised delivery next week. I'm wondering uh, if, you know, uh, when this government will start actually having some accountability, being transparent to Canadians, like we have seen from Major General Danny Fortin. Uh, Canadians deserve answers uh, about what is going on. We are in a crisis and we need answers now. A very brief answer from the Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you very much to my colleague for that question. I, I do believe that we have said it in the House today, we have been providing answers, we'll continue to, that by the end of March there will be 6 million doses, and by the end of September every Canadian who wants a vaccination will be able to receive a vaccination. Uh, Ma Major General Fortin is doing incredible work. The current delay is temporary, and we will be receiving all of the doses so that Canadians can get vaccinated uh, if they wish to. Thank you. Resuming debate, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I'm pleased to virtually rise uh, in my home office today uh, to address the government's ongoing strategy for rolling out COVID-19 vaccinations. As my colleagues this evening have outlined, from the very early days, this government's focus has been on doing whatever it takes for as long as it takes to get us through this pandemic. We know that the only way to conquer this pernicious virus is for all of us to continue to follow public health advice alongside a successful vaccine rollout. Intense pandemic fatigue only serves to further strengthen our resolve to get vaccines out to Canadians as rapidly as possible. Across the globe, every country is faced with a challenging vaccine supply chain. Every country wants to get vaccines to their citizens as soon as possible. And every country shares the same goal, to get to the other side of this pandemic. Madam Speaker, from the beginning, the focus of this government has been to provide safe, effective and reliable vaccines to all Canadians who wish to be vaccinated. Our comprehensive and meticulously planned vaccine strategy means vaccines are getting into the arms of Canadians. We've hit more than three quarters of a million vaccine doses administered across Canada. And as the Prime Minister announced on Friday, the number of doses administered daily is now four times what it was just three weeks ago. So that's the good news. The number and pace of vaccine delivery to Canadians is increasing but the government's pledged that they will up, be up front with Canadians when it comes to bumps in the vaccine rollout road. Yes, the temporary delay of uh, delivery of doses of the Pfizer vaccine is frustrating for all of the countries supplied by that company's Belgian manufacturing facility. But that's why when we set out our vaccine strategy, we were so ambitious in the large numbers of contracts that we signed and the doses that we secured. Here in Canada, during this historic worldwide scramble for vaccines, such bumps in the road were expected. This pandemic is happening in real time. The government's comprehensive planned vaccine strategy means when bumps occur, we are able to respond and adapt in real time. 
From the start, our government recognized the highly complex and intensely competitive global market for vaccines. And that is precisely why we pursued a diversified vaccine procurement approach. We knew that temporary production delays such as that announced by Pfizer would be highly likely given complex manufacturing, unprecedented global demand, and a rapid ramping up of production. Madam Speaker, allow me for a moment to remind the House what the world looked like when we started our COVID-19 vaccine procurement strategy. At that time, none of us knew if it was even possible to develop a vaccine which would be effective against COVID-19. And we knew that historically, developing and testing a new vaccine to protect against an infectious disease would normally take several years, but the world didn't have several years. From making sure the vaccine was safe, to making sure it was effective, to obtaining regulatory approval to manufacturing truly vast quantities of vaccines, such that we had never witnessed before. Madam Speaker, we knew from day one that first scientists and then regulators and then manufacturers around the globe would be working under intense time pressure to produce a safe and effective vaccine demanded by every country in the world. Faced with a myriad of differing vaccine types, dosage requirements, as well as manufacturing and finishing needs, working day and night, this government has been dedicated to procuring the very best vaccine candidates for Canadians. Madam Speaker, these efforts paid off. Canada invested in one of the most diverse COVID-19 vaccine portfolios in the world. We knew that not all vaccines would make it through the clinical trials. We knew that global demand for the safe and effective vaccines would be like nothing previously witnessed. And we knew that the pressure on biomanufacturing facilities could lead to production delays. That's why from the start, Canada had plans in place to mitigate the impact of these challenges. Canada had plans in place to make sure that this country would receive as many vaccine doses as possible, as rapidly as possible. Because of this foresight and planning, Canadians have been receiving the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine since last month. And we have agreements in place with five other potential vaccine suppliers. We have access to more vaccine doses per person than any other country. We continue to work day and night to get as many vaccine doses as possible into Canada. So far, the government's vaccine strategy has succeeded in delivering 1.1 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine to the provinces and territories so that they can rapidly administer the shots to vulnerable Canadians and those on the front line battling this pandemic day in and day out. Yes, the delay in Pfizer shipments will have a short-term impact on the vaccination rollout, but this is temporary. Let's be clear, Madam Speaker, we remain on track to receive the 4 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine we are expecting by the end of this quarter. And as we head into spring, we expect to be able to send out more than 20 million doses to provinces and territories. And that will keep us well on track so that each and every eligible person across this country who wants a vaccine will be able to get one by the end of September. By the end of March, we expect to have 6 million doses of Moderna and Pfizer vaccines in Canada and up to 80 million doses by the end of the year. The agreements we have in place for five additional vaccine candidates will provide access to even more doses, which we will bring to Canada as soon as regulatory authority uh, authorization is in place. Further disruptions to supply are likely, but again, multiple agreements with multiple manufacturers mean that Canada is prepared. And as spring gets underway, Canadians will begin to see a dramatic increase in vaccine deliveries. We may remain on track for each and every person across this country, as I said, who wants a vaccine and is eligible to be able to get one by the end of September. Madam Speaker, across this country and around the globe, we all have the same aim, to end this pandemic. Nobody in this house underestimates the pain, the anguish and the grief felt by Canadians. The terrible losses felt by our friends and by our families across the globe during these past depressing, distressing months. It has been months and we are all living with pandemic fatigue. But Madam Speaker, this government is steadfast in its commitment to the health and safety of Canadians. The pathway out of this pandemic will not be straightforward and we will face setbacks, but the meticulous early planning of our government means that we will get through it. By 
continuing to pull together and to support each other, we will make it to the other side of this pandemic. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Deputy d'Abitibi, Timiskaming. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Euh, à une, une question de mon collègue, député de Montcalm, tantôt, le député de Winnipeg Nord a dit que, évidemment, l'opposition ce soir était, euh, disons, très critique, puis il manquait de bonne foi et tout. Et mais a mentionné que les libéraux ont un plan. Le gouvernement a un plan, et c'est évident, ce plan-là, il est même sur Internet. Allez à coronavirus.ca. Je vous invite, Madame la Présidente, à prendre votre téléphone et y aller. Parce que ce site-là est bloqué par la Chambre des communes. Et je l'ai même assis en anglais, coronavirus.ca. Il est bloqué aussi. Fait que, il est où le plan des libéraux? Si on veut en débattre en Chambre, il faudrait au moins qu'on puisse y avoir accès. Merci, Madame la Présidente. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, am I permitted to go ahead, Madam Speaker? Thank you. Um, Ma Madam Speaker, there's been a lot of talk about what other countries have done with uh, regards to transparency. I'm not aware of another country that has shared as much detail on their vaccine rollout. They haven't shared the numbers of weekly deliveries and they haven't shared uh, contract um, contract details. Uh, what Canada has done by separating out the weekly deliveries for each province and territory is our government has done its absolute best to be as transparent as possible from day one. We will continue to do so, even though, as I acknowledge, there may be bumps in the road uh, on delivery of vaccines in the future. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberti. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, as I cited earlier, I was talking to a friend of mine who's an infectious disease specialist, and, and he's really concerned about the volume of unnecessary international travel that's happening, especially as we have the new variant of the virus, the, the, both the South African virus and the UK virus, uh, that's spreading quicker and is more deadly uh, out there right now and, and spreading. Madam Speaker, he cited it's critical that as we're reducing uh, the spread in Ontario and Quebec, that we use all barriers to keep the transmission low. The last thing we need is the, one of these variants to even be worse and something that we don't have a vaccine to protect our, our citizens. Doesn't my colleague agree, especially looking at what other countries are doing, where they've got a 14-day quarantine at a hotel that they pay for in place instead of a piece of paper where they're expected to play the honor system? Does he not agree that we need to be doing more to, to make sure that we're lowering the spread and stopping international travel, or at least ensuring that we're protecting citizens as people are coming home? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the member for the question. It's a very important question. Uh, Canadians want us to utilize every option, to be able to utilize every option at our disposal to make sure that we keep them safe. And from day one, that has been our priority, to keep Canadians healthy and safe. And we've heard in recent days, ministers say, that we are willing to use every option at our disposal, disposal to, to do that. And that includes the things that the member was just stating. And comments, the Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, uh, follow up on my colleague's uh, fine comment about uh, being able to deliver a certain number of uh, vaccines each week uh, as we move forward. Uh, and so I assume then uh, that at some point we'll be able to see the contract that actually states that there's uh, there was a delivery. Uh, mechanism for what I was talking about in my speech earlier tonight and in my reply to questions that that there would be so much for a month and that that contract would stipulate that. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if he could just elaborate as to whether uh, the contracts that he's seen, if he has, uh, would uh, uh, indicate that to Canadians because I'm asked that uh, just about every day. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thanks very much, Madam Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member who I sit on the uh, Health Committee with for the question. And I want to thank him for his speech earlier. And it's it's very clear that he cares about Canadians and he cares about his constituents. And uh, I do appreciate his work on the Health Committee. Madam Speaker, again, we were releasing weekly rollouts of vaccines as they were coming in and letting the provinces and territories know from day one what they were expected to get based on what we were hearing and the information that was coming in. 
Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Stormont Dundas South Glengarry. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It is uh, a pleasure as always to rise in the House to represent my constituents in the riding of Stormont Dundas South Glengarry and participate in tonight's emergency debate on the vaccine rollout. I have to say, as I, it is always a pleasure to rise in the House, but the fact we are here tonight having an emergency debate on an issue that I don't think Canadians wanted us to have an emergency debate on. Because as they watch and as we watch other countries around the world uh, go on social media, provide their updates every day to their citizens of increased rollouts, increased number of vaccines, increased production going. In Canada, we're asking ourselves here tonight in the House, what has gone wrong? I want to note that I'm sharing my time tonight with my colleague from out west, the member from Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. And I want to acknowledge that I've been speaking to, I, I'm going to say into this pandemic, I would say hundreds, Madam Speaker, but probably into the thousands now of constituents and businesses, and this is an extremely stressful time for Canadians. I want to acknowledge uh, locally as well and thank the first, uh, first responders, the uh, frontline workers that are doing work particularly in our long-term care homes. And I know uh, my riding and my community has been heartbroken with the situation at the Lancaster long-term care home. 40 of 47 residents have tested positive for COVID-19. Unfortunately, there have been nine deaths and uh, numerous staff. I think the number I saw is 16 staff have been infected. And there's also been one issues at the, at Aquasosny. There's been a, a terrible situation there as well. In, in numerous outbreaks, the Red Cross having to be involved. And I just want to say uh, how proud we are of their work and thanking them all for keeping us safe and doing their work during these stressful times. Again, this highlights the need of why we have to have this debate. I've said the line many times, and I know many of us from all the parties have said this. There's light at the end of the tunnel. We can see the light, we just don't know how far away it is. And when we get news like we have in the last week from the government that what they had promised to provide Canadians is not actually happening, won't be happening this week, won't be happening next week, and for the next couple of weeks, we start to get worried if that light is slipping further and further away and getting further away from Canadians being at the finish line with COVID-19. The key to getting us back to normal, the key for us to opening back up, getting back, lowering the case count, lowering the unfortunate number of deaths in this country is getting vaccines into the arms of Canadians as soon as possible. I've been in public life here in Ottawa now for about 15 months and, and counting, and I've talked to many constituents on, on different topics, and they'll say, well, the government announced last week this, it's all good. And I have to say, when we deal with these things and we deal with these issues, particularly with COVID-19, particularly in the last year, You've not only just got to listen to the announcement, but you've got to follow up and see if the government's actually delivering on what they said they were going to do. I've said this before, I'll give a compliment to the government. They get A for announcement. They are some of the best in the business in politics of having the Prime Minister stand out in front of Rideau Cottage, different ministers making announcements saying it's all good, we've done X. But the devil's in the details. And we follow up to see, are they actually doing what they said they were going to do? A for announcement, and I'm going to say F for follow through. The vaccine distribution rollout that we've seen is showing the government's plan is not working. The commitments that they made are not being fulfilled, and we're losing confidence and asking a lot of questions. I want to acknowledge the work of our shadow health minister, the member for Calgary Nose Hill. For her work, we've been asking questions, and I've been here many days, pretty well every day throughout the fall and question period, asking question after question after question about wanting to get certain answers. And we were told, stop being so negative. Stop asking questions. We're on Team Canada. We're all in this together. Don't worry. Don't be negative. Stop criticizing. And the very things, the very questions and issues we were raising months ago, I wish didn't come to fruition, but they are now. There's a few things in this situation we find ourselves in that I want to elaborate a little bit on, Madam Speaker. We can't see the details of the contracts that have been signed. You can look at the United States, you can look at a lot of other countries, 
I can go online and print off the details of their contracts, what deals they sign with the organizations or different companies, what dates, what guarantees, what penalties perhaps in certain cases, and the order and priority of the work that they've been doing for several months. We can't do that and get those full details here. Makes you wonder why, but now when you see the fact that tens of thousands of vaccines went to other countries around the world this week, and we got zero, you start to understand why maybe the government does not want to disclose all the full information about this. The other issue we face in this country is we don't have domestic production. And I'll go back again to following up on announcements made. Back in April, the government said, don't worry, we don't have domestic production, but we are going to spend tens of millions of dollars in Montreal, I believe it was the National Research Council, and we're going to expand so we could have domestic production in our country. Great announcement, feel good announcement. Yes, we need domestic production here at home. As far as I know, I don't even see a shovel in the ground. That facility is not operational. We are in the heat of the moment. Where other countries are producing domestically, they've got good contracts, they're getting their vaccines. We had an announcement, and we didn't have the follow through and actually getting it done in a timely manner. I will say that I think the House would find the unanimous agreement to say, heaven forbid we ever go through this again in my lifetime, but we will be more prepared the next time it comes around in making sure we can produce vaccines domestically. We have to ask ourselves, Madam Speaker, what the end game is here. The Prime Minister has said several times, the buck stops here, and he's right. It stops with this government. I, I remember over the Christmas holidays, the outrage from certain members on the other side when Premier Ford and the Ontario government said they weren't going to do vaccinations on December 25th and 26th. There was issues perhaps of keeping healthcare workers being able to work their regular shifts at hospitals and long-term care facilities and those balances and not wanting to overwhelm the workforce as an example. Attacked and ridiculed like you wouldn't believe for saying they were slowing down. And now we have a case where there's zero new vaccines coming into the country this week. Next week, is going to be much dry. I think it's 86%. You lose track because the numbers keep getting worse and worse. And over the course of the next months, the government has no idea how many we're actually going to get. I get all asked often, well, what would you do differently? And the part that bothers me and makes me frustrated about this, part of the reason this is an emergency, is because the work should have been done months ago. Back in the summer, when other countries were finalizing and signing deals, getting themselves in the priority queue, organizing their logistics, we had a government that was embroiled in scandal. The finance minister resigned, we had the We Charity scandal, they prorogued parliament, they were trying to shift attention away from the issues. Then they started talking and beginning to sign deals much later than other countries had. And we see what that's causing us here at home nowadays. Last week, again, tens of thousands of countries received, sorry, tens of thousands of vaccines were received by a wide variety of countries. We're getting nothing. I follow many of the world leaders on social media. Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and the Conservative government, last week alone gave the first dose to 2.3 million people. 6.2 or 6.3 or maybe 6.5 million of UK citizens have got their first dose well on their way. They're ramping up every single week and getting more. And we face ourselves in the situation of having none this week, barely any next week, and not sure what the next few weeks are going to bring. President Biden has said they're going up 15% and they're going to be able to go out now and tell their states three weeks in advance, how many they can expect and when it's going to be delivered. What did our government do? They took the website down of the number of expected doses, going backwards, not forwards, and ramping things up. Madam Speaker, I'll wrap up my comments by saying, I, didn't, I hope we wouldn't have had this emergency debate tonight, because I hope we could have had ourselves organized like other countries are showing that we could be doing. I want this government to do well. 
because that means Canadians do well. That means less lives, are, less lives are lost. The government's success is Canadian success, and we need to make sure we get the answers of what has gone wrong and do every single thing we can in our power to get this vaccination program back on track and get back to normalcy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the uh, Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for his contributions this evening. Uh, he raised the example of Ontario a couple of times in his speech, and I just want to ask him, because my constituents in Park Daylight Park have commented, obviously, on the need for vaccines and, and rapid arrival, but they've also noted that when they are arriving, in some instances, we've been able to actually exceed targets. And what I'm referring to there is the Ontario government had set a short-term goal for long-term care homes and the ones in the in the hotspot areas, quote, quote unquote, such as Toronto, York, Ottawa, all of the vaccinations occurred for those residents and the professionals that work in those residences ahead of schedule. So when the vaccines are being delivered on a timely basis, we are able to meet those targets. So does the uh, member opposite agree to that and agree to looking at this from a long term perspective, such as after Q1 and after Q3 and those targets not being jeopardized? The Honourable Member Restore Mount Dundas, South Glengarry. As always, I want to thank my, my colleague from, from Toronto and from the government for that question. I will say that I am taking and we are taking the long-term look at this because this isn't just starting now. The plans for this should have been done several months ago. Israel has been a fantastic example. The United Kingdom and their ramping up, the U.S. in their planning and ramping up has been months and months in the making. You're seeing them accelerate their plans and growing by the week. We're seeing provinces having to hit the brakes on their plans. And the provinces are struggling. Yes, I've mentioned about the first dose, but provinces have had to stretch out. They've had to cancel appointments in hotspots like Toronto. I've been reading reports because they're not sure when they're going to get the vaccines. So I will say I don't share at this point the optimism. Uh, because I think provinces are in disarray. They don't know when they're going to get the vaccines. They don't know when they're going to get their second doses. They're trying to keep all that stuff up now. We're not getting the answers that we should be getting at this point in the game. Questions and commentaires. Honorable député de Avignon, La Métis, Matan, Matapédia. Merci, Madame la Présidente, et je remercie mon collègue pour son discours. Euh, des régions comme la mienne, le Bas-Saint-Laurent, la Gaspésie, ont euh, tout vacciné leur monde avec ce qu'ils avaient comme dose euh, dans les CHSLD principalement. Et là, on arrive au RPA et il n'y a plus de dose à cause des problèmes d'approvisionnement, bien entendu. Et ce qui est assez incroyable là-dedans, c'est qu'il y a des gens qui ne respectent pas euh, nécessairement les règles, qui décident de partir à l'étranger quand même. Je je pense aux Snowbirds qui sont aux États-Unis en ce moment et qui peuvent recevoir un vaccin parce que, euh, bon, il y a tellement de doses de disponibles aux États-Unis qu'on peut même vacciner d'autres personnes qui ne viennent pas de ce pays-là, toutes les personnes de 65 ans et plus qui le veulent. Alors, est-ce qu'il est d'accord avec moi qu'on peut dire ce qu'on voudra des États-Unis, mais ils font davantage preuve de transparence dans la façon dont ils gèrent leur approvisionnement en vaccins que le Canada? The Honourable Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. I want to thank my colleague from Quebec for that question and, and agree with her. Uh, she faces the same situations in her beautiful part of the country. I look forward to getting through this, to getting down to the Gaspésie region uh, when this is all said and done. But it sounds like, and it is, the same situation in eastern Quebec as it is in eastern Ontario as it is out west. Provinces aren't sure when they're going to get first and second doses. They, they, want, they want to give the vaccinations in a certain time frame period. They're can't getting that. They're trying to book appointments. They're getting canceled because none, none are showing up. And they can't ramp up because they don't know and they don't have confidence. The government says six million by the end of the quarter. Well, the government had a website as of last week that said X number coming in. They took the website down because the numbers are completely shot. So I go back to the same thing at the end of the day. Uh, Florida is an example, the United States, the United Kingdom, Romania, countries around the world, we're watching with envy of what they're able to do, organize and achieve. We're certainly not getting that here in Canada. Brief question, a brief question from the member for Winnipeg Centre. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, like, like my honorable colleague, I too, uh, are, I'm losing faith in, in the government. Um, however, 
I mean, he spoke about uh, Indigenous communities, and I, I just want to remind him that part of the reason why we're in this crisis in Indigenous communities is because of willful human rights violations, access to clean drinking water, housing. Yet the Conservative government, every time the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is put forward, including Bill C-262, they vote against it. So if they're concerned about the health and welfare of all people living on Turtle Island, I'm wondering if he will support uh, Bill C-15 uh, and fully support the adoption and implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you. A brief answer from the member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. I want to thank my colleague from Manitoba from the NDP for that and say to her, I share her concern about uh, the fate of what's going on in COVID-19 in First Nations communities. As I mentioned in my comments, the long-term care home in Aquasosne has had an outbreak and there have been several cases uh, on Aquasosne in the island and in the region and the territory. I share with her her concern and her desire for reconciliation, for a better quality of life, for things, the fact that we have boil water advisories and don't have access to clean water in any community let alone First Nations communities in the 21st century. I share her commitment. We're going to get back to discussing that, and I look forward to saying, but I think we are all on the same page, the same goal. We must do better, we can do better, and we will do better with our First Nations communities in this country. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and it is a real honour to join this debate tonight and a very important debate. And certainly as we were heading into the Christmas period, I think many were had optimism. There was a light that you could see the vaccine development we were so pleased about. And of course, what's happened since then has been a real concern. You know, certainly in the riding that I re represent, Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou, we had gotten off relatively lightly in terms of actual cases. You know, certainly people were struggling with some of the restrictions, but we've seen a real escalation in our communities. Uh, one of the First Nations communities now has 25% of the population in struggling with COVID infections. They're an elder died just recently and the children are locked down in their homes with no internet to even do their schooling. Our local hospital uh, also has recently announced that they have an outbreak. So, you know, I think we all know that vaccinations have made the greatest contribution to global health of any human intervention. I mean, arguably with the exception of uh, clean water and sanitation. And the vaccination for COVID and and again, people have noted today, you know, we thought it might take longer. And so, of course, so glad that it was modern science was able to move forward in such an effective way so quickly. And this vaccination, this vaccine is critical. It's critical for the health of our Canadians, morbidity, mortality, and it is absolutely critical for um, our economy in terms of getting back up and getting going. So, you know, I think, you know, Canadians are very forgiving and I think they have forgiven this government a lot of sort of mistakes. They recognize that it was a very unique and unusual circumstance that they were dealing with, but, you know, I, the, the mistakes are starting to add up and I have to start with pre-pandemic, getting rid of our surveillance system that was world-class, never even told anyone it was uh, shuttered down. So we didn't have that surveillance system. Um, you know, getting rid of warehouse space that housed our PPE and throwing it into the dumpster pre-pandemic. January, we were sort of worried what's happening. Um, and we were, they continually insist that the risk was low and did not take into account some of the reactions of other countries and even what our military intelligence reports were saying. So we left our borders open and I would argue, I found it stunning that for even to this day, people could come in and they'd come in internationally and they'd hop on a domestic flight with nothing in terms of um, any reasonable kind of surveillance, no rapid testing, finally a little pilot project in Calgary. Um, we were told masks, you don't need to bother with masks. And now we're told, oh, masks are important. Rapid testing, um, you know, there's been some pretty compelling evidence that 
The rapid testing is an effective tool. It's not perfect, but an effective tool. And so, of course, now we have the vaccines. And, you know, I think I, it would be important at this point to compare what's happening in Canada with just a few other countries. So the Biden administration in the U.S. right now, they have 5.2 percent of their population vaccinated. We are at 1.1 the president, uh, Pre President Biden, has committed to doing a million a day for 100 days. And people are saying that that is going to be feasible for him to do that. While he's ramping up to a million a day, we are ramping down to almost zero for the next who knows how long with a very uncertain future ahead. You know, you look at in the uh, UK in May, they decided to contribute 93 billion pounds or million pounds to build a vaccine facility, a super vaccine facility. Um, it's going to be open in the summer of 2021. And so it's open a year ahead of time. So they put significant dollars in. They've opened the facility and it will have the capacity and it might not probably won't even be needed this time, but it will have the capacity to produce all the vaccinations needed for the whole population for in six months. So you compare that to, you know, 4.5 million that Canada put into a few a projects here, a few projects there. Um, you know, certainly if anyone was listening today to um, some of the experts in vaccines, some of the CEOs of companies in Canada, in spite of what the prime minister has said is, they've said, we do have the capacity. Canada does have the capacity, the ability with support, we could have been ramping up and perhaps producing our own uh, vaccines here in Canada, mRNA. Um, Israel, you know, they have 25% of their population vaccinated. They started their work um, apparently way back in March with the um, the prime minister phoning regularly to Pfizer and making sure that they were at the top of the line. And so put a huge priority many months ago in terms of both recognizing the importance of vaccine vaccines for their population and making sure that they were going to move ahead. So what about Canada? Well, we know that there was in May, the Prime Minister proudly talked about his deal with China, um, signed a deal. And of course, we all know the challenges of our relationship with China over the last number of years. So certainly, at the time, I think many people were a little bit leery. Well, it turns out it's been reported that four days later, China backed out on the deal and refused to ship the necessary um, items to Canada. And the government, for all its talk about transparency, did not reveal that to Canadians for a long time. Um, then late last summer, they finally got around to signing a few contracts. And, you know, you have to wonder, if you recall at the time, uh, there was the We scandal, they, ha they were proroguing Parliament, they were doing speech from the thrones, and you have to wonder how distracted were they in terms of doing what they needed to do. So dealing with We scandal was consuming perhaps all their energy, oxygen, and they were unable to do the job that they needed to do for Canadians because they had been too busy taking care of their own self-interests and moving um, money towards an organization that really was deeply in bed with them. So, and they were busy trying to thwart the health committee in terms of getting the inter information they, they need. So, you know, here we are in Canada, and as our leader said, everyone wants the government to be successful. And hopefully this debate tonight will make them sit up and look inside and say, you know what, we could have done better. We need to do better for Canadians. We need to be more transparent for Canadians. You can look at contracts from Australia. You can look at contracts from many countries and you can know what's happening in those countries. In Canada, the government that promised to be, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, um, you know, by default, they were going to be open and transparent is probably the most closed government 
that we have ever encountered. So we have a crisis, um, Madam Speaker. They talk about doses per capita. Doses per capita don't matter if those doses aren't gonna come for six months, a year. What matters is when we get these doses, when they're delivered and how they're gonna make sure Canadians can move forward. Because you can imagine if you're sitting in Canham Lake and your child, your six-year-old, your 10-year-old can't go to school, you've got some problems. So Madam Speaker, um, we are being critical of the government tonight because they deserve some criticism on this. They have not been transparent with Canadians. They need to look in their hearts and figure out how they can do a better job for all of us. Our economy depends on it. Our seniors depend on it. Our health depends on it. Thank you. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Deputy d'Avignon, La Métisse Matane, Matapédia. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Euh, dans toute cette histoire-là, on comprend que ce n'est pas la faute du gouvernement si Pfizer décide de faire des rénovations. Par exemple, c'est certainement la responsabilité du gouvernement euh, d'expliquer pourquoi le retard sera plus grand au Canada que dans d'autres pays du monde. Euh, pourquoi l'Europe s'en sort avec moins, un moins grand délai, par exemple. Euh, et ça, le, le premier ministre, est, il a un petit peu omis de nous l'expliquer. J'ai l'impression qu'on comprendrait mieux si on voyait les détails des ententes qui ont été prises entre, les, entre le gouvernement et entre les compagnies. Est-ce que euh, la députée est d'accord avec moi qu'il y a un petit manque de transparence dans tout ça de la part du gouvernement fédéral? The Honourable Member for Camus, Thompson, Caribou. It's absolutely a lack of transparency. Um, there are many countries, you know, exactly how much they've paid per dose. They've had full transparency with their contracts. And this government has not, even with health committee asking for specific details, the they block them. So, so again, for a prime minister who said transparent by default, sun, sunshine is the best disinfectant, they sure don't live by their words. Um, questions and comments? Uh, questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and I want to thank my colleague for her speech and also for her advocacy around the opioid crisis. I was just talking to Deb Hamilton, the Executive Director of the Alberni Drug and Alcohol Prevention Service in Port Alberni, and she's deeply concerned about the delay in the vaccine rollout and what the government's doing to ensure that the vaccine rollout is not only timely, but there's critical access to vulnerable populations who have complex issues, including the impacts of the opioid catastrophe. Further, she's concerned about how this delay will impact the frontline service providers who give non-medical support and intervention to these vulnerable people. She cites that the COVID restrictions have impacted face-to-face -face service and social services that are left on the ground that are, and they're burning out in the face of the dual public health emergencies of COVID and opioid deaths. The collective burden on these vulnerable populations and the workers supporting them are indescribable, she cites. Does the member agree how important it is that the vaccine rollout happens so that we can protect these vulnerable populations and their workers, and maybe she can speak a bit about what's happening in her communities. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. This vaccine is so critical. It is so critical for our vulnerable populations. It's, it's critical for everyone. I think regardless of how, you know, fortunate your circumstances are, I think this is taking a toll on everyone. But in particular, if you look at the opioid crisis, the the increase in terms of deaths, we have a dual crisis here and we need to give a relief valve, especially for the workers. And, you know, again, I think we all have workers in our communities who are on the front lines, who are dealing um, with the vulnerable populations. They're working in the long-term care residents. It is a real challenge for them and they need that relief in sight. Questions and comments? Do you remember for Service Moose Mountain? Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I thank my colleague from Kamloops, Thompson Caribou, for, for her speech. It was well received and, and very well presented. Um, I, I'm sure she's heard from her constituents like many of us have, in particular in, in my writing, um, from, from my constituents and the confusion that's out there and the challenges that they have when they try to listen to what this government is saying. And on the one hand, we have a minister says we're gonna have six, 
6 million vaccines. And then another one turns around and says, well, we're actually going to have 4 million vaccines. And then they turn around and say, no, we, we're guaranteeing we'll have 6 million by the end of March. And that confusion, or we might have a parliamentary secretary who says something is totally has to be contradicted by, by the minister after the fact. The, these are things that just total, throw total confusion to to constituents, and I'm wondering how does that impact on on the assurances that we we might want to get from this government to say this is actually going to get accomplished. The honourable member for Kamloops, Johnson Caribou, has one minute to respond. If there was ever a time for this government to throw away the talking points and have a real conversation with Canadians, now is the time. It is the time to say this is our reality and be upfront. You know, if Pfizer, if things are a real risk with Pfizer, okay, what's our backup plan? Where are we going to go next? But the talking points it's time to throw them away, be honest with Canadians, be honest with Parliament, and let's move forward in a way that's more together. Thank you. Resuming debate, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Labour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I really appreciate it. And I'll be sharing time to the extent I can with the Honourable Member for Parkdale High Park. And I know if he had a chance to speak tonight, he would be superb. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the second thing I want to just say is that I want to thank the incredible healthcare workers in my riding at the Jewish General Hospital at Mount Sinai Hospital and at all of the long term care centers in my riding that have been at the center of the COVID epidemic and who have done a wonderful job. Madam Speaker, let's be clear: we all want vaccines as soon as possible. Tomorrow is not soon enough for any of us. This is not a liberal issue or conservative issue or a new democratic issue or a block issue. We all want vaccines and everybody is doing their best. Provinces are doing their best and the federal government is doing its best. We shouldn't be blaming one another. There are gonna be times that provinces are gonna have some vaccines in freezers because they're not able to distribute fast enough. And there's gonna be times that provinces are short in vaccines because our supply chain is not gonna work as effectively as we would like. In the end result, let's try to accept that everybody is being professional and doing their absolute best. And that's why, Madam Speaker, before I start talking about vaccines, I wanna talk a little bit about disinformation because we have a responsibility to not exaggerate. We have a responsibility to look at what happened in Washington a couple of weeks ago and to recognize that the words of politicians have great weight. I penned an op-ed with my friend from Paris Sound Muskoka about the dangers of politicians spreading disinformation. And I think it's an apt lesson. Whenever we have an evolution in technology, whether it's the printing press, radio, motion pictures, and now social media, it gives an opportunity to those who would want to spread disinformation a much greater breadth to do so. In the United States, you had groups like QAnon that were flouting conspiracy theories that fed into a president that denied he lost an election. You had people tweeting out that Dominion voting machines had switched votes from Trump to Biden, and then it was retweeted out by the president, members of the Senate, members of the House, and those to whom the public trusted. And when those to whom the public trust spread disinformation and fear and make people believe an election was not legitimate, you have events like you did where democracy itself was attacked at the Capitol. So my plea is to all of my fellow members of parliament, you can be dissatisfied with how the government is doing, but let's all not exaggerate. Let's all try to be accurate in what it is that we're saying. For example, it is not accurate to say that the government has no plan on vaccines. People could argue they're not satisfied with the plan, but there is a plan. There's a plan that you've heard over and over. It's a plan that is up on a website. It's a plan that has 80 million doses coming in from Pfizer and Moderna by September. Every member of the Canadian population who wants to be vaccinated will have a dose in Canada to vaccinate them by the end of September. We know that we will get 6 million doses, 4 million of Pfizer, 2 million of Moderna by the end of March. We know that starting in April, there will be a great ramp up where millions of doses will be coming into Canada. And we're gonna to need to be ready for that. 
Now, we know that the vaccine is not everything. We know that even in Israel, the country that has been the most successful in rolling out the vaccine, you still have many, many thousands who are infected on a daily basis. So we still need to continue with social distancing, washing our hands, and following provincial government health measures. But the federal government is absolutely rolling out a plan, and it's a plan that is actually doing better than we even said at the beginning. The prime minister originally said he did not expect doses to come in until January. We had almost half a million doses in the hands of Canadians by the end of December. There are more than a million Canadians vaccinated today. More than, you know, we're, 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 we're fifth in the OEC, in, in, in the G20. We're not last, we're fifth. Out of all of the EU nations, we're doing better than 21 as of yesterday. We're doing worse than six. So to argue somehow we're the worst in the world, it's, it's completely unfair and untrue. If you want to say we should be first, we should be best, we should be like Israel, fair enough. But let's not exaggerate. The idea also that there's not professional purchasers that have been out there since last spring preparing for this moment. Remember, originally at Canada, we didn't have PPE. We had to source all our PPE from abroad. Now more than half of our PPE is made in Canada. In the same way we source PPE and, man and manage to create a domestic manufacturing of PPE, we have professional purchasers in the Department of Procurement that have worked for months and months and months to sign contracts with seven vaccine providers. It is utterly false what I heard tonight that because of a deal with the communist Chinese, somehow we weren't preparing to sign with anybody else. Moderna has stated that we were one of the first countries to sign with Moderna. We weren't one of the last, we were one of the first. The spokesperson for Pfizer, Christina Antonio, said we were the fourth country to sign an agreement with Pfizer. We weren't one of the last, we were one of the first. So again, please let's not spread that type of disinformation. When it comes to the very, very disappointing shortfall of Pfizer right now, Let's recognize that Pfizer has told the world that in order to ramp up production in Belgium, there will be a four week shortfall amongst all of the countries being supplied by the Belgian plant. This week it is true we got none and everybody's making hay of it. Last week we got 83% of our doses and some of the European countries that are getting more of their doses this week got almost none. Over the course of the four weeks, the Minister of Procurement has clearly stated that Pfizer has assured her that there will be an equitable distribution of what comes out of Belgium to all of the countries served by Belgium. It's clear. She said it. Pfizer said it. If you want to blame Pfizer for retooling their Belgian plant and not having thought of this in advance, that they're going to need more doses, fine. But it is unfair and untrue to somehow claim that because this week European countries are getting more than Canada, that Canada is being treated disequitably by Pfizer. We don't have those stats. Um, also to say that the website came down, I heard that. The website didn't come down with our plan. The website is still there. The only part that came down was the forecast of Pfizer because we don't have the Pfizer forecasts going forward for the next couple of weeks. We wanna be accurate. The Moderna forecasts are still there. So Madam Speaker, I wanna make sure that when it comes to these issues, we understand that while it's fair to be critical, it is not at all fair to exaggerate. We need to all be calm, be prudent, and understand that Canadians are looking to us for leadership on this and many other issues. And the more we show that we're being rational and clear-headed, the more we are able to show that we can get along and work together as Team Canada, the best we're gonna do in terms of rolling out vaccines, keeping Canadians safe, and hopefully, finding our way out of COVID-19 by the end of September. Uh, Madame la Présidente, je suis très content de prendre des questions de mes collègues maintenant. Merci. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member Stormont Dundas, um, South Glen Gary. No problem, Madam Speaker. It's a long riding name. Uh, I want to thank my colleague from the government side, the member from Mount Royal. And I, I have to say, I, I'm quite uh, disappointed with his conclusion that he drew at the end about being calm, about being rational, and the beginning of that were two totally opposite speeches there. 
to equate anything that, for example, from my commentary a few moments ago, my colleagues from the Bloc, the NDP, I know uh, the member from the Green Party is on here as well, to suggest that our criticism in calling the government out for these certain things and trying to equate that to the Capitol Hill riots, I don't think is a calm, cool, collected response from the government. We had the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Health earlier say they've been the most transparent government when it comes to the contracts and we don't know the details in them. We had the government, you took the information off the website. What you should have done maybe is keep the projections and the actuals so Canadians can track the results. My point being is, is that it's the opposition is standing up and asking questions we've been asking for months and the government's true plans and accuracies is now coming to tea and coming true. Parliamentary secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm very pleased to answer my colleague. My colleague said the website came down. He didn't say that information related to Pfizer came down and should go back up. There's a big difference between one small section of the website dealing, to for, dealing with forecasts from Pfizer and the entire website coming down. My point here is that it is fair to criticize, and I have no problem with criticizing. The point though being is that when criticism is made, it needs to be accurate and it needs to be fair. It cannot be exaggerated because with vaccines, passions are inflamed. People are really worried. And while it's fair to criticize, you need to do so accurately. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and commentaires, Honorable Député de Montcalm. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Or, le moins qu'on puisse dire, c'est que mon collègue ne prêche pas par l'exemple. Aller comparer, faire une analogie avec ce qui s'est passé au Capitole, euh, je pense qu'il aurait pu passer outre son introduction, son discours. Euh, cela étant dit, je ne sais pas euh, ce que euh, le gouvernement sait que les oppositions ne savent pas pour qu'ils soient aussi optimistes. On a mis en lumière ce soir le manque de transparence, le manque de proaction du gouvernement. Alors, Ma collègue de Beauport-Limoilou a fait des calculs et continue à en faire depuis le début de la soirée, à supposer que les 6 millions de doses là, fin mars sont bien au rendez-vous. Si on vise vraiment euh, de façon sécuritaire à ce que tous les vaccins soient donnés pour une immunité, euh, comment on va faire pour vacciner 1,9 million de personnes par semaine? Alors, mathématiquement, l'opération est un peu en péril, combinée avec les menaces de réduction d'exportation des vaccins de l'Europe, euh, Est-ce que euh, vous avez un plan B? Euh, quelles sont vos solutions dès maintenant pour contrer ça? Parce qu'il faut les atteindre, ces objectifs-là. Fin septembre, tout le monde est vacciné. Okay. Je dois aller pour une autre question. The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, Madame la Présidente, euh, je veux assurer le député de Montcalm que mon message est également pour moi et pour tout le monde. Nous devrions tous être prudents dans tout ce qu'on dit maintenant parce qu'on a une population qui est nerveuse, qui est peur et que la malinformation peut nous nuire dans notre effort collectif de battre le COVID-19. Et en termes de plan, qu'est-ce qu'on connaît déjà? C'est qu'on va avoir 6 millions de doses dans les premiers trois mois de 2021, qu'après qu ça, on va augmenter le numéro de doses qui va entrer en Canada. Ce serait dans les millions chaque, euh, chaque semaine après. Et il faut être prêt. Il faut être prêt de distribuer ces vaccins. Et j'espère bien qu'on peut entrer dans une situation où les vaccins seront donnés dans les 42 jours, qui est la recommandation de euh, le, euh, le Task Force national. Merci, Monsieur, Madame la Présidente. Uh, resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General, and unfortunately he won't have um, all of his time. I will have to cut him off at some point. About four minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So I'm going to start at where at the end of my prepared comments. Uh, and uh, in terms of what I've listened to to this debate, I'm going to speak directly to my constituents and to Canadians. And Madam Speaker, what I'd say is this. For those of you that are watching from at home tonight, I understand your anxiety and our government understands your anxiety. You want to be done with this pandemic as quickly as possible. We want the exact same thing. That is precisely why we are working so hard on the issue of vaccines because vaccines are that 
light at the end of the tunnel. We are using every tool available to us to ensure that the contracts we have already signed with companies like Pfizer are respected and honored. We are also ensuring that the path to getting the Moderna vaccine continues unabated. As well, we are ensuring that the diverse set of other vaccines, as many as five others that we have lined up and procured in advance, will be available should we require them. The temporary delay in accessing the Pfizer vaccine is exactly that. It is a temporary delay. That has to be underscored and has to be understood by Canadians watching this evening, including by my constituents in Park Gillai Park. This temporary delay does not and will not detract from our objective of vaccinating 3 million Canadians by the end of March and every single Canadian who wants a vaccine by the end of September. What I would add, Madam Speaker, is that we had Canadians' backs when there was jeopardy and concern about securing PPE. We had Canadians' backs when there was concern about vulnerabilities about their income security. We had Canadians' backs when they were concerned about their small businesses and what kind of supports would be available to help them continue to not only survive but thrive. We will continue to have Canadians' backs on the issue that is most pressing right now, which is how can we get enough vaccines into the country quickly so that we can continue to vaccinate people quickly. You've heard others comment about where we stand. I would reiterate what we know to be the facts, that the fact is, is that over a million doses have already arrived in this country. The fact is, is that Canada stands fifth among G20 nations in this rollout. We will continue to keep up that pace because that's what Canadians expect of parliamentarians from all sides of the House. And on that note, Madam Speaker, I'll conclude my remarks. If there are any times for questions, I'd be happy to take them. I thank all of the parliamentarians for concluding, for co co participating to this late hour in such a pressing debate for this country. Merci. Comme il est minuit, je déclare la motion adoptée. Accordingly, this House stands adjourned until later this day at 2 p.m. pursuant to Standing Order 24-1.